Good afternoon, everybody. It's turned 1.30, so I am about to start the meeting. Uh, it's great to be here in front of a live audience. So thank you for coming. And we have some students again from the Metropolitan University, and they're very welcome again. And I'm sure uh, if they learn anything, they let me know because we might have missed around this table. So be sure to, uh, to let us know. <laughs> um, we haven't got cards today for the benefit of members because we're now on high definition. So when you press the button, it's simply enough. And I, I understand the will home in on the individual speaker like it is me at the moment. So don't worry about no cards. Uh, new technology is caught up with us on that one. Uh, uh, just to remind you that this is a live meeting and we are being live streamed. Uh, you already know that, John announced it. Um, City Plans Panel deals with applications from the city center as well as the largest and most significant applications the council receives. The aim of the panel is to hear all the relevant information from applicants, members of the public and council officers to help members of the panel make their decision. Could I now invite members and officers to introduce themselves and mute your microphones once you have done so. Can I start on my right with Mr. Carr, please? Technology, not that good after all. Good afternoon, Jonathan Carr, Head of Development Management. Good afternoon. David Feeney, I'm the Chief Planning Officer for Leeds. Hello, um, I'm Nikki Diol. I'm the legal advisor to the panel today. Good afternoon, Stephen Raleigh, Design Officer. Tom Beavis, um, Blood Risk and Management. Good afternoon, John Grieve, Governor of Services, and I'll be Clark in today's meeting. Good afternoon, Councillor Graham Latty. I represent Geisley and Rawdon. Councillor Paul Wadsworth, I represent Geisley and Rawdon as well. Good afternoon, everybody. I am Councillor Dan Cowan, representing the All Woodley Ward. Uh, Councillor David Blackburn, family and workly ward. In high definition, and may I apologise to anybody watching. <laughs> Similar apology. Um, my name's Robert Finnegan. I'm a Morley North Ward Councillor. Good afternoon, everyone. Councillor Colin Campbell. Good afternoon. Toby Russell, Senior Technical Officer. Good afternoon, Councillor Al Garthwaite, Headingley and Hyde Park Ward. Good afternoon, Councillor Peter Carlill, Cavalier and Farsley Ward. Good afternoon, Kayleigh Brooks, Little London and Widows Ward, and I've got some poor minimizer at home if anyone wants to, me to bring it in <laughs> next time. <laughs> Good afternoon, folks. Councillor Neil Walshaw, Headingley and Hyde Park Ward. Good afternoon, Councillor Caroline Gruen, um, Bramley and Stanley Ward. Good afternoon, Councillor Elizabeth Nash, Hanslet and Riverside Ward. Hello, Gillian McLeod, Transport Development Services Manager. Good afternoon, Mark Jackson, Principal Planning Officer. Hello, Adam Ward, Southwest Team Leader. Hello, Daljit Singh, City Centre Team Leader. Thank you for that, members and officers. Uh, moving on then, can we move to agenda item number one? Over to you, John. Thank you, Chair. Under agenda item one, there are no appeals against the refusal of inspection of documents. Under agenda item two, there are no items which require the exclusion of the press or public. Under item three, the late items, I'm unaware of any late items of business. Under agenda item four, could I ask members to declare any interest they may have? I'll assume that's none. Um, apologies for absence. We've got a full house chair. Uh, no apologies. Thank you. Brilliant, John. Thank you for that. Um, 
Can we then move on to uh, the agenda item six, which is the minutes of the meeting held on the 28th of October? Can I do the usual way, turn, turn pages and stop me if you want to? Starting with page 11, page 12, page 13, page 14, and finally, page 15. Robert. Uh, briefly, Chair, if you can see right at the bottom, page 15, um, to discuss with members the provision of a construction management plan. I think that meant ward members. That hasn't happened as yet, so it's just a friendly reminder to the planning department that they need to come to us to discuss what was agreed. Thank you, Robert. I'm sure uh, Mr Carr has taken note of that. Um, moving on, then. Uh, item number seven. Oh, sorry. Are there any matters arising? We take your as a comment. First of all, do we agree it's a true and correct record, I should say? Missed a bit. Yep. yep, that's agreed. And I take it there's no matters arising. Okay. Can we move on then to uh, item number eight? Um, please, Mark, when you're ready, would you introduce it for us? Thank you, Chair. Good afternoon. Uh, the application that's uh, put for you um, comprises of parcel of land uh, approximately 38 hectares in size uh, which is proposed to be developed for employment uses ranging from b2 to b8 uses which include general industrial and warehousing and storage and distribution purposes together with ancillary office spaces the site Proposed, uh, proposes um, a, a master plan with five indicative large uh, units that vary in size that are on a parcel of land that has been allocated in the site allocation plan for the development of general employment uses. To give members updates since the agenda was uh, published, um, further 13 objection letters have been received together with two further representations supporting the proposal. Although the representations that object to the proposal do not raise any new material planning considerations that haven't already been covered in the Chief Planning Officer's recommendation, one letter has raised concerns with the posting of letters informing the public of this meeting, uh, which was sent on the 16th of November. Uh, the, the letter outlines concerns that they weren't received until a couple of days ago. Only one letter has identified this and the letters were sent out on the 16th of November. So it's, we feel that that is um, a Royal Mail matter. The letters of support similarly do not raise any new material planning considerations. Um, they do make references to uh, the significant loss of existing commercial units within the Morley area and do express um, their, their support for this proposal in terms of the benefits that it will bring to the community. For further clarification, uh, it is noticed that uh, paragraph 59 of the recommendation, um, it, the Chief Planning Officer's recommendation states that no councillors have made representations. Comments of support were originally received when the application was submitted in December 2020 from a councillor, Neil Dawson. However, because he is former councillor, the, the comments are included and were taken into consideration in the report, but he wasn't down in paragraph 59 as being a councillor. Since the publication of the agenda, three councillors have made representations and these include comments and representations from Councillor Jane Senior, Councillor Wynne Kidger, Councillor Anne Forsyth. They don't raise any new material planning considerations that haven't already been considered in the officer's recommendation. It's also for to note, the applicant has also um, raised an, a, a paragraph 17, a typo uh, with regards to unit three, uh, which, 
in, in is the square meters should read 3,414.2 square meters. So onto the proposal and the site itself. If we could have slide three, please. The, the application is a hybrid application for um, five large scale units that will deliver um, just over 100,000 uh, square meters of employment space. The application is a hybrid application with outline consent being requested for the development uh, of the five units which falls under the site, uh, the, the parcel of land is allocated in the site allocation plan. And full details have been submitted regarding engineering works, strategic landscaping, and the inclusion of new public footpaths and connectivity uh, for the, the parcel of land to the north of the site allocation plan site. Uh, in between uh, the, the residential properties to the north and northwest of, of the site, as shown on slide three. I, can I ask if we've got the pointer so I could actually show using the pointer to just give a just further clarification for that? So this, just for clarity, this, the site which is allocated in the site allocation plan is the parcel of land there. The parcel of land to the north is for works to include sustainable drainage, strategic landscaping, and that forms um, details for full planning consideration. I'll move on to those, uh, uh, provide a bit more clarity in a second, but I'll first describe where the site is. So the application site is situated approximately one kilometre away from Morley Town Centre into the north and west of the M62. Um, it's accessed um, from Dewsbury Road, the A653, which is located just off junction 28 of of the M62. The entrance currently leads to the Capital Park East site. The site, site topography undulates significantly uh, and the, it's generally flat around where the current development of Capital Park is. But as members will recall from the site visit, it falls away to the north and towards the houses to the north and west. As I've just mentioned, the proposal is a hybrid application and there are matters to be considered at outline and other matters that will be, um, will need full consideration. The matters of detail that relate to the full planning application relate to the demolition of the existing buildings and structures, earthworks formed uh, to form de de development platforms and landscaping uh, bums to, uh, to mitigate to an extent against the visual impact of the development, drainage features, embankments and bums, strategic landscaping, alterations of existing access road including works to existing top cliff lane with junction A653. There is also the construction of the new access road to serve the employment development is also for full consideration. In essence, the works that will uh, are seeking full planning consent are these works here and the, the improvements to the, the existing access and junction. The matters for consideration at outline are the construction of the employment buildings up to 102,890 square meters of B2 and B8 uses, and the associated servicing and infrastructure, including car parking and vehicle servicing, 
pedestrian and cycle circulation within within this parcel of land Lands landscaping in and around the buildings um, together with mitigation measures for noise um, and and other amenity issues the proposal will ultimately have significant social environmental and economic benefits which i will cover in in a bit more detail further on if i could ask for slide seven please as this is a good slide to indicate uh, and distinguish between the outline matters for outline and the, the strategic landscaping and, um, and engineering works to the north of the site which will be for full planning consent although the development in the main is for outline consent the details put forward at this stage have tried to ensure that issues relating to climate change have been addressed the reserve matters for the the buildings themselves will will have to cover details of exact building specifications materials and their exact appearances but the perimeter the outline consent has provided a series of plans that provide parameters so such as the heights the indicative locations of these buildings to show that outline consent for uh, employment um, buildings of up to the 102,000 square meters can be um, provided on the site and adequately served. It, the, the issues relating to climate change though have been covered to um, a great extent in the in the proposal and an environmental statement was submitted with the proposal looking at all all the various potential impacts of the proposal on the wider area it's expected although the details of these buildings will be submitted in any reserve matters application it is um, it has been shown that they will meet briam standards of excellence and wherever possible improvements to landscaping and, and biodiversity across the site will go um, above and beyond what our policy requirements are and looking to seek uh, overall carbon footprint uh, reductions uh, wherever possible at this stage though although they reserve matters it is is considered that uh, in terms of its impact on climate change policies re requiring um, the the standard of BRIAM will be met the site as I have mentioned before is allocated in the site allocation plan and as part of the adoption process the the sustainability of the site was looked at and scrutinized in in significant detail it's considered to because of its location near um, various uh, strategic highways networks um, and also close to local employment sources it's considered that the regeneration benefits and its sustainable location uh, it was a, a, a very good site and was put forward therefore for adoption in the site allocation plan which it unduly was the site allocation plan did have requirements however and these related to highways issues and looking at the heritage value of the farm buildings that currently occupy the site in terms of the heritage uh, of the farm farm buildings as members all recall the the land is is agricultural at, at present uh, the farm buildings um, in the most part are, are large chicken sheds um, that are, are dilapidated and the heritage value is as is perceived to be more to do with the archaeological um, archaeological findings across the site which the applicant has looked into in great detail as part of the submission of this application the sap requirements for the highways 
sought mitigation measures to um, mitigate against any impact upon uh, traffic uh, in increases and to look at improvements to junction 28 of the M62 together with a variety of other junctions in the locality. They requ required the developer to provide cumulative impact contributions, but also to look at the mitigation measures on junction 28. The applicant, together with Leeds Highways Authority, Kirk Lees Highways Authority and National Highways, formerly Highways England, have been working together to, to look at um, working up a scheme to improve um, the, 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 the way Junction 28 of the M62 works. If I could ask for slide 22, please. Uh, sorry, 23, please. This is a drawing that has been um, has been worked up by the applicant together with those other authorities uh, and is proposed to improve the connectivity of the, the application site, but also improve um, connectivity of other developments within the area. In line with the SAP requirements, the mitigation measures proposed are, are considered sufficient to ensure traffic generated by the proposal is mitigated against. And this, the proposal to Junction 28 is um, approximately a three million pound contribution is going to be made by the developer uh, for which they will carry out part of uh, the, the works to this um, prior to their development coming online. The other phases are like, uh, will be carried out by Leeds Highways Authority and um, when the further schemes in Kirk Lees come online, they will contribute and carry out the works to, that, to the second phase, which will mitigate against their traffic impact. In terms of the development, not only has provided significant works to be uh, proposed to Junction 28, but if you could go to slide 22, please, there is also significant works being proposed to the access into the site. And this includes works to um, form a bus lane, which will ensure that the site can uh, connect better with the, the wider area. And the travel plan that has been produced can be implemented properly. Further works, uh, further contributions have been made to other local junctions, and the developer is putting forward £1.18 million to improve not only this access, but other, um, other junctions in the local vicinity. The proposal, along with the travel plan that's been provided, and together with various improvements to footpaths um, through and around the site, is going to connect uh, strongly with the Morley area and, and link uh, the, the site, um, not only with Morley and, and the local employment source, but also looking at, at providing good connectivity to the wider region. So overall, the proposal for in, in terms of the outline consent, the principle of out, outline permission for the, the five large units has not only been established in the site allocation plan, but it has been clearly demonstrated through this, this submission that the, the requirements of the site allocation plan have been met. The, the proposal, the principle of the outline consent will be accompanied by a section 106 agreement. And these will include uh, means of securing the travel plan, highways improvements, an employment strategy to try and ensure that wherever possible, the employment provisions can go to local um, em employment sources. And therefore, 
the Section 106, although it's, it hasn't been completed, it is being progressed to a significant level. And, and that will ultimately ensure the delivery of the outline consent and making sure it meets the SAP requirement. The matters of detail relate to the, the north of the, the site. Uh, and these mainly relate to uh, a parcel of, of land outside of the adopted, uh, the, the site that's been adopted. It's designated as Greenbelt. However, the works relate to sustainable drainage systems, strategic engineering works, and strategic landscaping, which will help ultimately integrate the proposal within its surrounding landscape. As a result of this, the, it's as, rec, as put forward in the Chief Planning Officer's recommendation, this, this aspect meets the National Planning Policies Framework's requirements for development within the Greenbelt. So it's not considered that these works are inappropriate in the Greenbelt and therefore are acceptable in terms of policy. The engineering works will facilitate the overall, uh, will provide development platforms, but they'll also provide amenity bonds and, and a landscaping uh, or the foundations for significant strategic landscaping to be provided. If I could bring up the landscaping plan on page seven again, I think this helps illustrate where the, the landscaping will be. As members will recall from site, we stood and we walked along the, the public footpath here. In terms of the further public footpaths that are to be created in, the, in this landscaped area, together with significant biodiversity improvements, which will ultimately uh, meet the, the requirements for biodiversity net gains. Furthermore, engineering works will are, are proposed in the full, applica uh, full uh, application here to enhance uh, the and, and minimise the impact of fu the future buildings here. It's considered that the details provided for the, the full application are fully compliant with, with policy and, and together with the social environmental uh, Im improvement, it's, it's, it's overall considered that the, the application can be supported. Before I conclude, I think it's important to just um, reiterate a few of the, the social uh, economic and environmental benefits. The proposal has been considered to be sustainable in the site allocation plan and has been worked up. Uh, the application has been brought forward uh, after a considerable amount of time by the developer um, uh, putting the, the application together, but also looking at, at the, the market trends. In terms of the um, the, the economic benefits, the end use is likely to, is considered to be for warehousing and distribution. And prior to the applications being brought forward and prior to uh, the, the pandemic, the, the applicant has always envisaged that the, the, there is going to be a significant growth in this, this sector. The pandemic has ultimately accelerated the need for larger warehousing that can accommodate current uh, logistic, the, the current logistic sectors. And it was, it's considered that this, this opportunity uh, is not only going to uh, be of significant benefit to Leeds itself, but to the, to the region as a whole. Furthermore, the employment opportunities, it's likely to create 13, approximately 1,300 jobs, which is, as I said before, is going to uh, serve a, a local community. And the connectivity to that local community is, is going to be significantly improved, improved 
to try and make a development more sustainable but and ensure that more as a whole can sustain its its economic growth but also become a, a, a stronger community as a result. In terms of the environmental benefits, it's, it's, con it's considered that the biodiversity improvements, the improved landscaping, improved public rights of way, improve, improved drainage of the site, will all be of significant benefit to the wider area. It's also of, of note that since this application was received, Morley itself has been recognised as an area for which regeneration is needed by the government. And the Morley Town Fund, since this application was submitted, has been awarded £25 million to look at regeneration improvements. One of the issues that is being looked at by the Morley Town Fund is connectivity through the Morley area. This application will link with those, the wider aspirations of that. And this provides an opportunity to improve public footpaths uh, in and around the site, but also improve highways, uh, highways networks, including the bus, bus gate, making access in and around Morley uh, better. In terms of the construction and operational phases, there's significant benefits, um, and they're all outlined in the, the Chief Officer's planning recommendation. But for now, if I could leave it at that and ask any questions, and thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mark, for that report. Uh, we will come to questions from you uh, next, but at the moment we have, uh, two objectors who wish to speak. Um, so can I invite, uh, I've got Town Councillor Oliver Newton and uh, Chris Bell, uh, you've come forward already. As you know, you have four minutes to make your comments and then uh, members will be free to ask any questions of you they wish. Uh, how you divide that time up is entirely up to you. So please begin when you're ready, thank you. Yeah, so first of all, four minutes is not long enough for the scale of this application. There's so much at stake for the area. And I'm not going to repeat all the 393 objections, but some residents have already told me this morning that some of their objections haven't been put onto the planning portal. But this size, traffic, environment, noise and light pollution that are all grave concerns for the residents. Now, I want to draw attention to this report that came out last week. It's completely... It completely disregards residents. Now, I stand corrected, but out of these 221 paragraphs, four are on the topic of residents. Now, the units will operate 24-7, lighting, pollution, noise that comes with that. Now, not only HGVs will contribute to that, but the effects of the proposed 1,300 1, parking spaces. But this is in four to five years' time. There's lots of discussion on developing public rights of way from the applicant. But there's more about this than residence issues. But for the next four to five years during the construction, no one will be using them. The report states that the effects during construction phase are negligible, but that's wrong. Who wants to live and walk adjacent to a building site and the subsequent operation along with the nuisance that that entails? Now turning to junction 28, I refer to the comment in the report that it impacts on commuting and, and the impacts on commuting and local services are negligible. Everyone in Leeds knows that this is a bottleneck junction. And I would say that everyone at some point in West Yorkshire has felt the effects of that junction. A single accident on the M62 or the M1, the whole of Leeds, including Junction 28, comes to a standstill. Now, the road down to White Rose is already under strain with traffic. And coming the other way, the corresponding impact of this application and the proposed Chidswell and Hague Wood sites will only contribute to this more. Now, there'll be a new group of vehicles that come from Capital Park now, um, which will put even more strain on this. But the report refers to the 202 and 203 bus services, but these will still get stuck in the same traffic. Now, we've seen objections from East Ardsley, Osset, 
and even Oakenshaw in Bradford. So, so to say that it will not lead to a worsening of local services and the effects are considered negligible is complete maladministration. Now, we've seen 2,000 jobs, 30 apprenticeships. And then we saw 1,800 jobs. But then the report says 1,200 jobs, 800 less. The local employment agreement is completely inadequate. Now, there's plenty of industrial units in the local area which have the capacity for this social economic growth, as continually referred to by the applicant in this report. There's no need for more. Even more relevant now, allowing such application is completely against the policy of the council's woodland creation. The council are aware of the, net, of the government's net carbon goals, but planting more trees rather than warehouses on green space would seem to the best way forward rather than the neglect of woodland. With all this in mind, and whether it's directly or indirectly at junction 28, the pollution and even animal habitats it's not just going to affect Morley and Leeds, but I think it will affect the whole of West Yorkshire. Thank you, Councillor Newton, for those comments. Okay, so I'd like to just uh, further back up that uh, I'm overwhelmingly in support of all of these comments and it reflects everything that the local community has been saying on this topic for the last several months. It's not even a divisive scheme. It's an overwhelming opposition. At least 95% of comments, whenever this is raised, have been in favour of this being rejected. And many of the panel here have uh, signed up to the declaration of a, a climate emergency. And I would suggest that if that is uh, to be more than just words on a piece of paper, then you should back that with action by rejecting this scheme and protecting the heritage of Morley for its residents, present and future, and the wider West Yorkshire community. Uh, thank you, Councillor Newton. Thank you, Mr. Bell. Um, members, questions, please. Uh, I saw uh, Councillor Dan Cohn first, please. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Bell. Thank you, Councillor Newton, for your comments. Uh, you'll know one of the advantages of the questions is there isn't a time limit on the answer. So I had, th I had uh, three questions, if I may, I'll pose them all at once. Uh, you spoke very, very briefly about your concerns about the traffic pollution, light pollution and noise pollution from this 24 hour site. Perhaps you could just go into a little bit more detail about what the impacts of that are likely to be and where those are likely to be felt. Uh, could you perhaps give me a bit of thought or give us, a, us some thought on what you would propose uh, in terms of dealing with issues at Junction 28? Uh, and perhaps you could just explain in a little bit more detail uh, about how this development would go against the policy of woodland creation that you referred to. Thank you. Well, pollution, I think it will be impacted on everyone in Morley, really, and especially the residents that are close by. You know, this construction phase is going to go on for four to five years until we see any benefit of the, of the, uh, the construction of it. Um, but in terms of traffic, um, you know, I'm, I'm part of the younger generation. It's me. It's got to commute to Leeds if I want to work in Leeds. And obviously that is a bottleneck that's recognized by everyone and um you know it, they can do all they want for it but there's all, there's only so much space there is now um I, I think one of your questions was how to deal with the woodland um aspect of it um now the, i've seen that i've seen the the uh, the applicant's presentation and and I've seen the trees and I've seen how long those trees will take to grow and cover the warehouses. And there are some residents there that won't, probably won't even see the result of that. Um, and this is what concerns me being part of the younger generation that it, when, am I, when am I going to see the benefits of that? Um, I, I don't know if you had a third question. I can't remember the third question. Um, but yeah, if, if Chris has got anything, I, I, I just, yeah. 
Yeah, well, certainly the noise, the noise pollution aspect uh, obviously primarily affects the people who live sort of within the first half a mile or so of the location. But uh, as you'll have uh, realised from having gone and had a quick walk around the site, it's uh, one of the highest points of the area with remarkable views uh, of the whole region and can be seen from a long way away. And the light pollution is an aspect that will affect all residents of Morley and really uh, reduce any uh, sort of stars and the standard night activity that most people would enjoy, the peace and quiet and uh, the mental health well-being aspects of that. Is that okay, Dan? Yep. Um, David Blackburn, please. Councillor Blackburn. Uh, you briefly mentioned um, public transport access to the site. Uh, I mean, I, I was on out on site visit this morning. I was questioning about the bus stops and that. But um, do you see do you see any way that this is going to connect in so, so people in Morley could work there? Or do you see this just as something that's going to encourage more cars into the area? Thanks, David. I think it's going to be, I think it's going to encourage people to drive with the parking spaces, 1,300 parking spaces, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. Now, the 202, 203 bus services connects Leeds with Kirklees, and it's an important commuter route. And there's only the 217, which is a key commuter direct express bus service now if it's a bottleneck and people can't get from Kirklees to Leeds it's going to make people flee those bus services especially part of the younger generation and especially with the location of Morley station there is really no train station either so in public transport terms you've only got buses so and we know as well that that hill from White Rose to Capitol Park, nobody's going to cycle up that. And it's but we're relying on buses. So unless a, you know, unless there's some plan to sort something out about that, then in answer to your question, David, I don't I, I think people will flee the buses because they won't be able to get to work. And then uh, Councillor Finnegan, please. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, you said in your speech about other alternative empty warehousing space across Morley. I wonder if you might uh, perhaps clarify a little bit more on that. And I wonder if you had any comments on the types of jobs created by the logistical development sort of process that's council finnegan yeah just uh just on the last point on the latter point actually um about the jobs i read in the report somewhere at paragraph six that at this stage the end users of the development are unknown however whilst it's hard to confirm job types that will be created the units are likely to have end users in the logistics sector now I had a look at the Office of National Statistics. Number of large good vehicle drivers in employment from April 2020 to April 2021. 275,000, 121,000, so that well majority of that are between the ages of 50 and 64. Now, so, so that, that's in answer to your latter question. Um, but now in terms of empty, empty, empty warehouses, there's Howley Park, there's Asquith Avenue, um, there's tree fields at Gildersham, um, Brunkef, Brunk, uh, Brunkcliffe Lane. Um, so there's clearly no need and there's clearly space, as I said in my statement, for social and economic growth elsewhere. Thank you, Councillor Newman. Any further comments or questions from members? Not comments, I should say, questions at this stage. Councillor Campbell, please. Can I just ask, uh, 
given that this, no, most of this site has a des designation in what is the effect the lease development plan. And that designation is an employment site. Is it simply this development you don't like or the principle of development you don't like? Well, I think, I, well, first of all, no, nobody seems to know what kind of jobs are being proposed. And it's obviously logistics. Now, I've already said the demographic of people that that, um, that appeals to, but there's been nothing from the applicant in terms of the younger generation as to how that is going. I've seen 30 apprenticeships, but I've also seen 2,000 jobs that's now 1,200. So there seems to be no plan for those people that are under the age of 50 in terms of what employment opportunities are there. You know, Marley's a very big place. It's going to increase in population. There's going to have to be more high schools than there already is in primary schools almost. And how are they encouraging those sorts of people to, to seek employment here? There's no, there seems to be nothing that I can see that's going to encourage that. And being leaving school and becoming an apprentice, for leaving school and not going to university, this is this is this is you know, this is why I'm getting you know get very passionate about it because it's something that I need to see. Um, as far as I'm concerned, there's there's nothing there. So hopefully that answers your question, really. But in term, you know, there's lots of socioeconomic benefits of it. Um, but there seems to be no what part of society it's attracting. So, from from that, can I assume that what what you're really saying to us is, you understand that uh, this is an employment site and, and and may at some point, if it's given planning permission, produce employment, but at the moment you're, it's effectively what's proposed currently. Uh, or the type of employment that's proposed currently you have, you have some issues with. Yeah, yeah, that's right. It seems in the report that, it, like I've said, it just says that this sector has a higher than average salary in the end users in the logistics sector, but hard to confirm, hard to confirm what job types. Um, so yeah, got no issue with employment. Um, but it seems to be that, you know, Apprenticeships are on the rise. There's only 30 being proposed. There's not a lot of, you know, not a lot of, there won't be any interest from the younger generation in my, in my view. And, um, you know, we even saw this morning at the site visit, there was younger people there interested in this site. And from what I could, what I can see in this, that there don't seem to be any attraction to the younger generation because it, because of what it is. Um, so, yeah. I can just add some further points to that. Um, but in principle, it would be uh, better if this uh, sort of rare piece of um, urban green space was kept in its current position. I we do accept that it's been, having been um, designated as employment, uh, the concerns that we're trying to raise are around the actual development that's in question, the scale of it, the type of jobs, the complete vagaries and refusal to be pinned down on who is even going to occupy the units, what the working times are going to be, how many jobs they're going to be, because at every single uh, stage of um, development uh, updates, uh, the number of jobs are being uh, created by the scheme of being slipping down and down. Uh, so how can we take at face value the assurance that uh, this will actually even be of any net economic benefit, uh, let alone the wider concerns to the uh, people of Morley? If it was uh, a uh, high value, high skilled uh, set of occupations that were going to be filled that uh, couldn't be um, cited elsewhere, as has already been mentioned, there's lots of brownfield sites with underutilized and unoccupied units, uh, but would fit the purposes of companies that have been mentioned, such as Amazon, that 
heavily involved in logistics that could already take advantage of those uh, built areas. Thank you, Mr. Bell. Uh, Councillor Latti, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, a few minutes ago, the, the, the question was raised that uh, you, you said that there's plenty of uh, space, industrial warehousing space locally, so that this actually isn't needed. Um, one of the things that, that, that is getting you particularly exercised is the, the traffic that this will create uh, and the traffic it will create with employees as well. What's the difference? You're going to get exactly the same in that you know, if you were going to be using the places that are available now, presumably to be economical, they're going to have to have the same commercial vehicular traffic uh, and the same workers. Councillor Latte, just just could we just pause there for a moment because I think the live stream has stopped. So could we just check before the? I just. Oh, I think it, it's not visual. Uh, can we just check that? Okay, it's just there's a requirement for us to stream it live. <laughs> do I do the whole bit, bit again? Or? <laughs> right. Okay. <laughs> The sound is still on. Are we happy to carry on with the sound at I the moment? I don't mind. I'm not having my picture at all. Oh, no. yeah. It's high definition. Oh, we're back. Look. Go. There you are. Right. Um, so on the basis that the... The world outside might not have heard that just very, very quickly. You're concerned about traffic to this site and the commercial vehicular traffic to the site. Um, and yet you're, we will be quite happy for the empty warehousing space already available in Morley to absorb, to, to create that same vehicular problem. Uh, also the workers going to the site. Uh, I just wondered why? What, what's the difference? Um, this, I admit, is going to create problems with the development stage, but in terms of uh, its end use, you know, what, what would you be campaigning against those other sites that are available now if they wanted to do the same thing? Well, I think the problem here is Junction 28 because in answer to your question, it will spread the traffic out. That's all I can think of off the top of my head. It will spread the traffic traffic from that bottleneck at Junction 28. And the traffic, there's only one, as shown on that presentation, there was only one access point into these warehouses that are significantly, uh, uh, you know, 1,300 parking spaces plus logistics activities. And... Having those empty industrial sites more utilised, it will spread that traffic away from that junction, and and, and you know spreading out is it, it can only be a good thing. But that bottleneck junction at Junction Twenty Eight, where all that traffic is going, it's not it's it's not suitable at the moment. And even the plans that are being proposed, um, with the increasing cars. I don't think I don't think it'll be adequate enough. Basically, obviously, I'm not you know I'm not here to talk about that, but it's about that traffic at that junction 28, which will have an impact on almost everyone in Leeds if something happens. If you know, only takes a little accident on the M1 or the M62, and the whole of Leeds comes to a standstill. It's going to put people off coming into the city centre and commuting. So hopefully that answers your question because. You know, I'm only speaking on behalf of residents, really, so people can answer this question a bit better. But yeah, so hopefully that answers it. Well, that's what you're there for. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. You made your point. Just additionally to that, for some of the existing sites, such as Harley Park, the uh, existing bus networks uh, have much uh, greater provision for 
for those for serving those sites so uh, more people would actually be able to uh, travel by public transport uh, for employment there compared to uh, the current site uh, in question if we were looking at it for benefits to Morley because there's no current bus route uh, from the centre of Morley to uh, Capital Park. Thank you. Are there any further questions to uh, Councillor Newton or Mr Bell? If not, then can I thank them for the contribution and invite the developers to come forward to uh, to make their speech? I've got quite a list of them, but if you if you tell me uh, who you are before you speak, I'll know, rather than write uh, quite a long list here. Uh, again, again, you will have four minutes to make your comments. Good afternoon. Uh, please start your comments when you're ready and do please introduce yourself to the panel and people in the audience. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Hannah Richardson. I'm a planning consultant acting on behalf of the applicant. The application is recommended for approval. The officer's report concludes that the scheme is acceptable in planning terms and will deliver a whole suite of benefits which the developer, Paul of Stirling Capital, will discuss shortly. The majority of the application site was allocated in 2019 and hence the principle of development has been established. A small part of the site lies within the green belt, however it's to be used for landscaping, along with the creation of drainage ponds and new usable footpaths which improve linkages into Morley and beyond. This will create a significant area of biodiversity, giving direct public access to the residents of Morley and future employees of the site. Critically, the inclusion of this land within this scheme will ensure that it's protected from development, managed and maintained as an area of biodiversity in the long term. We have undertaken an ongoing process of engagement, which included contact with over 800 households, existing businesses, key stakeholders, which included ward councillors. We do recognise that this scheme of a, scale, a scheme of this scale has impacts, it, as it will deliver change for both the site and the community. However, we've worked very hard to mitigate these impacts and to address them by amending this scheme in several ways, which included increasing the area of tree planting, landscaping, additional bonding and the widening of footpaths. We have worked collaboratively with National Highways and other key stakeholders and have agreed an improvement scheme for Junction 28 amounting to £8 million. Leeds Highway officers have also confirmed they support our proposal on the basis we are providing contributions totalling around 4.5 million for our share of the Junction 28 scheme improvements and improvements to sustainable transport. There are no technical, uh, sorry, and that includes SIL. There are no technical or environmental issues that, are we, that we have not addressed within our proposals and the scheme is acceptable in planning terms. I will now hand over to Paul to explain the benefits of the scheme further. Afternoon, my name is Paul Beckett, Head of Development at Sterling Capital. Sterling Capital has a proud history of being based in Leeds since its foundation in 1992, delivering Capital Park Leeds, which has been a phenomenal success story, creating over 2,000 jobs to date. We would now like to build on this success by developing the next phase in conjunction with our development partners, UK Logistics Specialist PLP. We believe our proposals are crucial for Morley and South Leeds, creating much needed jobs and investment, providing a timely boost to the local area's economy, building back from the pandemic. These views are shared with many who have written in to support the proposal. Demand from occupiers is now at unprecedented levels, in part accelerated by the pandemic. The supply of modern facilities and indeed deliverable development sites is extremely scarce. The site offers an unparalleled opportunity to deliver much needed facilities and in turn, deliver huge benefits for the local area, including jobs. We are estimating to deliver almost 2,000 gross, 1,300 net full-time jobs once fully operational. We are committed to a local employment strategy to ensure the jobs and apprenticeships created are provided to the residents of Morley. New and enhanced landscaping, delivering over 12% by diversity net gain. We are delivering an additional 2.2 million pound in business rates to be created annually. Delivery of a sustainable scheme in accordance with carbon net zero standards and BRIAM excellent buildings, all aligning with Leeds City Council's declaration on climate change emergency and the council's best council policy. 
the benefits of the scheme we consider to be a huge boost to Morley, following the £25 million Morley Town deal, which ties in with our skills and employment strategy. This all points to a very bright future for this proud and historic town and a development we all can be proud of. In light of this, we welcome your officer's recommendation and we request that members support this application. Thank you. Thank you for those comments. Uh, can I now invite members to ask any questions they choose? There's quite a list, I'll get your, I'll start with you, Kaylee. The rest, please leave your hands up. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm interested in hearing a bit more about this employment strategy because um, paragraph 20, it's mentioned in paragraph 20 that you've got one, you obviously just said so. Um, but also in the paragraph prior to that, um, advanced manufacturing is mentioned, as is the Leeds Inclusive Growth Strategy. So um, what exactly is it that the employment is going to be on the site? Is it going to be purely logistics or is it going to be scope for higher skilled, higher paid jobs as well? Like, uh, is there going to be, into, you know, like there was mention of um, the, the training possibilities and things like, I, I'm just a bit confused as to what exactly is going to be happening with that. Hello, uh, my name is Keith Wilson. I'm here on behalf of PLP, uh, Sterling's development partners, and we're experts in the logistics field. Um, I think there's a few discussion points I've heard about jobs general and employment, so I'd probably just like to talk about that. I think fundamentally the scheme is predominantly a logistics scheme. However, there are some B2 elements to this. So there could certainly be some advanced manufacturing here. Looking at the master plan, I think two of the small units particularly would be ideally suited for advanced manufacturing. So I think, I think that's the first point to make. I think there's been talk about job numbers. Um, these job numbers are based upon widely understood within the industry um, ratios based on the floor space available. So at this point, there's no occupiers who've been earmarked for this scheme, and we've done that deliberately. We need to give occupiers certainty. We want to bring this site forward to the point where we can then give occupiers a credible program so that they can build their business plans accordingly. So the exact job numbers won't be known until the occupiers come forward. However, these ratios that I've talked about have been produced by uh, the HCA, and that's based on floor space. So I think that's, uh, that's an important point to make. So we can fine tune those. I also don't recognize some of the descriptions about modern logistics. In my view, modern logistics is a highly skilled industry. I think over the last two years, particularly logistics seemingly has never been out of the news. It underpins our wider economy, be it keeping food on supermarket shelves, supporting the manufacturing industry, or even dare I say, supporting the NHS in providing medical supplies. So I think logistics itself is a really important industry. And whilst there are a number of entry level jobs envisaged, firstly, that's not a bad thing. I think there's lots of people locally who would certainly benefit from a first job getting on the employment ladder, or maybe even older people trying to return to work. However, these facilities are more often than not now, more like head offices. The scale of the offices that's attached to each building indicates that. So you work your way up in these buildings. You could start on the, on, on the warehouse floor, you could very quickly become a team leader on that warehouse floor. However, you then move into the offices, you could work in marketing, sales, accountants, or, or any of the other kind of professional areas within there. So I think, I think that I'd really like to make that point. And then finally, turn into the local employment strategy. Local employment strategies are used nationally. I've been involved in a number of these throughout the country. And what they do is that they ensure that the benefits of these schemes are felt locally, both during the construction phase where we target local suppliers specifically, and also encourage uh, and build links with colleges, for example, who may have courses around construction, but then also the occupiers themselves. So the occupiers will be put in touch with the likes of colleges, chamber, the LEP, to ensure that when they advertise jobs, they're advertised locally first and foremost. So I think it, hopefully that answers the question, but also one or two other things as well that I just wanted to clarify. But in summary, the jobs will be a, a wide range of jobs, both skilled and unskilled, but I think they're well suited to the location. 
Yeah, I'll just come back if I may. Um, I wasn't I wasn't saying that unskilled jobs are lesser, but that's not what I was getting at. What I'm saying is that they're usually lower paid. So like, I just wanted some reassurance that one, the, the jobs that are gonna be provided in at this site are going to be at the very least the, the national living wage. And two, that there's going to be progression, which is a bit that you answered. But like, I'm, I'm from Nottinghamshire and we have a place uh, nearby that uh, it rhymes with Dort Spirect and it made national press. So this is why I'm quite um, angry about sort of warehouses and things like that. So that's that's just a bit of reassurance I'd like to hear, please. I think I understand who you're talking about. Um, and I think there has been some negativity around logistics practices historically. In my experience at the moment, occupiers are finding it very difficult to recruit as are lots of other companies within, within the wider economy. And one of the biggest things they look for is a supply of labor because they need, they recognize they need to, to resource these adequately. And we have seen improved conditions undoubtedly within the logistics sector over the past number of years, but certainly within the last 18 months when, when the, these jobs have almost become a premium. So whilst it all completely depends on the occupiers and the nature of the jobs that they do, um, we, you know, we're, we're not looking to, to put people in with questionable employment strategies. Councillor Carlisle, please. Thanks, Chair. Um, it sort of expands on the previous point a little bit, but um, uh, we had some concerns raised around the type of uh, development in this area and, and the use cases that we were thinking here and also the fact that there may be other similar buildings elsewhere now obviously you're coming to develop this so you think you've got a proposition here that that will work for you but i wondered if you could just explain how you came to the idea that these were the kind of use clay use um classes and the, and the kind of developments and the kind of size units you thought would work on this site and in this specific area and then um we have heard that concern that there's some empty units around the area. I just wondered why you thought that occupiers that, that you could attract would want to go here rather than use some of those other ones? So I think 2020 was the record year for occupier take up nationally for logistics. This year will increase that further and it knows, so shows no signs of abating at all. This has been accelerated by the pandemic. It's been prompted by the rise of online retail which is structural, it's only going, only going one way. Brexit has contributed towards this as well because manufacturers particularly now need their supply chains much closer to home. I think the term is nearshoring. So it's almost kind of created a perfect storm where logistics demand has accelerated beyond anyone's expectation. And as I say, these are structural changes that are only going to continue. At the same time, supply has remained constrained and continues to be constrained. I saw um, one, of the, one of the agents did a presentation that was at yesterday and the supply of facilities nationally is at its lowest level ever. It's down to a few weeks in some markets. West Yorkshire is one of those markets where there's only a few months of supply. So I've got absolutely no doubt that increased levels of demand, unprecedented levels of demand, continuing shortage of supply has led to this situation and this isn't going to change. And I've heard talk about other units being available. There is nothing available of this scale anywhere close by. I mean, that, that's just a fact. And I know that because if there was, they would have been occupied by now or we'd be trying to buy them to develop them. So I can categorically say that these large units are not replicated elsewhere. And that's why we're so keen to obviously progress these development plans. Sorry, thank you, Chair. Just coming in, when you were looking at the original plans for this, then did you look at any other models that you could have, whether whether office development would work on this site or similar? Um, and, and how did that balance go if you did? We've been working on this scheme for, for a number of years. We've been in Capital Park for 15 years and we've developed some, some great offices around Capital Park East and West. Um, this site lends itself to this type of development. We've created a unit so there's a spectrum from the, the smaller units to the large units, and they can change for the 
the application is outlined, so we can change those sizes. Um, and we think the mix we've got, as shown in this master plan, is, is something that will appeal to the market. And I think just to add further, just to reiterate a point I made earlier, that these plans do include some significant offices as part of this development. So these are not just empty warehouses where, where there's not so many people working in there. There are large areas of offices and the whole suite of, of, of jobs that you would find in offices, even if they're located in the city centre. Thank you. So, okay, Peter. Councillor Gartwright, please. Yes, thank you. Um, my question's part, partly covered by the last answer. Um, but also, um, it seems that this is going to be on a very high location, so it'd be visible for miles around. Um, won't it be, in fact, quite a blot on the landscape, as the objectors seem to be saying? How would you, how do you go about making it not that? Uh, with the accompaniment of pollution. And I'd also like a bit more detail about Junction 28 and how you're going to prevent that being um, even worse than it is at the, that we've heard it is at the moment. I'm Andrew Price from Reform Landscape Architecture. Um, as part of um, the preparation of the application, we prepared a landscape and visual assessment, which considered um, the views of the, of the proposed development from a number of different views, which are agreed with the council. Um, and obviously as part of, as the site is allocated, then there's always gonna be a change to some of those views. What we've done through the iterative process that um, Hannah described is work with the council to minimize the effects of those views um, to the users, um, increasing tree planting. So we're planting about two and a half hectares of, of, of trees, um, which together with street trees proposed through the development and on plot landscaping, which will come as part of uh, reserve matters applications, there's approximately 10,000 trees will be planted with its development. So a significant um, uh, addition to the green infrastructure around this part of Morley. Um, so yeah, so, so it, it's not just about the development, but there is a significant um, improvement to local footpaths, um, to biodiversity, again, as Hannah's described, as part of these proposals. Can I, can I just add as well, so um, there are a number of techniques you can use to try and, I guess, embed these warehouses within the landscape, and, and Andrew and, and his team have, have provided some really expert advice on this. But we've also reviewed the plans as we've gone, and we've spoken to people, and we've done, we've made several changes to ensure that from certain viewpoints, particularly the residential neighborhoods nearby, we've worked harder and we've accepted that maybe we didn't get it right initially, but we've taken feedback. We've introduced higher bonding in certain places. We're planting more trees at a mature level so that some of the landscaping has better screening earlier on in that process. And I think the design of the buildings themselves, whilst they're not actually up for, uh, for, for discussion today, they'll be part of reserve matters. There's lots of techniques you can do, such as vertical uh, cladding bands, which kind of almost disappear into, into the horizon. You start with dark colours at the bottom, move up and get slowly lighter, so that it almost loses themselves in the sky. And I've, I've, I've done a few of those where it, doesn't, it, it sounds implausible, but you do actually make a significant difference into how they, I guess, are, are sympathetic within their, their environment. And Junction 28. Hi there, it's John Orton from iTransport. Um, just on 28, um, we're obviously doing a, a number of works there in paragraph 58, uh, 158 of your the report outlines what the details are. So it's not just a small amount of work, there's significant works around the junction. So on the circulatory, on the approach to the junction and on the exit. Uh, and it's a, it's a significant uh, amount of work adding up to circa 8 million of which we're providing 2.3 million, I think, towards it. Um, and we've been working with those proposals, we've been working with your offices at Leeds, Kirklees, Harry's England collaboratively and painstakingly to try and get the best solution possible at that junction to mitigate the impacts of this development, um, which we think we've done and is accepted by both your offices and National Highways. Um, in addition to that, we've got the the, um, the active travel sort of improvements. So there's improved 
pedestrian crossings around the junction, wider footpaths. Uh, also, there's public transport improvements, so the, the bus gates leading up to the junction um, on the A6 Tewsbury Road, north and south of the junction. So it's, a, it's an extensive package of works there to, to mitigate the impacts. Can I, sorry, can I just add to that as well? Because I think, um, I don't think anyone's except, no one's saying at the moment that that isn't a congested motorway junction. What we're saying is that the works that we're doing to the junction will mitigate for the additional traffic that we're providing. Plus, we're increasing the linkages across that junction for non-car users to help the connectivity of the site. So I think that's the first point. Jonathan's just mentioned the travel plan as well. This is a really sustainable, well-connected site. There are residential areas within walking and cycling distances. And we have a travel plan that we will implement to ensure that that, that, that happens. So we're not looking to add lots of cars to the network. The other thing to say as well is HGVs generally will travel outside of peak hours. It makes no sense for the occupiers to be sending their fleet of vehicles out at peak times. So they'll probably be going out first thing in the morning, five or 6 a.m., coming back after, in the afternoon, going out again and coming back late at night. So I think what we're talking about in the terms of these proposals is we're not adding to the congestion, we're mitigating for the impact that we would have. Okay. Uh, Councillor Blackburn, please. Thanks, Chair. Um, I think you partly answered the, the question I was going to ask, and that was how, how you're going to make sure that people can access this site uh, or coming to work there from Morley, because there's no direct bus service uh, unless they're using the car. But you say you're going to do a travel plan. I'm, I've, I've got to say, when I've, I'm, I'm partly commenting here, part of my difficulty with this is, is not some of the stuff it doesn't state in this document, not what it does say. And the point, point is, is, look, if, if you are not going to be able to bring people to the site by public transport, then, in my opinion, it's unsustainable. So if you are going to find some way of doing it through your travel plan, why do you need so many parking spaces? In terms of in terms of access to the site, you're correct. It is well accessed. You can walk from the site into the Central Morley in 15 minutes. We're improving the, the footways across the site, east, west and north, south, so you can permutate through the site. We are contributing to a, a cycleway and a footway <laughs> down the Jewsbury Road to try and make access as easy as possible, people on, on foot, motorcycle, or, or even horse riders. Um, the car parking we've provided is a industry standard ratio for car parking spaces and disabled spaces. The units will have cycle stores, showering facilities, so people can cycle to the site. The footpaths will be able to be able to cycle it on. There'll be the material which you can use them all year round, some around winter. So we are creating a scheme which is fully accessible from Morley and the surrounding areas. Uh, another question which I should have asked you then, um, it's regarding the configuration of the site. Um, as I understand it, you're going to have platforms with each of the the, uh, the sheds on. Um, the current configuration, I think, uh, is part of, of what you're talking about. Is part of what a lot of the objectors are objecting to. Have, have you looked at, at some other configuration and taking that large block away from where the houses are? Yeah, I mean, that, 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 that's an indicative master plan borne about by a number of iterations. So we're not wedded to that layout. The, the, the exact layout will come forward in due course um, as further reserve matters applications. I think, I think what I would say is that um, as it's an employment allocated site, you, we kind of need to demonstrate that we can use that site efficiently. So what we don't want is huge areas of landscaping or hard standing. So we have um, we, we've ensured that we can fit the amount of quantum floor space on that a site of that size warrants, but it will it's unlikely to be built out in that exact configuration. And as I said earlier, we, we have worked hard to mask unit five to a greater degree by increasing the size of the landscape bonding adjacent to the houses nearby. Thank you. 
Mr. Coyne, please. Thank you, Chair. In your presentation uh, uh, earlier on, uh, you told us that this was going to be a huge boost for Morley. Uh, you told us that you believe the proposal was essential for Morley. You gave the impression that this was widely supported, although when I'm looking at the report, it would seem only five out of 398 responses were supportive. Um, is it the position of the developers that those people who are elected by Morley residents who seem to believe this is a bad idea uh, and all those objectors are somehow misguided uh, and that they're just wrong that this is going to be the answer to all these problems that you are bringing and that all those people the community and those elected to represent them are simply wrong i don't think we're saying it's wrong i think we're saying the proposal we're bringing for in front of you today has huge benefits for morley we've we've We've, we've discussed the, the jobs creation. We've discussed how we're going to provide those jobs for the people of Morley. We're going to try and create apprentices for the people of Morley. We are linking ourselves with Morley. We've been in discussion with the Morley Town Fund to see how we can link ourselves, White Rose and the Morley Town Fund to deliver those jobs and apprenticeships for Morley. Um, so th there are benefits of this scheme and we're not saying the residents are wrong we've listened to the residents and the objections we've made changes to the scheme to try and address those uh, address those uh, objections and we think the scheme we're putting in front of you today is a sustainable and has many benefits for the locals and and just to add further to that i think as paul mentioned we have worked to try and minimize minimize some of those impacts and I think as the scheme progresses and we bring forward reserve matters, that will, will always be cognizant of those concerns. A large proportion of the objections have been against the principle of development. This is an employment allocated site. So therefore, in our view, the, the, the development for employment has already been established. Thank you. Um, Councillor Walsh, please. Yeah, um, thanks, yeah. Um, I think most of my points have been covered, but I did know, I just want to confirm, did you say that the layout is more indicative at this stage of the building? So I think it is particularly in relation to building five, and it's, a, a casual observer would be, well, why is the largest building closest to the residential area? That that would be a, a point I think will probably come up for discussion, but but it is indicative, and I'm seeing it nods is. at the moment. So the, it's, an, it's an indicative master plan that we have to demonstrate um, with the application. So it, that's an, an example of how it could be, how 1,200, 100 and 2,000, yeah, could, the square metres we're proposing could be dealt. Could, Thank, could yeah, be. thanks. I'm good, Chair. Councillor Finnegan, please. Um, thanks, Chair. I several questions one is you were talking about this is the only location locally um where the there was a proposal for large sheds or where large sheds could accommodate this sort of type of logistic use first question is aren't you competing with the similarly large proposal at junction 26 of the m62 further down at chain bar which has its own controversy surrounding it at this particular point. So there's an issue about you're in a race, really. 28, Junction 26, to see if we can get the biggest sheds there as quickly as possible. So that's part and parcel of the issue. A question that is also tied up with that is, how do you know there are big sheds available in and around Morley? Because if you've looked at Asquith and other such things, there are certainly large sheds there that are unoccupied at this particular point. Uh, the third one is, in terms of the local employment initiatives, how much money have you set aside to support local employment initiatives? Uh, and the other question is, page 22, part of 22, you talk about the girth of trees, which is uh, certain level trees that will be 20 to 25 centimetres in girth, which is about my wrist. That's how big they're actually going to be. Now, your colleague, well, a bit before... <laughs> Uh, talks about 10,000. How many of those are going to have that girth of 20 to 25 centimetres, the size of my wrist at this particular point? And how do you feel that that would cover certainly building 05, which is a rather large 
building at this particular point. Uh, so how many of those trees are going to be of that 20 to 25 centimetre girth? And it's 20 to 25 centimetre girth, size of my wrist. Is that really good enough? Is that really the best that we can expect at this point? Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Robert. Thanks, Councillor Finnegan. Uh, in answer to the question, the, the, um, the trees you mentioned, 20 to 25, are semi-mature specimens, and they are trees proposed along the access road through the centre of the development. Um, so they were planted alongside the streets um, in the areas of structure planting, which are identified in the parameter plan, which covers the landscape proposals. Um, this is all um, will be planted uh, in a mixture of sizes from whips up to standard trees, which you can expect to be three, three and a half meters tall. Um, so because it's a huge area of, of planting, um, this, is, this is typical of how you plant these, these type of species. Um, there'll be um, native species, which will add um, significantly to local biodiversity. And we've also, in relation to Unit 5 or the indicative location of Unit 5, which is about shown about 90 metres away from Topcliffe Lane, there's also a bund there. So there'd be tree, some of the larger tree planting in the, in the structure planting, so that of three metres in height, will be on top of that bund. So um, it will affect, uh, create an effective barrier um, from day one, but admittedly, as with... Um, uh, which you typically expect of this scale of tree planting, it will take time to mature. So, so um, just to address some of the other questions. So talking about junction 26, we're, we're not in a race. We're not in a race. There is more than enough demand from occupiers to go around um, for, for these scale of developments within the market. It's also widely understood that that site has been locked out by an end user occupier, um, so isn't going to be available for other occupiers in any event. Turning to the local employment strategy, we have allocated a budget. Um, we've, it's a legal commitment that we're proposing via a 106. What I would say is that a large, large amount of things you can do for no cost at all. It's all about creating linkages and ensuring that the right people are speaking to the right people. I'll give you a couple of examples of that. I personally have ran Meet the Buyer events within local chambers where I've taken the main site contractor down and invited all the chamber members or even non-chamber members to come along and talk to the main contractor, understand the plans and work out how they can become involved. Another example is where I personally have, have spoken to a chamber and said, I'd like to employ a local contractor to carry out this piece of work. I've tendered it amongst three contractors, all of whom were based locally. Clearly there's no cost involved in any of that. That's just about doing the right things, having the right connections to do that. So we're fully committed to the local employment strategy and I've been in, involved in a number of these and seen, seen some very good success stories. The final point, I think, was about the, the large units being available. I guess it depends how you determine or, or you term a large unit. But looking at the, 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 the three larger units on that scheme, I don't believe that there are any units available of that size within Morley currently. Uh, Councillor Groom, please. Councillor Walshaw has actually asked my question, but I'd just like to take it one stage further and say, could you explain the rationale for your indicative layout of the five units? Because the largest one is the, is the nearest to residential. And secondly, how open would you be to carrying out a consultation with um, the local public in relation to that point? In terms of the consultation, um, it, it, we would have liked to have done a, an event, but unfortunately it was last year in 2020 when it wasn't, we weren't able to do so. Um, so we agreed with officers that we would do um, a website and hence that was the only um, available option for us at that point. Um, I think, you know, I'm speaking for the client, but I think, you know, we, we probably would be able to do something for reserve matters in, in a, a, an event if, that, if that's what uh, 
we would do if for the scale of the development we probably would need to um in terms of the indicative master plan what we did it's an illustrative based on a number of parameters so those are the parameter plans that we're asking for approval so that's the plots green infrastructure the access point and the drainage so as Keith said they, they, you know, it could change um, depending on who comes forward and, and what's sort of the final scheme. In terms of the actual design of it, it it's been led really by the, by the agents and, and their advice about um, the size of units and, and the orientation of, of units that uh, um, and the scope of the, the, what the end user would require. So the question about the, the additional consultation was in relation to the layout only, and could you do something in time to change that? Sorry, I, mis I misunderstood the question originally. I think I think what you're asking is, would we could we do a public consultation ahead of bringing the reserve matters applications yeah. forward? Okay, um, so I think I think if there's concern about Unit Five and the proximity to the residential. So we'll commit to doing a public consultation for that plot when it comes forward for reserve matters. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I see no more hands from members, so. I think we need to move on now. Can I uh, thank quite a list really, isn't there? Hannah, uh, Paul, Jonathan, um, and Andrew, who spoke in and answered questions. Thank you. Can I now invite members to ask questions of officers? And I see uh, some hands, yep. Uh, Councillor Finnegan first, please. Um, thank you, Chair. I've got a couple of questions for the planner and a couple of questions for the highways. Officer of May, please, Chair. Um, now, the last plans panel meeting, we had a discussion about how much CO2 these particular areas absorb. And just for the sake of clarity, 66.5 tonnes of CO2 are absorbed by this site each and every year. And we also had a discussion about... Uh, how much additional CO2 would the development of this site actually create? And that's 3,650 tonnes of CO2 per year. Now, taking all of that into account, it absorbs at this point, it's going to be emitting if this development goes ahead. At page 34, you talk about how this application is placing climate change at the forefront of the planning assessment. And you mentioned chapter 14, the MPPF. How does it do that? And how does it positively contribute to LCC's climate emergency uh, declaration? Uh, and the second question is, there's no real planning reasons why these can't be shifted about. And that's been discussed quite a lot by colleagues and residents. Why anybody would think putting 05 there closest to residential development was a good idea, I don't know. But in terms of straight planning grounds, this can be shifted around, can't it? And we could look at perhaps five going where two is, two going perhaps where four is, I'm using four and three, it would have less impact on residential. I just want to make sure that from a planning point of view, there's no reason why not. So the climate emergency issue and shifting the units about in terms of planning. Thank you, Chair. Okay, um, right, page 25, part of 39. Um, now on this one, it says the strategic, strategic highways network, i.e. national highways, will be seeking a construction traffic management plan that shall include, but is not limited to, no HGV delivery movements to and from the site via the SRN during peak hours. Uh, now, does that include the construction phase, in which case local roads are going to be bunged up with HGV shifting all sorts of stuff? That's the first question. Uh, and the second question is slightly more fundamental. Page 48. If I could take colleagues to page 48. Page 48. Uh, pa uh, paragraph 161, the A650 Bradford Road. Um, in the with development with mitigation scenario, the arm is expected to be significantly over the absolute capacity in the AM peak with extensive queuing. Um, page 162 
In with the development with mitigation scenario, the Army is expected, and this is the A653, to be significantly over the absolute capacity in the AM peak, but extensive queuing, uh, and the PM peak is the arm is above the practical capacity, but within the absolute capacity. And 163, the A650 Bradford Road eastbound, in with the development mitigation scenario, the AMIC is expected to be significantly over the absolute capacity in both the AM and PM peak periods with extensive queuing. So queuing, queuing, queuing. You then say in 164, this is an already congested location, but the fact that there is not going to be any problem resolving of this congestion is considered acceptable. Could you explain to certainly local residents why you feel it's acceptable for the present congestion and even with the adjustments, mitigations, the continuing uh, congestion is acceptable. Thank you, Councillor Finnegan. Mark, do you want to start? Thank you, Chair. So with regards to the climate emergency, um, it's been mentioned quite a few times here how the development is within an allocated site within the site allocation plan. And having that site allocation plan ultimately means that the local planning authority has an up-to-date plan and it has looked that it's been heavily scrutinized at the allocation stage looking at ensuring that there is sufficient employment sites across the city but that they're also in sustainable locations given the the highways network which surround this the close proximity to Morley itself the the, the 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 actual plot is considered to be very sustainable in terms of the development itself there is a, a lot of works um with regards to the landscaping of not only the strategic planting but also the the planting within the uh, areas which will be ultimately uh, coming forward for the reserve matters but members will recall from the site visit this morning the actual land is is mostly agricultural land and the actual improvements that are going to be made to the northern parcel of land is looking at significant tree planting as the developer has mentioned previously and and giving a variety of including the sustainable drainage solutions increases the biodiversity across the site now that's the biodiversity net gains are all in the ecological uh, supporting statements. But in, so in terms of that aspect of climate emergency, there is significant improvements that, that do align with the, 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 you know, the strategic site allocation plan, the sustainable plan, um, but it also looks at improving uh, the, the, the wider site. And then as the development comes forward in the reserve matters, the, the development uh, developer is committed to ensuring that those, those development plots individually meet the BRIAM standard, which, is, um, which relates to, our, to the local planning authorities' environmental policies. And so that will fully comply with the policies that we have to date. Furthermore, though, they are committed to, to trying to get to carbon uh, net zero. And, and so when the details come forward, uh, they will be pushing to do uh, what they can to, to, to go beyond those BRIAM standards where they can. So in terms of the climate emergency, this proposal is, is considered to comply with uh, the planning policies that we have in place, but also does align with the climate emergency declaration. I hope that answers that part of the question. The second one was about the indicative layout. Um, in terms of the layout, uh, the, the, the large plot, um, as, as the developer has said, there's parameter plans there uh, with indicative uh, maximum heights, but they're the, there is no detail at this stage as to the exact heights. Those are parameters that um, when the development comes forward, it will be looked at, you know, does the whole of that unit necessarily have to be the same height or can it be stepped? There might be various 
things that can be done at the reserve matters stage. I think what's also important to sort of maybe suggest is members will recall the site, the topography of the site, and the significant engineering works uh, proposed between the residential, the closest point between the residential properties and unit five, which is around about approximately, although it varies at different points uh, to the unit, it's around uh, 70 metres from those, the, can I I'll just use the pointer, from these, these, prop, these properties to the side of unit five. The, the bund in itself is, is going to increase around here with, with significant tree planting and acoustic fencing. And I appreciate the comment saying, well, actually, would it, would it be better, you know, sited elsewhere in the site? As the developer has pointed out, the, the indicative layout is to show that it, 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 it maximizes um, the, the floor space, which a, a site of this size warrants. But also the close proximity with these works, as members will recall, as you walk down here, it, to the human eye, it would actually, what you would see reduces, whereas setting buildings further back will give you a further view up. So I suppose the point here is these are reserve matters. The detail isn't there at this stage, but the indicative layout is considered by officers to work. Uh, and the, the, the details that have been provided regarding landscape and the engineering works are considered to, to, to be, uh, enable the site to be a good, good layout as it is, but that will can be um, subject to change as the re in reserve matters. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, so the first question about construction management um, not being within peak hours, clearly it's a, it's a request that's come directly from um, national highways. It's something I think we'd have to have that discussion about the wording of, of, of any sort of condition because it's difficult um, in relation to restricting construction growth on the general highway network. We can certainly cons uh, restrict it coming into the site and perhaps that might be the better option in terms of a peak hour restriction. Um, I think once it's off the site, it's, it's not necessarily lawful to be able to do that. Um, but it, it is construction traffic only. It's not, it's not traffic once the site is up and developed. Just in relation to the actual transport assessment that's been put in, I just want to make a few points. So the, the assessment um, came in with pre-COVID traffic flows on the network. Um, what we do know is that it, across Leeds, our um, morning peak is down at the moment by 27% on pre-pandemic levels, and our afternoon peak is down 19%. And, and they are significant you know, reductions in general traffic. The transport assessment, though, has based it on pre-COVID traffic levels and then growthed those traffic levels up to 2028, which is the prescribed methodology um, that's been used. And therefore, the outputs from um, the transport assessment relate to something that actually, you know, it is, a, it is a number of years away and we don't necessarily see that growth, don't expect to see that growth coming back onto the network in that way. Saying that then, um, the, the requirements through planning are not for nil de detriment um, in terms of capacity and congestion. They, they are around whether a development will cause a severe impact. And the, the figures as quoted in the um, report are about, so they, they're classed as PCUs, um, but effectively it's, it's lorries are say three PCUs, it's, it's, it's a length of, of unit on the carriageway that's a car length, so it's a passenger car unit. Um, so we're talking about an additional addition to a queue of up to, and I think it was 25 PCUs, which we've, we've assessed the um, impact of those queues in terms of the assessment that's been submitted. It would not gridlock in terms of that assessment and we've accepted that that is acceptable in this case. Thank you, Gillian. Um, can I invite Liz in now, Councillor Nash? 
Um, the uh, green belt land, uh, could you point out on a diagram the actual boundary of green belt, please? Certainly. Can I ask for, that's the side. So this is the public footpath that runs from west to east. And the parcel of land that's in the green belt is this section here. The site allocation plan is for the, the rest of this, this boundary here, there. Sorry, my unsteady hand. Does that answer your question? Kelsey Carlu, please. Thank you, Chair. A couple of points of clarity, I think, on what what we're here to decide today, because some of the indicative layout has got me a bit confused of exactly what is on the table. Obviously, we've heard that those layouts are indicative, um, and I think many people have said we've got concern around the size and how some of these units may appear on the ground, but we obviously can't see the design of those at the mo at the moment, um, and the layout may be indicative and may change. There's also a, a paragraph 170 in the report, some discussion around potential heights of those units, um, up to 20 metres at particular levels. I think my concern in, in case of this point is, until the reserve matters and the designs come through and we know the operations, I don't really feel comfortable making any judgment as to what height that building may be or um, how close it, it, it may be to a particular item. I just want first clarity on that, that if we move this forward in outline today, as is described in the report, that that isn't in any way tying our hands in the height of that unit and the layout that's, that, that's provided there. Because obviously when we see the design of that and we heard of techniques they may be using to mask that, I think that's the only time we'll see the full impact. And the second one on a similar one, we obviously don't have the kind of operations of these layouts um, and these units today. Therefore, that makes some of the work around the transport assessment difficult to do. Obviously, different operations might have different people coming in at different times, etc. Therefore, when you're thinking about the bus networks, if, if it is somebody that's going to be working at 4am, then we know they're going to be coming in the car because there's no, or, or walking or cycling at that time, but the likelihood is people are going to be coming some distance for that. Whereas if it's office times, nine to five, then there's more reliance on the bus network. We may be able to look at things like shuttle buses if people are coming in at all times. It, in terms of where we're where we're at in terms of the travel plan and some of that um the consultation with the combined authority it, is that left open in what we're discussing today for the reserve matters application when we'll know hopefully better the hours of operation and the kind of um uses we're going to be seeing thank you peter mark and maybe a comment from julian so it's certainly with with regards to the heights um the parameter plan gives uh, maximum in uh, indication of, of what the units could be but as previously said the reserve matters will be when we get the, the specific details of of the actual unit and it would be at that point that we would be coming back to members with the detailed designs saying what do you think of them and it might be at that point that you say actually that is too high we need part of it lowering or part of it is okay with that that maximum so it's in terms of answering that question there is there would be detailed and you know further scrutiny of of the proposal once that comes forward but ultimately the outline is looking at, at determining whether or not the employment uses and the, the amount is acceptable for this this parcel of land Thank you, Chair. So the travel plan is in its final format. Um, it doesn't, as, as it stands at the moment, it doesn't look at um, workplace minibuses or that sort of provision. It's something clearly if, if the workplace was of that nature and came forward, it's, it's a discussion that the team could have with that development, but it wouldn't be a, an obligation under the travel plan as it stands. I think Peter asked most of the question I was going to ask. 
uh, but I'll just add to it. Um, you give an answer to it about the about um, the indicative aspects of it, but let's put it this way: I can remember times when this panel has done outline planning applications, when the the final applications come to us for reserve matters, uh, and we have complained about the height of the the building. Uh, we've been told, well, you've already accepted that in outline, yeah. so uh, how can we be sure? that uh, we're going to be listening to them. In, in terms of, I suppose, for, for members to determine at this stage, those, it, in, with regards to the, the bonds and the engineering works that have been proposed, um, there has been significant uh, works that to mitigate where they can, the, the overall visual impact of, of the buildings, as the developer said before, and as it's been uh, put forward in the in the recommendation, there is going to be an impact on the landscape, but there is mitigation measures there, and officers feel that those are sufficient uh, to to minimise uh, significant impact on 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 visual amenity at this stage, in terms of the height, it, it, it will be down to the, the finer details and being brought for two members um, and, and looking at it that stage. But we do the officer's recommendation, as, as it says in, in, the, in, in the officer's report, does consider that these height parameters are acceptable for, for this site, given the extent of the, the works that fall under the full planning uh, permission. Uh, has, have been proposed so um, in essence like I say it, it is considered that these parameters are acceptable um, for, for a site of, of this this size thank you can I bring in council Grove, please thank you um, I found the site visit this morning very useful um, and it was uh, good to meet members of the public there and uh, I welcome your right to be there and to show such an interest in, in the uh, local planning issue. Um, I, rightly, we're not allowed to interact with uh, members of the public when we're on site visits so as not to uh, disturb the process, but I did overhear quite a lot of comments about um, maintaining the right to an existing view. For the sake of clarity, could you just outline where the right to maintain an, an existing view lays within the planning framework? Is it a material matter? Thank you. So in terms of a personal view, isn't a material planning consideration. That's why um, we have things like your national parks, your areas of outstanding natural beauty, which protect views that have been determined as being significant for for all what i would say is a personal view isn't a material consideration because one person's view might be a nice or to someone else it's very subjective um so yes a personal view isn't a, a, a material consideration thank you caroline colin please colin, council campbell i'm mindful of the time chair so i'll save it for comments my i'll ask the question but i'll probably be coming back to it in comments it's accurate to say isn't it that if we give outline consent today we are giving outline consent for uh, five units uh, which would be up to 102 uh, 890.2 square meters, uh, which would be industrial sheds that will be built up to standard heights. So there's a standard height if you're going up for one forklift truck or if you're going up to like a double lift forklift truck. Uh, and I would assume that these will be double heights, essentially units, but they're a standard, they're, a, they're an industrial standard. Um, that's accurate, isn't it? What? Yes. So the but in terms of the end users aren't known. So that large footprint of unit five may have a, a lower height than that, that parameter plan. 
I think that's important and just and the reserve matters will be when more knowledge is there about the end users and what their requirements are. Thank you. Uh, I think that concludes questions. Can we go on to comments? Uh, I've got Colin first, uh, Councillor Finnegan then. <clears throat> um, there, there are two things in relation to this proposal. Um, and I've listened to what everybody said and spent a very cold half an hour <laughs> this morning uh, walking around the entirety of the site. I think it's clear, isn't it? Uh, and the, the objectors admit this, that a substantial chunk of this site is a Schla site for employment. So the principle of employment on this site is not up for discussion, in my opinion. Um, <clears throat> we may not like it, but we are where we are. Um, I have some concerns, uh, and they've already been raised, in relation to the principle we've been asked to accept, which is an indic the indicative layout. And as I said, we've all been caught by this in the past, where yeah. in, uh, when it comes to the detail, we get told, well, you agreed that on the, the <clears throat> uh, at the outline. So I suppose if you just simply drew a red line around the employment site and said, this is, we, we, wish, we wish to do an employment site uh, and we wish to access it from this point, that wouldn't be such a controversial issue as we perhaps have at the moment because of what seems to be proposed. Now, it's been very, it made very clear, hasn't it, that actually the layout isn't fixed. There are no end users in sight on this one. If, there was, if Amazon had come along, we'll use Amazon because it's our best example. If they'd come along and said, yes, we want to take the big unit, then that will be different. So at the moment, it, it's, it's semi-speculative. And so under those circumstances, I don't think it's important that we agree a layout. Uh, in fact, it's like it's important that we make it clear that we don't agree a layout uh, <clears throat> at all, but rather we uh, wait until reserve matters to see what actually is the requirement on the site. My second point, which at the moment I have problems with, is the use of green belt. Um, now, we are always told, aren't we, that you should only allow development within green belt under very special circumstances. Now, I've read these, the report, and I cannot see what the special circumstances are in this case. Okay, it does mean that the drainage... Uh, and I, I'm not complaining about the ponds. The ponds are very nice. I'm sure they look lovely. But in effect, what we're saying is um, the, dra the on-site drainage has been exported into the green belt. So you're developing in the green belt what we're normally we would expect to develop on-site. Um, and I think personally that's wrong uh, because we're losing green belt. Because we're losing green belt because that will be the effectively the drainage ponds for the development and therefore will be under the control of the developer um, rather than open green space. So I, I, that's a problem I have with it. Um, I was struck when we were on site about how high up this site is and how visible it is from just about everywhere. Um, and I'm not convinced, uh, despite all the, the discussion, I am not convinced that the proposals that have been brought forward for uh, screening are sufficient to mitigate against that. Um, I know that there will be tree planting. I know that the developers talking about planting quite a lot of trees, and that's right. But that, I don't think, it, I cannot visualise how that site would not be very visible from the opposite side of effectively the, the valley the, uh, from, the, uh, from the central part of Morley. So at the moment, um, if you're asking me to agree what we've got in front of us, which is on number seven, page uh, slide seven, I think it is, I've got to say I can't do that. I'm quite happy for us to have uh, deferred and delegate and bring it back to panel with a discussion round where the red line is, what's within the red line, 
and where the highway improvements are, because I appreciate that we're talking about quite significant highways improvements over quite a wide area. Um, but I'm also conscious of the fact that we can't ask developers to mitigate existing highway problems. They only have to do um, effectively mitigate the added impact that they're likely to cause. Now, I, 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 I don't think it'll improve the junctions onto the motorway, but I'm not convinced it'll make it worse. And certainly some of the control crossings for pedestrians and cyclists is a plus in my opinion. So at the moment I can't support this, um, but I would suggest as a way forward, members may agree or disagree, that we might want to defer and talk about those points I've made at a future date. Right. Thank you, Colin. Councillor Finnegan, please. Um, I'm going to formally move that we do go for a deferral on this particular one. I think we need to have more ambition as it stands at this particular point. I share all the concerns that Colin's raised at this particular point, other than um, there is an issue about congestion, which is going to get worse, which our highways colleagues say is acceptable. So I think we need to go back and trace that. Uh, I think a deferral does seem to be uh, reasonable to look at relocating some of these units and unit five and unit two need to be pushed away from residential as much as possible. And we've all been caught out and outlined before where we think we've agreed something and they come back and say, well, you can't change that. The line side farm a month ago, we were told you can't change this, you can't change that, you can't change the highway structure. We don't want to be caught out with that again, but it needs to be, we need to re-examine the location of the units, which I think is a significant concern for local residents. Um, the tree planting scheme, we didn't get any details. We need real clarity on what's going to be planted where and how it's going to impact. We need real clarity on the green belt question at this particular point, because as Colin points out, there may not be very special reasons for developing as they are in the green belt. We need to revisit, and I don't think it is acceptable to say, yeah, it's going to be a little more congested after we do these, even with all of these mitigation measures, uh, but that's acceptable. I don't think it is. We need to go back and figure out what we can do better about that. Uh, I think colleagues over there were concerned about the employment agreement. and We didn't get any details about the employment, local employment agreement, how much cash has been put in and how it's actually going to function appropriately. Uh, I think there are so many questions that we haven't got the answers to that this is a premature presentation to plans panel this needs to be deferred for all of those questions to be answered in their absolute clarity so i formally move and hope that somebody might second can we have some clarity on the green belt please mr finnegan one second comment thank you chair yeah just just to clarify our conclusion on the the green belt issue is that the ponds that are presented as being mitigation for the flood risk aren't in themselves inappropriate development in the green belt and therefore very special circumstances don't apply because it's keeping the land open what it's essentially doing is the drainage for the site but the use in itself isn't inappropriate in the green belt and therefore very special circumstances don't apply is that helpful chair okay. thank you Julian. Thank you, Chair. I just wanted to clarify one point on the transport assessment work because, um, you know, we have done an awful lot of work on this. And yes, there is a there is some um, uh, issue, not not issue. There's some additional queuing at the end of the assessment. But what I didn't perhaps make clear is that is when we look at the cumulative impact of Capital Park, Chidswell, Hagemore, which is a lot, you know, it is a lot of assessment work that we don't always have when we look at these in isolation. So actually we've managed to mitigate the vast majority of three large developments, in, you know, in close proximity to this junction. So I just wanted to make that clear because I think, you know, the amount of work that's been done on that matter and the, the amount of, um, of, of um, transport assessment work and the, uh, sorry about that, the, um, <clears throat> The, you know the bus lanes and the cycle infrastructure and the walking infrastructure and i think it's just you know it is a really good um provision 
you for those clarifications. Yeah, it's I, been formally moved. I think the legal officer ought to advise that whether where we go here, if it's been formally moved and I can get a seconder, aren't we supposed to put the no, no, no. thing to the panel? We, no, I'm sorry. We 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 have to hear people. There are other people who want to speak, and when we get to that stage, we you may put forward any amendment you want, and if it's seconded, we will decide. But we're not going to silence people who want to speak at this stage. Sorry, Rob. Uh, moving on, then, I've got uh, Councillor Nash. Uh, well, Chair, uh, if I may just take up that uh, last comment about the green belt. Of course, it's open space, but I think what we want to retain is the open green space. And although ponds are very nice and I do approve of them, I agree with my colleague who said that really that mitigation should have been contained on site and therefore improving uh, the whole site. Uh, now, I was not here when the SAP was agreed that this be um, an, an industrial site. Uh, so I, I, I'm not taking responsibility for that. But what, what we have to do is make sure that uh, when we do get an application on an industrial site, it is the best that we can have and it is not overbearing and over-dominant. Well, this morning's site visit was very useful indeed because the largest unit is on top of a hill, not down in the valley, not, not out of sight. It is the most prominent. And I asked for the, uh, to, uh, the clarification on the boundary of the green belt because it is not right that we have a development which is so near the green belt, it is ob ob obtrusive. Um, uh, and I, I said at the time, I am not happy with this. Now, some of the sites which uh, on the uh, footpath, which uh, the central footpath, which runs right across the site, the land falls away. And uh, I can see no problem. Well, I can see a problem, but, but I, I would, accept development on, on that site uh, as long as it, it, it is not over dominant, which I don't think it could be because at one side it overlooks uh, another industrial site anyway. But as for the, um, on the uh, map that we have, it's um, uh, the, the warehouses uh, four and five. I think it, it's just ridiculous. It's on top of a hill. And I, I do not see how anyone can agree to that. Now, listening to what my colleagues have said about um, this is indicative. Well, I'm not going to approve an indicative because when it comes back uh, for full planning permission, oh, we've already agreed in principle. Well, we haven't. And, uh, and those are my comments. Now, um, I'm quite prepared at the, the end of the discussion to second the uh, resolution, but I, I do think other people should comment as well. Thank you, Liz. We'll continue with commentary. Councillor Blackburn, please. Uh, regarding councillor, uh, not councillor, Mr. Feeney's uh, um, comments. Lots, <laughs> he's, not, he's not quite a large yet. Uh, um, but uh, regarding Mr. Finney's comments, I don't re I don't agree with you, and uh, I think there's a number of us sat around his table don't agree with you, and uh, at least two of us have, have had the privilege of uh, uh, a, 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 a public inquiry arguing a case against the council on that very issue of the green belt, and we won. Uh, so as I said, I, I, I think we're we as, as likely to be right as, as officers are on that. <laughs> Um, so, so as I said, I, I don't agree with you on it at all. Uh, but the thing is, with this uh, application in front of us, I mean, the site might be in the SAP, but because something's in the SAP doesn't mean you accept anything that comes forward. Uh, it means you, you want a suitable development there, and this is not a suitable development. I, I've got to say the report is a bit vague about what we're what we're proposing um some of the stuff that's going into into the 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 uh, that, that should be in the outline uh 
uh, for us to actually make a decision isn't it's going to be done on reserve matters and as, as as other people have said we've had that problem before we've accepted what reserve uh, uh, accepted this you've got to reserve matters and then we've had it pushed in this phase you've already decided that and we're not i'm not prepared to see that so as i say i'm i'm, I'm quite willing to support uh councillor Fig finnegan's proposals thank you councillor Cole, please uh, thank, thank you, Chair. Um, there's no question we know that the that this has been allocated as uh, an employment site, and it's entirely right uh, that at some point this site will contribute to employment within Morley. Um, the first thing I would want to say is, is that I simply don't. Uh, agree with Mr. Feeney. I, I don't agree with officers' assessment that this development, the development in the green belt, is inappropriate. Is not inappropriate. Uh, and ultimately, I would ask uh, leave of Councillor Finnegan uh, that we slightly adopt uh, what he is proposing and explicitly say uh, that actually our view is that it is inappropriate development in the green belt and would therefore need the uh, very special circumstances to be brought forward uh now whether that ultimately gets voted through is a matter for, for colleagues but i would certainly that that is my view i believe that it is inappropriate development and i would want to see the very special circumstances i, I agree with not for the first time councillor nash quite frankly uh, ponds are lovely, <laughs> but it should be open green space. Um, colleagues will know that my background's actually in logistics. I used to run uh, until I sold it out six years ago now, a, a logistics business. This is going to be a 24 hour logistics operation. Uh, in fact, we were told quite explicitly uh, that it makes sense for uh, HGV drivers to try and avoid daytime driving, uh, because that's when there's often more congestion around. So by very definition, this site is going to be operated as a 24 hour site. Uh, and we had the benefit of local residents and local town councillor coming to express the real concern that uh, this was going to bring significant noise pollution, significant light pollution, uh, I, I, and I think that, I think that's entirely accurate. Uh, I think the suggestion that that this should be available as a twenty-four hour site is unacceptable. I, I don't think there's a problem with it being there for employment, but a site utilised in a noisy manner, twenty-four hours a day, I don't believe is an acceptable use so close to uh, residential uh, residential properties. Um, uh, finally, uh, and colleagues have also spoken to this, um, we have all, every one of us on this panel, fallen foul uh, of uh, letting something go through as an outline uh, that, we, that had all sorts uh, uh, attached to it. Uh, and then it comes to reserve matters. Or to, oh, no, no, that, that was included in the report. We can't move that. And you will recall, colleagues, that I expressly asked the question, are we approving five units that add up to a floor space of just shy of 103,000 square metres? And the answer was given yes. Now you can, it's a bit like those uh, games, those, I hate them, those, uh, you know, where you've got like a space and you've got to jiggle things. We can jiggle things around as much as we like, but there's five units that have to add up to just shy of 103,000 square. We can't fiddle that much with the heights because they're going to be the standard industrial unit heights. So I think we've got to be very cognizant of what we are, saying yay to were we to allow this to go forward uh, in outline so I, i'm quite content really as as, as councillor finnegan said to approve that outline notion of uh, without anything there uh, as, a, as an employment site 
Uh, but I would run it coming back very quickly with some far more robust detail. Uh, and certainly I will be very, very keen uh, to make it quite clear that the view of this panel is we protect Greenbelt uh, and we believe that that is inappropriate development as a panel. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Stan. On, on that last point, can I bring in our legal advisor, Nikki, on the Greenbelt? Thank you, Chair. And just in relation to the points made in relation to Greenbelt, it is Greenbelt. The starting position is to look at the framework and the legal test as to what is appropriate and inappropriate. We're guided specifically by the framework. It's not something that we can't disregard. And when we're guided by what is appropriate development within the Greenbelt, it permits this sort of engineering work. And the reason why it's permitted and considered appropriate is because the green space and the green belt is retained in its open nature. I totally take on board the points that uh, councillors have respectfully made in relation to the engineering works and whether they, that mitigation should be on site. But this, as a point of law and principle, is appropriate development in the green belt. That's not that cannot be disputed because it aligns itself with the framework test. And that's before you get to the position of it being inappropriate and exceptional circumstances being required. So I just need to clarify that just to guide members in their views, um, if that's OK, Chair. Thank you. Chair, can I just, as, as the one who set this one off, um, what we're talking about is a matter of interpretation, right? And I appreciate that uh, officers um, have one interpretation, but as the decision-making body, we, we may have a different interpretation. And my interpretation is because there will be significant engineering works within the Green Belt. Those of you who were on site will know that from the path, which is the Green Belt boundary, down to Cockwreck, it's the ground sloped away. So naturally, no pond would form on that land because it would run, the water would run straight down into Cockpit. So there has to be engineering works to create an area that will take these ponds. So it's not a, a natural extension. It, it is an artificial construction. Now, we can spend a lot of time arguing on it, but I don't actually think at the moment we, we're proposing to turn down the application which might produce an appeal what we're proposing is for further discussions about the, the application, about how you do it. And I will go back to the point that um, I think it's beholden on the, uh, the developer to come forward with the special circumstances that require them to use the green belt to provide these mitigation features. We're not saying, uh, uh, it, you know, it's a matter of interpretation. I appreciate what the officer is saying. My experience tells me it's something slightly different. Uh, members will do that, but that's not, I don't think, where this discussion is going, quite frankly. I don't want to prolong this uh, and on the green belt. We've had advice from the chief planning officer and our legal officer, and members, of course, have to take notes of that. But, you know, there's no point in just coming in and disagreeing with each other. We don't get anywhere. Moving on then to people who are uh, down to speak. Uh, Councillor Latty is next. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'll, I'll just start by saying I, I am completely in accord with my colleagues along here um, with what has been said previously. But uh, the comment, a very, very short comment uh, here. I think that an awful lot of the problems that we've uh, faced in the last couple of hours would have been avoided if we'd had some CCGI, C, CGIs. Uh, CGI. Yeah. Um, you know, we've had to use our imagination. We know that they will be a given size, but being able to visualize what the residents of Morley are going to have to look at if this goes ahead is, is a huge impediment when you try to make a decision on whether you think it's a good idea or not. Um, and so I, I do think that you've uh, scored an own goal there that really and truly some pretty pictures might have changed of quite a few things. Thank you, Graeme. Um, can I bring in Councillor Walshaw, please? Um, 
Uh, thanks, Chair. I think there's actually um, quite a lot of accord amongst members about this. I think we're pretty much all in the same place. Um, I'd be um, happy to um, support the, the Finnegan Nash Amendment, as we should perhaps call it. Anyway, the proposal that 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 that, that would be that would be fine with me. But I would actually. So I, won't, I don't want to go over the points that colleagues have made very ably. I just want to point out actually something to support what Councillor Lathis just said. I think it would have been really useful if the cross sections had have properly shown the relationship between what's proposed in the indicative layouts and the residential areas. I think that just would have been helpful. I think we've got we've got some disagreement amongst uh, reg regarding what's appropriate use in the green belt and, and what isn't. What I would say though is this site is quite a large site and it's effectively a blank canvas. Effectively. We've accepted it's an employment site. I've no problem with that. It's been through a lot of democratic processes to be designated such. But it is a blank canvas and the developers can do what they want with it. So I do think it is beholden on them to come up with proposals that don't impact on the green belt and then we can take a view on that colleagues i think that's seen a lot of nods around the room so i'll just leave it at that chair thank you neil caroline please thank you well just to add my voice to the debate uh with no particularly new points yes this the principle of this development is for employment and therefore there's no argument about that it will happen so we will need to accept some application and move forward on the green belt issue, I actually thought this before I listened to the legal advice. Um, I understand what you're saying about interpretation of the law um, and whether this is right or wrongful development of the green belt. But for whatever reason, uh, I think what is preferable, never mind what's lawful, but what is preferable for this site on this occasion is what we should be seeking. And I think that should be managed on the site of the development. That is what I would want to happen rather than take more space up. And that wouldn't need any legal um, defining. That, that would be, we would rather have this here than here. And I, I suggest that we ask people to go away and think about how that can be recited within the development, irrespective of the legal position. Um, I agree with Councillor Campbell's analysis and proposal, but what I would say is we often find ourselves deferring things for further discussion about things we feel uncomfortable about, don't like very much, um, and, and feel we don't want to make a snap decision on. Um, but there's only sense in deferring it if, we, if there is a genuine capacity to move forward. And in my role as a chair of a different panel, I've sometimes taken the view of doing that with panel's approval, and then it's come back pretty much the same. So we are looking for something different to come back, would be my suggestion. Thank you, Caroline. And finally, Councillor Paul, please. Paul Wadsworth. I did, I did indicate to you, Chair, earlier, but you missed me. I wasn't sure whether you'd got colleagues either. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, a lot, has been, a lot has been said, and I'm not going to go over the, the previous points, but I agree with, with, with most of them. The, the big problem is we've got an indicative layout here, but we're probably going to get, if we approve it today, that layout, because it looks like on plan is it's the layout that the developer wants the big problem both regarding the layout the traffic and the jobs is that we don't have an end user the developer can't tell us who the end user is so he can't tell us whether how many jobs are going to be how skilled those jobs are going to be or how people are going to access them that's our big problem the one thing that i would think is is this development coming forward for employment use in morley too soon when there is capacity very clearly on howley park asquith avenue and bruntcliffe the reason that I say that is that all of those three sites, any traffic from those sites would be displaced between Junction 28 and Junction 27 on the M62. So there would be a different impact on the traffic patterns. And that's why I raise that as a new point. The car parking spaces, a thousand plus, we have to accept that because it will be 24 hour operation, they will probably be used more than once a day possibly up to three times a day. So you've got to say, would it be two and a half thousand car parking spaces in reality with the traffic use? I appreciate some of that would be out of the peak. The footpath improvements, having walked that footpath, I didn't go out on site this morning, but Councillor Vati said it was quite dry, so I'll take his word for it. They are going to be very well welcomed because when I walked that footpath, it was very, very wet. Um, and I think as what has been said about Junction 28 and the problems, the pre-COVID surveys, that junction was pretty much gridlocked pre-COVID and is slightly better now. But I think some of the problems with this development are not actually at 28 itself, but are the traffic lights at Capitol Park immediately off it. And they're so close, they're linked, but they are actually really separate issues. Um, so with that, I'll leave it, Chair. But I do support colleagues uh, deferring. Thank you, Paul. Uh, with the stage now where we can ask... Uh, 
Councillor Finnegan uh, to move the amendment, which was seconded by Councillor Nash. Uh, in doing so, Councillor Finnegan, could you indicate what issues you want examining before it comes back for your deferral? Uh, I'll do my best. Thank you very much, Chair. I think there's a big issue about repositioning of the units. I think everybody agrees that the, the, the units, as they set out at this particular point uh, in this outline, are unacceptable and the developers need to go back and have another look at that. I think there are issues about the green belt and uh, members seem to have a, a different view to the chief planning officer and the legal officer at that point. So I think the green belt issues need to be explored. And I think there is a genuine desire from this plans panel to see uh, the mitigation provided on site without using or abusing the green belt. Um, there is an issue about hours of operation that we need to visit. I think we want greater clarity on the local employment agreement. Uh, I think well, several of us raised that up. I think greater clarity on the tree planting and green improvements. Um, and there was some suggestion of you can walk to Morley within 15 minutes. I think we need greater clarity on the connectivity with Morley uh, and its town centre as well. I think that's covered most of the issues that I've raised, but on that basis, I formally move a deferral for those issues to be brought back to us for full consideration. Thank you, Councillor Finnegan. That's very clear, and you're the seconder. Okay. All those in favour of that amendment, please show. I don't think we need to count. I think that's unanimous. That's what we will do. Do you want to sum up, Belgian, where we are? Thank you, Chair. Uh, the application has been deferred uh, and the matters for officers to consider further with the applicant is the, the layout and uh, of the units, uh, particularly members are seeking repositioning of the units to address the concerns they raised in terms of relationship to residential areas. Uh, the uh, impact on the green belt, a particular issue seems to be that the drainage mitigation is within the green belt. Members have indicated they'd like to see that on on the uh, uh, the, the development site uh, uh, outside the green belt. Uh, members are seeking greater clarity on the local employment agreement, um, greater clarity on the tree planting uh, and landscaping measures, and greater clarity on the connectivity proposals to Morley Town Centre. Thank you, Chair. It's been a long day and we've got three more applications. Very oh, quickly, please. I didn't pick out, I, I know Councillor Finnegan mentioned hours of use, but I didn't hear Dalgit say that, but that could have been my hearing. Okay, yeah. My, my, yeah, you did, it did say that, yes. No, my apologies. I'll say. Sorry. So, my apologies. Uh, we'll add that as well. Okay. Okay. I, I think uh, on the conclusion of that very long one, uh, I think we need a, a comfort break and I believe tea is available in members. So, uh, but shall we say 10 minutes because we have a very big agenda in front of us.
Okay. Okay. Can we, can you open your agenda? If you have one on page 61, agenda item nine. Andrew, can you introduce this for us, please? Thank you. Thank you, Chair. It's uh, distracting on the laptop as well. Yeah, so can works. I, it does it work? Can I move the slides? No. Uh, I don't know about the slides. Oh, okay. Okay. So just say next slide. Next slide, please. <laughs> Yes, thank you, Chair. This is the um, outline planning application for the middle quadrant of the East Leeds extension. Uh, so this is a, an application for circa 875 dwellings. Um, as I say, it's an outline with all matters reserved except for access. So if we can have the next slide, please. Thank you. Yeah, so if I start at the, the beginning, as it were, so in terms of the, the plan that you have on the screen is a, um, a section of the UDP plan. So effectively, the orange areas on there around the eastern side of the city, spanning from Red Hall in the north all the way around down to the area of Pink at Thorpe Park in the south, that area of orange is, is all part of the East Leeds extension housing allocation. There's a part of it that's that's Grimes Dyke, which strictly speaking isn't East Leeds extension, but it, it all forms part of that wider housing to the east of the city. Um, to the eastern edge of that, hopefully for people's eyesight it's better than mine, you can see a red dashed line, uh, which is the route of the East Leeds orbital route. Yeah, I'm not sure that. Yeah, sorry. I'm not sure if that makes it any clearer, but there's a there's a red dashed line on the on the outside edge of the of the allocation. Uh, so this morning we went in off the uh, Leeds Road roundabout northwards to around there. To the east of the the allocation is is the green belt. You can see the green belt separates the housing allocation from Skulls, and that's the strategic gap that's been referred to in the report and elsewhere when we've discussed the. East Leeds extension proposals. Go to the next slide, please. This is perhaps a bit clearer to see. Um, and this effectively just shows you the, the various quadrants. So as set, as set out in the report, I'll just do a quick um, rundown as to where matters are. So at Red Hall in the far north, this is the former um, council site uh, where, the, where the council depot was an area of land abutting the A58 Weatherby Road. So there's a current planning application in there for around 360 houses. That's a full planning application. To the east of that is the northern quadrant, uh, which is down between Weatherby Road and York Road on that arc of development. And that's for 2,000 houses in outline, together with a two-form entry primary school and uh, a local centre comprising retail, community and health facilities. There's a smaller um, piece of development that's referred to in the report, which was a small uh, Strata Homes scheme, which was on the site of the former Bramley Gardens home. So that's 51 dwellings which have already been constructed now. Moving south then is the middle quadrant, which is the planning application that members have before them today. And that spans between York Road and uh, Barrack Road, Leeds Road, heading out towards Skulls. The to, to, the, to the south of that is then the southern quadrant, which is the airfield between Barrack Road and uh, Manston Lane. And that's where the roundabout members will know is the, the Manston Lane link road, which has been constructed and then takes you south down towards junction 46 of the M1 motorway. So it's important to know actually for the purposes of the middle quadrant application, many of the, the plans that you'll see today actually incorporate both the middle and the southern quadrant. So the developer team has worked up 
really a, an overall master plan for both of these quadrants. So they, they do benefit each other in terms of green space, connectivity, um, primary education contribution, um, in, so in terms of prime provision on site and local um, neighbourhood facilities. So next plan, please. So I've included this aerial photograph. I've got some perhaps better shots in a moment. Clearly, this doesn't show the route of, of Elo on here. This is a, an aerial plan taken from Google, but effectively shows you the existing pattern of development to the west in Swarcliffe. So this is the A64 York Road coming down to the existing ring road. And then you follow the, follow the ring road, try not to get down there. And then you've got uh, Barrack Road, Leeds Road heading out in that direction. Um, points of well, I'll come to points of note perhaps in the in a, in a slightly better plan. To the east of the the main urban built up area is then um, areas of agricultural land, uh, mainly arable fields, and there to the east of Cock Beck, which you can see is quite well treed in quite a narrow but well treed valley down the western side of the application site, and then beyond that is wider agricultural land on the eastern side of Elaw which abuts skulls and, and out to the wider open countryside. Go to the next slide, please. So I've included these slides um, really just to give some perspective, um, but with showing e-law so that you can see a, a bit in context and perhaps as a bit as we saw this morning from the minibus. So if we can go to the next slide, please. So this is the, the Barrack uh, Leeds Road um, Elor Junction. So we came in this morning from the west here and then entered the site northwards. So you can see this area is all part of the application site, this field on the left hand side heading up into the distance. At that point the Elor route is, is in quite a bit of cut. Uh, the land raises quite a bit to the to the east there and then Skulls is off further east and if you got went up Leeds Road eastwards takes you to Skulls. Next slide, please. So again, heading further north. Um, you'll have noted from the report there's comments made around the former disused railway line, and that come that crosses Leeds Road in the vicinity of Smeaton Approach. And this is where it, it crossed, or Elor has crossed it rather. So it does drop down at that point, and equally the other side of Elor, but it does it does level out in any event in the wider countryside to the east. Um, I'll come back to that in later on as well. Uh, and then further into the distance is the Wood Lane Bridge, which has been installed. And that's where we stood um, this morning on the site visit, looking to the, the housing area to the south and the, and the north. Next slide, please. Again, this is just the Wood Lane footbridge in a bit more detail, going over Elor, and again, looking northwards towards um, the York Road Elor Junction. So the development site, let's say, runs down that western side of Elor and almost up to York Road, although it does have a connection at the northwest corner. Next slide, please. And then this is again just the far north end of the site with the York Road Elor Junction in the distance. So as you can see, largely arable fields, but with some elements of vegetation around the edges. Next slide, please. Oh, sorry, another York Road <laughs> junction. Next slide, please. So these, this is really um, a, a 3D image, which hopefully sets out what we saw this morning on the minibus when we drove up Stanks Drive, um, looking at some of these links. And I explained when we were on the minibus, the nature of the existing urban area. Is, is very much these Radburn layouts of houses where you have properties, if I use here as an example, properties with um, garages and, and yards and so on, on one side with parking areas, and then paths and front facing areas onto green space on, on the other side. So this is also true on the eastern side of, well, sorry, the, the right hand side of the drawing here, which is actually to the south. So it's a north is off to your left, south is to your right. So there's a, there's a public rights of way which run north-south. Um, these rights of way around this playing field are, are unlit, but from here southwards, they are all lit 
and connect through these layouts and connect up to Stank's drive. Um, on this particular photograph, you can see Stank's drive, which is a, a bus route. And also we have Grimes Dyke Primary School at the northern end. And the application site is obviously beyond the, the trees in the, in the upper part of the photograph. Next slide, please. So I mentioned in the report and this morning the, the Swarcliffe Health Trail and there's various pieces of gym equipment and these are quite a common um, site around the city now. Um, so this is roughly where we turned around in the minibus this morning. So this is the top end of where one of those paths joins in. Uh, next slide, please. So that's the same uh, trail as another connection through. That's actually where we turned around this morning. Um, and that path runs southwards. One thing just to point out, just off in the, the southwest corner, there is a bridge in that location. Um, it's not currently connected to a path, but one of the things that we'll be looking to do through the um, through the uh, footpath and cycleway connections obligations would be to get a path connection, a lit path connection over the bridge between the development and, and the existing area of Swarcliffe. Uh, there are also a number of other connections through uh, between some of these houses here, which becomes relevant in, in the next slide. So if we can move on to that one, please. So the number of connections roughly here, here, and, uh, and also a vehicle and pedestrian connection there. Um, there is a connection, an informal connection in this location. Um, it's not actually possible to get um, a legal connection through because the, the adopted highway doesn't extend right the way up to the boundary. Um, but nonetheless, somebody has removed a fence, so people are currently going through that fence, but that's not a, a formal connection. Um, nonetheless, the point of this slide is really to show the parade of shops that we saw this morning, which included the co-op supermarket, and also a number of other uh, local hairdressers and charity shops and so on, the sort of shops that you'd expect to find in a local centre. And just to the south of the slide, um, just to the south of where the co-op is, is the newly developed um, windmill health centre, which has only recently opened. And obviously, again, obviously the application site is off to the north. Next slide, please. So to the, so this is looking at really at the southern end of the application site towards an area of woodland that falls within the council's ownership. Um, as, as I say, there's a bridge again over Cockbeck roughly in this location. And, and that path northwards is, is lit all the way up to those connections to the shops and up to uh, the vicinity of Crimes Dyke Primary School. To the south, it's actually unlit. Um, but yet again, you have a large area of woodland on this side. So I'll explain a bit more about that in, in a moment. Um, next slide, please. And this is the southern end of that connection, which is, you know, it's a, it's a well used tarmac path which provides a connection down to Barrack Road. Uh, this section actually is lit and does provide a connection again through to Stanks Drive and the bus routes in, in that part of Swarcliffe. Um, and then on down here we have Barrack Road, uh, Smeaton Approach in the southeast corner. Uh, and the southern quadrant would start off on to the east of, of Smeaton Approach. And, on, and up here, this is the bottom end of the development area of the middle quadrant. Uh, and this is probably also worth pointing out, this is the bottom end of that disused railway line referred to in the report. And you'll be familiar with the, um, the, the old abutment, which is adjacent to uh, Barrack Road with um, yeah, a sort of a stone finish to it. Next slide, please. There you go, there's the, there's the same, uh, same a former bridge abutment. Um, I think in some representations has asked whether it would be possible to reopen that, but clearly it's it's quite low and there's a change in levels and obviously nothing on the other side of the road. So that's not proposed. What we'll come on to in the presentation is there are proposed to be informal links so that, which do make use of this former railway line and connect it into wider development to the east. On the right hand side of uh, the Barrack Road, again, is where the southern quadrant would be going. Obviously, there's a lot of VLO activity in this photograph, but that's where roughly the local centre and the primary school would be on the right-hand side. 
Next slide, please. Yeah, this is looking just a bit further up. Um, Barrick Road, heading into the Elaw Road Works. So to the left-hand side, uh, where, roughly where that clearing is, would be the southern access into the middle quadrant site. So the southern, southern access is from that point off of the Barrick Road. The northern access is off of the um, York Road, Elaw Junction. Um, and similarly, the southern quadrant has an access on the south side, but in a different uh, location. Next slide, please. So this just builds really on what I've said already. And again, the point I made earlier is that the, the consult, consultant team have looked very much at the middle and southern quadrants as a, as a whole um, in many respects. So this, this plan really was to look at um, existing local services. I won't go through all of them, but the main points to pick out are Grimes Dyke Primary School, where that blue spot is, the, um, the co-op local centre there. Um, I think probably the health centre came on since this plan was drawn up, but the health centre is obviously adjacent to it. Um, we've got the um, John Smeaton um, High School and also the uh, leisure centre in this location as well, in fairly close proximity. Um, wider context to um, Crossgate's train station. So there are uh, public transport connections which take you to Crossgate's as well, albeit that's further away than the, the immediate shops and local services. Next slide, please. Okay, so this looks in a bit more detail um, at, at how the site will be developed, uh, looking at some of those connections through and those initial development parcels. So you start to see then uh, the development of the spine road through the site, through that middle quadrant, and then similarly through the southern quadrant and how that would work. The pink is the local centre and primary school development. And it, sh it shows really how those areas of green space start to come through the various parcels of development. The areas of flood risk shown in the, the heavy blue shading. Um, and none of the development areas in, in, impinge into those flood risk areas. Um, next slide, please. Uh, this slide is really just to show um, connections, existing connections through and some of the proposed upgrades and new paths through the development. So this is taking off the development layer really um, and showing where new connections would occur. Um, obviously also tying into um, the ELAW pedestrian and cycle connections, which are currently under construction. So there's actually potentially quite a good network of um, footpaths and cycleways, north, south, as well as east, west, into Swarcliffe and out to Skulls. Next slide, please. So this slide is really focusing more on um, green space uh, typologies, but in particular, I wanted to point out the play areas so there's an equipped play area in, in this location, that middle location, and then a southern location. Um, and again, green space separated out in various parts of the site. If we go to the next slide, please. Similarly, in the southern quadrant. I think there's one, one there at the top end of the southern quadrant, one in the middle and one in the south. Uh, next slide, please. In terms of um, playing pitch provision, and this was a point of discussion at the consultative forum, question around whether there was any specific provision. Um, the local centre and primary school in the southern quadrant would sit on land, which although allocated for housing is currently playing pitch. So in order to satisfy Sport England's requirements would need to be relocated. So regeneration colleagues and parts of countryside colleagues are looking to um, submit an application to re-provide those facilities at Winmore Grange and on, on site here the primary school would deliver um, pitch facilities in its own right so when that application is developed and that southern quadrant application is currently live and with us when that comes to panel we'll be looking to secure community use agreements um, to secure public access to those facilities and additionally as I say there's the, the leisure centre as well which has its own facilities. Next slide, please. In terms of um, public transport penetration, I've mentioned earlier the bus routes around um, Stanks Drive 
Um, <coughs> there's also bus routes along the York Road to the north and uh, Leeds Road at the, so at the south. But nevertheless, because of the nature of the long linear um, housing allocation, you do need to do more on that in order to um, get an acceptable bus accessibility. So this, this is a series of drawings which have been developed to show how the site would develop from the north and the south and where um, public transport penetration would come in. Part of the background to this is we've had quite a number of conversations with WICA around new uh, and or extended bus services and also members might be aware of the Flexibus scheme which is currently operating in um, East Leeds um, or demand responsive travel as it's sort of known in technical um, language. So WICA are very keen to promote the use of the Flexibus scheme in the East Leeds extension as a means of, of developing public transport. So although the spine road through the development would, provide, would be designed to provide um, a bus route and provide bus stops along it, we're also looking at in the early stages of development before that spine road is fully complete, that the DRT would provide essentially an early doors um, uh, public transport option. So if we can get, move to the next slide, please. So as, as soon as you start getting a bit of development in there in the green, the yellow coming in, is then the, the DRT minibus coming into the site. Uh, one of the things that WICA are keen to do is ensure that these buses have turning areas. So that's something that we're in discussion with the developers on, but we're keen to ensure that they have loops or somewhere to turn around and, and go back out again. Next slide, please. So similarly, this is, this is development taking place from the south, which would use existing bus services to start with. And then next slide, please. And then you start to get in, as you do more development, you then start to build in a loop for the DRT service. Next slide, please. And then that starts to become more developed and creates another loop. <coughs> Next slide, please. And then you start to get further development through, through the site. Next slide, please. Okay, so that takes us to the master plan. So in, just in, in sort of finishing off the bus penetration point, WICA are, are happy with those proposals in terms of the DRT usage um, and also ultimately the spine road and the bus contribution. So we're currently in discussions with them in obviously drafting the, the 106 agreement. In terms of the, the master plan, building all those things together, again, the developers have looked at both the middle and southern quadrants. If we perhaps move to the next slide, which should be just the middle quadrant. Hopefully they can make up some of the detail. Um, whilst it is in outline with all matters reserved except for access, which as I say is access from York Road in the north and off of uh, Barrack Road in the south, the developer is looking to fix the parcels of development. So the overall structural green space where the green spaces go and the the drainage infrastructure and that's so that as these development parcels come forward they can come forward um, and each one essentially washes their own face they're able to deliver the full requirement full requirement of green space and drainage infrastructure for that parcel of development they're not reliant on another development taking place in order to provide those facilities so that's the way that the the development has been structured um, within these green spaces, there are attenuation areas uh, which are intended to have some areas of open water. Clearly, there will be drainage conditions as well, which will seek to um, yeah, work up the detail of that at the reserve matters stages. Ultimately, uh, drainage will run off to Cockbeck, but we're restricted at greenfield rates of runoff. So it'll be more controlled than it is um, currently. In terms of the, the layout, but everything else you see therefore is then indicative in terms of the layout of the of the streets. But you do see there the spine road, the nature of the spine road going all the way through the development. And you can see that the developers is intended to deliver perimeter blocks with houses facing out towards um, green spaces. And particularly some of these green spaces along Cockback, that's quite important, I think, and is actually an improvement um, relative to the relationships on the other side. So in, in the existing area of Swarcliffe, 
have got some outlook from some of these properties, uh, but certainly towards the south, it's largely backs of properties backing onto public footpath. So actually having this some, some public frontage is, is quite positive. What you probably, I suspect, can't see in this diagram. Sorry, can you just go back to the master plan? Thank you. Um, are, the, are the various connections through? So I mentioned this morning the bridge over Cockbeck, which is roughly in that location, and, and us requiring a path to, to connect that area up. Also some improvements to the to the bridge over Cockbeck in this location. And these are so pretty uh, well managed rights of way otherwise. What you also can't see on here is the um, the wood lane over bridge, which we, we stood on this morning, which runs over the site in that location. And that's wood lane going off to Skulls. And then here, the former disused railway line, where we're looking to get um, uh, pedestrian routes over the over the railway line and connecting down to the spine road and ultimately via the wood lane bridge that you can connect the other side so there are means to integrate that into the wider um, wider area next slide please so again whilst this isn't for consideration today this is really just to give an indication of um, densities so the proposal is to have the, the lower density areas adjacent to the woodlands and open spaces along Cockbeck, moving up to the higher density green areas, which effectively follow the spine road, as you'd expect. And then either side of that are the areas of, of medium density. So that's felt to be a fairly logical pattern of development, but ultimately that's not for, for approval today. Next slide, please. And again, sort of allied to that is, is a, a slide around building heights. Again, with the blue being the higher buildings, sorry, the, the, the pink being the highest buildings around key uh, key nodes. Um, and then sort of two to three, so that's two to four stories, then two to three stories in the blue along the spine road. And then the remainder being in the orange, uh, predominantly two stories. Next slide, please. So I've just included these um, drawings because these are the sort of parts of the formal uh, parts for approval, which is the access in from the north from the Elaw Junction. Yes, yeah, sorry, I'm getting a bit hoarse as well. <laughs> so this is the this is the the Elaw York Road Junction. So this is just the the detailed access from the north. Next slide, please. <laughs> And this is the the southern access. So these are the, these are what would be formally approved in the application if it were approved. Next slide, please. And we have the, also have the spine road detail again running from York Road through the site. That does now also show um, a segregated cycleway, which was one of the points of discussion during the application for it to be segregated and not shared. Next slide, please. And again, that shows that connecting through to the south. And along that route, we also have um, the bus stop locations plotted on there as well. Next slide, please. And then some visuals that the that developer has prepared. Clearly at this stage, uh, as part of an outline application, we don't have any details of houses, but they have provided some, well, they have provided some visuals which essentially are designed to show houses overlooking streets and green spaces effectively. And next slide, please. A very similar approach again to houses overlooking green spaces. So that's the main part of the presentation. Um, if I come on to then the section 106 obligations, because there's a number of these. So most significantly, obviously, e-law um, is, is a significant component of that. And um, the, the basic premise is that each of the East Leeds extension quadrants pays for its section of, of e-law. So for the middle quadrant, that's a contribution of £19.7 million, which will be payable through a roof tax to be paid on completions at six monthly intervals. Um, affordable housing, 
Um, the proposal is to be uh, fully policy compliant at 15% provision on site uh, with 60% social rent and 40% intermediate. There's a primary education contribution from the development, which is in accordance with the council's um, formula for calculating uh, those contributions. So it's £12,320 per dwelling with two or more bedrooms, excluding flats with less than three bedrooms. To, to round that up for you, that for, for this um, development on the basis of their indicative mix, that would come to a contribution of 2.3, uh, just over £2.3 million pounds from the middle quadrant. Uh, for information, the southern quadrant would, would similarly provide a, um, a contribution of roughly 2.4 million pounds. There's then also a barrack road cycle improvement contribution of 256,000 pounds, sorry, 256 and 300 pounds. Uh, signal improvements at Eastwood Lane Barrack Road and the Church Lane Junction for 100,000 um, pounds. Offsite mitigation works at the Dumbbells and main roundabout of Junction 46 of the M1 if these are not secured by condition. Now, I've referred in the report to ongoing discussions between highway colleagues and national highways. Uh, and the context is that uh, some improvements had been agreed with national highways, but council officers remained concerned about the impact on the council's own highway network in the vicinity of Junction 46. So there's some further work has been undertaken. Um, we can't report the outcome of that work today, um, but there is a solution that's being worked on, which involves creating a two lane on slip at junction 46 of the M1. So that is being worked through at this point in time. So we've listed that here merely as, a, as, as an indicator as whether, whether that goes in the 106 agreement or, or maybe a condition. Um, the bus service improvement contribution I've mentioned, uh, which is three quarters of a million pounds uh, bus stopping contribution contribution of seventy thousand five hundred pounds. Uh, a residential travel plan fund of five hundred eleven pounds fifty per dwelling, which again to round that up for you, is is just short of half a million pounds. A travel plan monitoring fee of eight thousand pounds. The footwear and cycleway provisions, which I referred to in the presentation, in terms of uh, those improvements that we'd like to secure. Uh, on-site green spaces commensurate with dwellings in each phase of development um, and, and, and also including play facilities. Uh, provisions for the spine road uh, and the need to enter into a highway agreement to construct and dedicate that road with provisions for phasing. A commitment to the local centre implementation plan and also employment and training initiatives uh, during the construction phase of development. It's also worth pointing out um, in the report obviously as an outline application we don't know what this sum would be but the community infrastructure their v-sum is estimated to be something in the region of 2.4 million pounds as, as well since the um, publication of the report there also has been some um, correspondence um, so i'll start with uh, an, an email from councillor pauline graham uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll read it out briefly. It says, I write on behalf of Crossgates and Winmore councillors regarding this application before City Plans Panel. There is a lot of which I agree in the report before you. As chair of the Community Consultative Forum, I have ensured we as residents, so we and residents have had some involvement in the process hitherto. However, the pandemic has severely curtailed the usual range of contacts. It is therefore imperative that public consultation is ramped up as we move to the business end of the application. I would wish to have this specifically referred to in the commentary and action points of the meeting. Secondly, I and residents have real concerns regarding the provision of health and wellbeing facilities. The officer makes a simple and minor reference to a local centre encompassing such provision. However, this is very imprecise at this stage and there is a lack of definition. Can I remind panel that there are four adjacent applications all supposed to contribute to such facilities via section 106 and SIL. The four applications will realise some 13,000 new residents, all entitled to modern and first-class access to health facilities. In that sense, the application is not self-standing. I would therefore ask that you do not defer and delegate this decision, but retain the right to have further details 
as they are negotiated to come back to panel for final approval. That way, ward members can continue to be involved and you can reflect res residents' views. So just to follow up on, on, those, on those points, I referred in the presentation to the local centre and the provision of, of health facilities. And I've mentioned in the report um, an Eastleys Extension Health subgroup, which has been formed. So that's a combination of officers from regeneration, public health, but also working with um, local GPs um, and pra practitioners and, and NHS representatives. There's also ward members in that group as well. And one of the things that we've tried to do is, is crystallise what the health ask is in terms of the amount of space, type of space that's required. Um, and that has been followed up. We still don't have clear answers to that. I think it's the honest outcome. Um, but the council has commissioned NPS to draw up a feasibility proposal of how the local centre would work and uh, to try and take that forward. Now, the local centre is on um, the council's own land. So actually, we have much more influence than we would have on any other site. So we're very much pushing to get the best scheme, best, best local centre scheme that we can possibly get out of the development to provide those facilities. So there very much is a, a sort of a desire and a drive to to achieve that. Um, on the consultation point, um, the consultative forum, which Councillor Graham chairs, continues to meet regularly. And I think you know, she would agree that we're, we're looking to uh, ramp up those meetings. We have been obviously holding them via Zoom until recently. Um, but as, as matters start to uh, pick up and as reserve matters schemes start to be prepared, we'll clearly be engaging much more with the consultative forum. So that was that point. Uh, additionally, we have uh, a representation that's come from a local resident in relation to drainage, and they've picked up particularly um, the matter of debris in the cockbeck and the and potential flooding. Uh, this has been looked at by uh, the flood risk yeah. management officer, who's looked at the matter in detail. The, the issue is actually an off-site issue that's slightly further to the south in um, the southern quadrant, and it's to do with um, culverts that exist and the way that they're designed um, and, and it's a, essentially a build-up of twigs and other detritus along the way and that, and that needing to be cleared. So the, the uh, responsibility of that is the riparian owners which are the city council on the western side and the developers ultimately on the eastern side. So within um, the response it's noted that there are some intrinsic issues with the culverts that exist but it is noted that there are some um, potential improvements which are in the offing um, and, and actually they are maintained on a, on a fortnightly basis. Um, through the, for the developer's perspective, what we'd be seeking to achieve is, is a, ultimately a management plan to cover green spaces, but also to cover the management of the watercourse as well. So we would we would be seeking to ensure that this um, situation basically doesn't occur in the future and is, is perhaps better managed. In terms of other things to cover in the report, I refer to a BAT report that was to be submitted. Um, that, that has been submitted and, and that particular report is considered to be acceptable. Um, as a further update, I've also included the biodiversity net gain figures within the report. And at the time of uh, writing the report, they were as stated at, at this stage by the developer. Clearly it's an outline application, so that's it's quite a difficult task in, in principle, but they, they, they pulled those figures together. The Nature Conservation Office has looked at those and thinks that there's some, um, it, some of those figures are slightly off, so they would need to be looked at in a bit more detail. That all said, as I say, it is an outline and we'd be looking to ensure that each reserve matters phase achieves um, net gain um, and or better as, as is required at any point in, in time. And lastly, there was also reference in the report to the disused railway line, and it was really just to update members that the discussions with the Elmet Greenway group have been ongoing. Uh, they have been throughout the throughout the application process, and this is particularly in relation to the part of the disused railway line which actually falls outside of the application site, and there's a keenness to get um, a, a decent footpath link out towards schools, um, and effectively they've responded to say they they agree. 
with the the, the sort of um, the footway creation order and look forward to it being a, a fairly natural space uh, both that side of ELO and within the, the development site so it's just a, a small update there I was also asked this morning in terms of agricultural land classification in terms of where that was um, for this particular site it's been allocated as a housing site for 20 years um, and obviously ELO the, the presence of ELO changes the the nature of that, that land as well um, but it, in all other respects it would otherwise be class three to four which is good to moderate agricultural land so that i think really um, concludes the presentation so the recommendation is to defer and delegate to the chief planning officer for approval uh, subject to the removal of the current holding direction by national highways um, including resolution of the off-site highway works i mentioned and the specified conditions in the reports and obligations listed. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Andrew. Questions? I see Colin first. So I'll bring Colin in. Can, can I just get clear in my mind what I'm being asked to do? <laughs> because the, the, when I read this report, I, I looked at the subject, and the subject is planning application, outline application. Now, you've given us a really good report on whatever discussions are taking place in relation to EGLO, uh, to East, the East Leeds, whatever we call it at the moment. Um, EGLO is the road, I think, isn't it? My understanding, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that the EGLO's decided, the road itself is decided, its style is decided, the access into this site is already agreed because it's off the two roundabouts. Okay, so those are those those items <coughs> have already agreed. So what you what the the subject appears to be asking me to do is to agree the principle of the totality of development, i.e., eight hundred and seventy-five units, and <clears throat> the spine road. Okay. Is, is that what I'm being asked to do? Because I've got a question in relation to that. Or am I being asked to agree much, a much wider scheme? Because you showed us, and we've touched on this already today, indicative layouts for housing, indicative sites for various things within the totality of that uh, thing. Now, I appreciate that, that, that there have been ongoing discussions for a long time about where things are going. But I'm not being asked to agree that. And what worries me, as we've already said in relation to the previous one, is if we agree this, what are we actually agreeing? Yeah, yeah thank you. Um, yes, the access from the e the law junction from York Road is, is already agreed. I think there's some very slight amendments, Gillian, will correct me if I'm wrong, for, for the tie-in of things like cycleways and footways from this proposal but but essentially it's otherwise largely as approved the access from the south is new because that's a new access from um, the barrack road so that's that's a that's a new access with uh, footways and uh, crossing points within within that beyond that um what you're being asked to agree is really the sort of the disposition of the uh, development parcels and where those green spaces are those structural elements you're not being asked to agree that the housing mix or the density or the heights or anything at that level of detail simply are the green spaces in the correct places to agree with the broad drainage strategy in terms of having um you know, attenuation basins within those green areas going out into into cock back so that's i think really the okay what we're seeking with the best for. will in the world i can't I mean, it's a small plan, we all agree that. But I can't work out where the best space for a green space would be unless I know what the housing mix that's going around it is. Um, and I, I'm not, you know, a, a simple figure of 875 really doesn't mean a lot to me because, as we all know, developers come back and, and change their mind. And you talked about uh, affordables and affordable contributions uh, relating to a housing mix that developers seem to have proposed to us not that necessarily is policy compliant so I, i'm i'm slightly worried 
that we are being asked to agree more than we actually think we are. Now, if you're saying to me, do I have an issue with the, the principle of development? No, because that's agreed already. Do we have an issue about uh, accessing it from the two roundabouts? Actually, I, don't, I know it, the second one access is, a, is relatively new, but looking at it, it's the same as the other one. So that's fine. Um, at no point did you say to me why the spine road is following the route it is. Um, so I'm saying, well, why are we doing that one then? Uh, I know there has to be a spine road, <laughs> but why is it following that route? Because it appears to follow that route because of housing developments that is showing us on an indicative plan. Um, now that might not be what we want. And so if you're saying to me, could I propose that we agree the principle of um, development? Yes, the access, yes. I'm happy with that. I'm not happy about the rest of it. Uh, and that really concerns me with what we've been asked to do. Sorry to go on there, Chair. Thank you. Yeah, could we maybe just turn up the, the master plan? So that's the number. It's 69. That's a bit scary. Um, you got one you can round about page sixty. Yes. Sixty three. Okay. So within the proposals, the for the purposes of, of coming to some kind of calculation around green space, the developers have put forward an indicative housing mix, but it is purely indicative at this stage. So they've suggested 30% one and two bed units. Sorry, sorry, sorry. No. So I thought it was a question. <laughs> Yeah, so, so, so one and two beds, 30%, um, 32% three beds, and 38% four and five beds. So that's a, an indicative mix that they've suggested. Um, further on in the report, I've explained how that fits with the um, what's in our housing mix policy. So that would be in itself policy compliant, but because of the size of the site, we would be asking them to do a housing needs assessment in future for those, for those reserve matters as they come forward. I get it but, clear in my sorry to interrupt you. Can I get it clear in my mind? So we're saying they're going for 875. We, we, we've agreed the principle, or we, you're asking us to agree the principle of 875 house units at that at those ratios. Uh, so you're agreeing 875 houses indicatively at those. Well, I'll say no, you're, you're not agreeing to that mix. Today. Right. So, so you have opportunities. We don't, need to, you, we don't need to discuss that then, do we? No, but only. No. So at reserve maps, what I would say. What I would say to members is what you do have the opportunity to do is at reserve matters stage, if an application came forward with a mix you felt was inappropriate, you could change, you could ask for a different mix at that stage, at that reserve matters stage. But we've included, they've, in, they've gone for a mix now just for the purposes of calculating the amount of green space that's required. So off the back of that mix, uh, to be compliant with policy G4, they would need to deliver 3.9 hectares of green space on site. So that illustrative master plan provides a total of 15.57 hectares of green space. So that's obviously considerably above um, what the policy would require. So that's 6.87 hectares of amenity green space, 7.7 .7 hectares of natural green space, and a hectare of parks and gardens. So that green space is the are effectively those the green areas you see on the master plan bef before you. So the, the, the pale areas that are shown with housing, you're not agreeing the layouts of those houses or how they're arranged, simply those broad development parcels. But we will be looking to, the, the developer wants agreement to where those green spaces go. And what we would want to do is, is, is fix those green spaces so we can be certain 
that we're getting the amount of green space that's being offered and that we don't lose that in the future. And that also ensures that the drainage infrastructure that's required can be accommodated on site. Does that help? Okay, cool. Can we move on? <laughs> sorry, I'm sorry to hog it, but so it ought to say <clears throat> um, private vehicle access, central spine road, and green space. In, in effect, we're just being asked to, to agree the master plan is a simple way of putting it. Thank you, Chair. So, so mem members, what, what we're asking you to do is agree the master plan on page 63. Now, it's not the detailed small housing plots that you can see on there, but it's it's where it's a difference between the green infrastructure where, where you, you, the, the indicative houses aren't shown and then the gray areas, which are the development areas. So in effect, we're, at, we're asking you to agree the master plan. It, it sets up the potential points of connection, the, air, the disposition of the green space through the wider site without agreeing the actual details of the houses, the streets within the gray areas and the design that which will come to you at a later stage and then the detailed treatment of those green areas will come to you at a later stage does that help i think that's clear colin is it <laughs> well it's clear but that's not what it says here <laughs> you know well right so the, the discussion now revolves around do we agree the layout in effect With the best will in the world, if we agree this, we've effectively decided the layout, haven't yeah. we? The, the, so we have agreed the, the layout. Yeah. Can I? Can I? Yeah, if I, if I can assist. Yeah, the the, the bit the, the the crucial bit to the layout is the spine road, as, as you say, uh, coming from York Road up here through the site. And then it runs down that eastern leg. And the reason, the, the question I think you were coming to is, is why is it in the locations where it is? It comes down through the centre here, so it can serve development either side for the most part, which is what you would normally expect. And then as you come further south, the allocation actually becomes quite narrow. And by the time you've accounted for the offset of the existing wooded areas adjacent to Cockbeck and the existing lands, or well, emerging landscape bonds adjacent to Elaw and green space to separate the houses from those uh, routes, you end up with quite a, a narrow area. So what they've proposed is to bring the spine road through effectively adjacent to Elaw in that location. And then again in the south, it divides that area, that development area, and comes through the middle and then takes you through to a connection on the Barrack Road. Can we, with that explanation, then can we move on? Uh, Councillor Brooks, please. Thank you, Chair. I'm also still quite confused, to be honest. Um, I, I agree, Colin. I think this is quite odd. Um, uh, could you bring the could you bring the plan up again? Slide sixty-three. Right. Okay. So. Um, the blue bits, is that for drainage? Is that specifically for drainage? There would be um, green space areas with um, drainage incorporated within it. And um, what's common practice is you'd have some permanently wet areas, which we wouldn't count as, as green space. Um, and there'll be other areas which are yeah, would be used in the event of a, of a flood event where they, they could accommodate uh, water storage. Right, okay. So I'm trying to get my head around where it is that we try, we're supposed to be agreeing here because if, if what you're saying is we need to agree this green space, we should already know, surely, what the, the drainage capacity of the whole site is, mm. right? 
So, and then, but then at, at the same time, we need to agree where the green space is. But in order to agree how much green space is appropriate, we need to know exactly how many units is going to be. But we won't know how many units is going to be until they come back with a proper plan. Uh, like, oh no, yeah, units, yeah. But I mean, what if they come back and it's like crammed? Um, but then, as well as that, there's there's issues with like where's a medical provision going to go? Where's a where's a school provision going to go? Like, because it's all mentioned in the report. This is why I'm confused. It's all all of these things are mentioned in the report, but we're being told not to think about it. <laughs> so why mention it? Yeah, I mean he has dealt with it in his report, and perhaps if he. Uh, it's going to be in the southern quadrant, which is on council on land, where we've got a lot of uh, determination what's going to happen. But if it right, if it's if it's going to be on council on land, right? Surely, surely the developers should be bringing more contributions forward because then we as a council are making it so that this development can go ahead. They're not using their own land to do that when they could. Yeah, I, I'm not involved in that, but there will have been a separate um, land agreement between the council um, as, a, as a participant in that planning application because that land will all be within the red line boundary. Um, but that's obviously not a matter for me. Uh, the matter for me is, is simply where is the location of that local centre and what does that entail in, in, in planning terms? So where, where is a local centre going to be then? I can probably still use this same plan. Um, so it's within the southern, the northern part of the southern quadrant. So if you can see that where my red line is. <laughs> so on the south side of Barrick Road, the there'll be a... The yeah. <laughs> So if, if we can go perhaps if go to the previous um, slide, please, because that will have the wider context. So the south side of Barrick Road within there, that's a two form entry primary school and also the local centre to provide retail, community and health facilities. Yes, and there's, and yes, as we mentioned this morning, there's also the existing windmill health centre within Swarcliffe as well. So that could provide some early um, access to health facilities in the absence of the local centre. We, we did see that on the slide vision this morning, Kayleigh. We did see the existing facilities. Uh, and, okay, one more. No, you don't have to explain yourself. I'm just saying, the, Quite a lot of us was on the site visit down there. Andrew took us to the existing facilities that were available for use it, it, to complement what's going to be built. Okay, uh, stick to my uh, list for the moment. There's a lot of hands flying up there. Something entirely different, which I've been uh, concerned about for a long time. Uh, the district used railway, which was the Leeds uh, Weatherby Harrogate line, which Beeching closed. Um, now, the, uh, from time to time, there are attempts to uh, get this line reopened, and then it all goes dead. Um, the the bit of the line which we have got left, could we uh, preserve it, please? I know that on uh, elsewhere on the line, houses have been built, unfortunately but I don't think we ought to be causing problems now. If we can keep it, maybe as a footpath, then uh, do so, please. Um, yeah, that, that's absolutely right. So within the application site, it is to be retained with um, footways. Could we possibly put the slide back up, please? Is it 63? We've got it in front of you. Yes, so there's, there's, there's a brown dotted line and that's the route of, um, sort of footpath provision yeah. over the disused railway line. And that connects into other proposed routes through that area of woodland and ultimately connects up to the spine road. Um, I also mentioned 
um, discussions between Taylor Wimpy and the Elmet Greenway group. And, and that was particularly concerning the, the continuation of the route eastward. So in this, this area of land heading out towards Skulls. So there are active discussions and they'll, long, they'll carry on outside of the remit of a planning application to ensure that that, that happens. Thank you, Chair. Oh, hello. Um, so, uh, so question, well, question one sounds like a comment, but I promise you there's a question coming. So I, I, I have a real concern um, about the, uh, I'm looking at the outline layout. And I know we keep saying it's indicative, but the reason it's there is because it's predicated on the number of units. And actually, as I look at this, I think that I think it's far too intense. That's not the word. Overcrowded, frankly. Uh, in other words, overdeveloped. Thank you. That's where the word just went. Um, uh, uh, and that's why it, it, the indicative layout as it is, because there's too many properties there. So based on this, I can't support later on 875 properties. Uh, what approaches have been made to the developers to reduce that and reduce it significantly, which would then mean that there was far more space. I, I've always said, I don't care where we are in the city. I want every development in this city to be the best it can possibly be. Uh, and I'm not going to support later on today, 875 uh, properties here, 875 units, because on this site, I believe it's too many. So what approaches were made to reduce that number one? Number two, uh, in uh, page 66 of the report, uh, where co with comments uh, that we received, um, some concern has been raised uh, around the impact of additional traffic through Skulls Village uh, and on Leeds Road and suggestions that there should be no vehicle access to the development uh, from Skulls Village. Um, you didn't make any reference to that. Uh, what considerate, because, uh, and I mentioned that because you did then mention uh, about the segregated cycleway, which was really good to hear. Um, so I think that they are very sensible suggestions. Uh, and I'd like to know what consideration was given to those and whether that is indeed going to be the case. But my overriding concern is, is the, the, what's the word? Thank you, overdevelopment. I can't, I don't know, I can't remember that word today. <laughs> That too. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yes, yeah, so the I think the initially envisaged numbers for East Leeds Extension were probably slightly higher. Um, the, the description of them is, is circa 875. And again, that's a reflection of the outline nature of the application. So I suspect, and we can perhaps ask the developers, but there would be a means of looking at the area of a developable area and calculating roughly what, what amount of development you would get on there. And that's that's one thing and that's fine. Um, you're quite right in the, in, in the eventuality of things when you have a reserve matters application before you, um, we can then make those judgments as to um, the density of development spaces between dwellings um, and how that all works. Um, so we could then rightly interrogate those layouts and, and amend numbers as, as need be. Um, that said, obviously each of these um, allocations need to work hard um, to generate housing numbers for obviously much needed housing, but also to generate the houses to pay for the uh, for the ELOR route itself. So I suppose I would say not not to worry too much about the number, but but maybe look in, in detail at the at the phases when they when they come in. Uh, sorry, so do, do just answer the question about skulls. Yeah, okay. yeah, I'm sorry. I, I, I've sat on this panel for far too long. Uh, once we say yes to 875, not one house less will come forward. If we're giving outline consent to 875 units, am I not correct in saying that if we then turn around at a later date and say we want 600 units, we could quite legitimately be told to go do one? <laughs> do you want me to come back? If I just come back on, on that point first, I mean, I have. Um, Previously, I have had outline applications where you have a particular number, and then in the reality of things at reserve matter stage, the actual number that comes in is less because there simply isn't the space on the site to deliver those number of those, those that, that number of dwellings. By the time you've factored in 
uh, green space and space between dwellings. It's often the case that the number outline or even uh, um, yeah, the indicative number is often a bit higher. So, so whilst the, the description of development will be that circa 875, clearly the, those eventual layouts need to be acceptable in order for, for us to grant them uh, reserve matters consents in the, in the fullness of time. In answer to the second, um, second of your questions, in terms of access from skulls, it would simply be by, by foot or cycle. There is no, I think the concern in the letters was particularly around whether there be any vehicular access from skulls. So there is, there is absolutely no vehicular access. The only existing vehicular connections that there are would be along Leeds Road, which is obviously intercepted by the Elor Junction. And then at the northern end, as you work your way out to the York Road and then southwards, and, and again, you're the Elar Junction there. But other than that, there are absolutely no vehicular connections. Julie. Yeah, thank you, Chair. I just wanted to add, you know, clearly we need, you know, 875, or even if it was slightly less, we need more than one vehicular access into the site of, of the surrounding highway network. We weren't able to locate um, an access off the, um, the Swarcliffe estate. So it, they, they were coming from, from the edges, which I think we, we envisaged quite early on anyway. So, you know, there, there isn't that scope, I don't think, to sever Leeds Road. And it certainly hasn't ever been part of our discussions. Dan, just to remind you that when we did lay, uh, Laneside Farm in, in Morley, it come in on the L on the indicative a much higher number, but when it was produced, it was a, a fair bit less than it. So it wasn't fixed, and that was probably the last last application we've looked at. I know you've been sat on the panel a long time, but <laughs> just a reminder. Um, can I have Caroline, please? Thank you, Chair. Two questions from me, and then I've got some comments on uh, some of the points that have been touched on, which I'll do later. If you could put me on the comments list. Um, have health partners been formally consulted on the issue of health provision, uh, as other partners have? You've talked about um, uh, a working group type arrangement or uh, involving the ward members, um, but the, the, there seemed to be little conclusion from that. And you did point out the existing health centre a couple of times on site and again in your presentation. When you add up the number of houses to be newly developed with the houses that that um, centre currently serves, it doesn't seem to me to be sufficient health provision for the whole area. So I think I, I'd like some really clear outcomes on that. And I, I believe probably uh, more health provision might be required at the end of the day, unless Dan gets the number of uh, dwellings down very considerably. Um, the other thing is my usual question. Two play areas have been identified. Do we have, have you had any discussions? I've no doubt the, the nature of them will be indicative at this stage, but it might be worth flagging up. <laughs> Have any, have any questions been asked about what type of play areas, what type of provision, how it might fit in with the characteristics of the area, et cetera. And it's worth flagging that up at this point rather than when it comes back in the usual conventional manner. And then my other things are comments, Chair. Okay, Andrew. Thank you. Um, yeah, so in terms of the, the discussions with health partners, um, because of the nature and size of the application, we wanted to involve um, health partners early on and historically we've it's a case of us sending a consultation and very often you know we, we didn't get an awful lot back because it's it's very difficult in terms of planning for health because of the nature of the system that we have um in this particular case what, what the benefit of the what's occurred over the last 18 months is we do now have offices who are connected with um health partners so in the meetings that we have they include represent would include the GPs, frankly. So there's GPs, um, people who, who manage those, these individual surgeries within this local area. So then they're very much on the ground in East Leeds and in Swarcliffe. So that what we're looking for is advice from them as to what their particular needs are within that local area. And they have, clearly they have got that, that, that insight. And what we want to draw out of that in order to optimize what we get, what we can deliver in the local center is really getting out what, what's really needed for that local area. One of their criticisms had been historically often, not just necessarily in Leeds, but anywhere, is often you'll have a, a dedicated area for health, but actually what does that do? It might not be the right shape, size type of building. 
Um, so there's all those factors to, to weigh in. So hence the, hence the discussions with them have been very useful. Um, and that's what we're hoping to feed into the work that NPS is doing in order to try and drive that on. Um, yes, I, I did point out the Windmill Health Centre, um, which is obviously new and in the area and quite close, and they are accepting patients. I wouldn't suggest that they, they're capable, and, and I'm, I'm pretty certain that the um, the health providers would say that it, it, it certainly wouldn't provide a service for all of that new development. So they've been, so the health providers have said, yes, we do need new health provision. Um, and that, that would need to be, um, that would need, that would be needed to accommodate the middle and southern quadrants, but also the wider East Leeds growth as well. So there's a, there's a, a bigger picture in terms of the health need. And, but that local centre within the southern quadrant would assist in, in delivering that. In terms of the play areas, there's three equipped play areas shown within the um, master plan. Um, it, it, they are, you know, they, 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 they've been cited there really for, for, for the purpose of um, ensuring adequate access to play facilities within the site. So we don't have any details of them as yet. Uh, but yeah, we would be looking to engage with parks and countryside colleagues to look at the age ranges of those particular equipped play areas. So obviously different age groups will have different different needs and so on. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, Councillor Walsh, Can please. I just come back? Yeah. yeah, my suggestion would be to consult more widely than just parks and countrysides, and it's more than the age groups that need to be considered. Add another thing, because I think um, given the establishment of the consultative or forum, that's been really useful on both the northern quadrant and the middle and southern quadrant application. So I think it'd be well worth us having those sorts of discussions there with local residents as well to draw out what, what people want. Exactly what I was about to suggest. <laughs> no, it doesn't matter. You do that. It doesn't matter who do it. Neil, please. Councillor Walsh. Um, thanks, yeah. I, I, I think the questions I wanted to ask have really been covered. I mean, I don't... I, I'm aware of time. There's so, so many things to discuss about within this application. We are only agreeing a very small amount. So if you just put me down for comments, that'd be great. Okay. I think we're on comments now. Um, sorry? Sorry, question. Okay. I always leave you to last, Paul. It's, you've it's, such interesting comments to make. <laughs> sort of twice you've done that. And it is sort of a comment, although I did want to come in actually when Councillor Brooks was speaking because I was wanting to agree with her that I'm still unsure what we are actually approving here. Uh, and <laughs> as the debate's gone on, it seems to have been more of a detailed application because I can't say the Councillor Collins right or wrong about the numbers from. Right. from, from from the from the plans that are there and then the play areas looks like we are now approving those from an indicative layout and well the, yeah but once once they're set in the green green space car and we can't put them anywhere else can we? and so i just i just find it very confusing about about actually what we are approved and and i, and I find it a little irregular chair that that we've been you know if we're approving development and the numbers and the entrances, then I'm happy, but I'm not happy to approve more than that without more drawings. Okay. Um, as there was no speakers against, we do have the developers here. So can I invite uh, Mark Johnson to come forward and address that question for us, please? Good evening, uh, Mark. Uh, good evening, uh, members, chair. Yeah, it's a little unusual in the fact that we didn't get to make our representation as usual on the basis that there is no objectors to speak, which in itself, I think, is, is, is just a testament to the level of consultation that we've held on this project over the last two years. Picked up on some of the comments about the concerns, and, and I think this is absolutely right, but first of all, the 875, whilst it sounds like a very large number, it's a very large site, and what we've got on this site is four times the amount of green space than what the council's policy actually requires and we've got some very large wide verges which are street trees and and, and walkways and then there's something in the order of 10 kilometers of walkway and running way between the two quadrants the middle quadrant and the southern quadrant but but ultimately if the council has a concern about the 875 then we were just having a chat there we've got no we've got no issue about that becoming a maximum limit because we know what we're planning beneath that level at the moment. And, and all of those, those houses that we're currently about to bring forward in a reserve matters application will not 
massively, well, they won't go over that number, but they won't be a million miles below it. And, and, and there's a reason for that, is that we're planning houses that meet the size standards of the council, that meet the garden standards of the council, and that meet all, meet all of the parking provision. And I think the reason why there's a degree of concern in the room is that it's a big number, but it's a big site. There is a reference to the section 106 pause, is that yes, we have got something in the order of 20 million pounds to pay back into the e-law, and that was the purpose of the East Leeds extension. And, and, and just to reflect on some of the comments about, well, why aren't we paying more for this and more for that? What we've got here is a section 106 package, which is in the order of 30,000 pounds a dwelling, which is probably three times higher than any other residential scheme that you would normally consider, because normally you'd have a section 106 package, including still around about 10,000 pound a plot. The reason why this one is so high is that it's payment back into the e-law road. So we, we were more than willing to sit along here this afternoon or this evening and answer as many questions as possible. But sadly, the nature in which we're not allowed to come make that presentation has been somewhat um, you know, taken from us. But if there was a concern about the numbers, we can limit it at 875. You're not being asked to approve any residential layout that will come back in a reserve masses application. But most importantly, the reason why we want this outline approval here now is that there are two developers, Taylor Wimpy and Persimmon. And Persimmon at the northern end of the site and Taylor Wimpy at the southern end of the site. And essentially, we're getting, hopefully tonight, your approval to the package of Section 106 measures, because that's the most important element that we're looking for you to sign off of. And as I say, it's three times bigger than normally what you'd ever, ever see before. And in my opinion, the biggest you'll have ever seen by, by, by far on any residential development in this, in this district, is that once that's signed off through this outline, and we can bring forward the reserve matters to, to your satisfaction to meet all of your policy requirements, it has to be approved in this current form because the two developers will bring forward their reserve matters application separately, but in broad accordance with the master plan that you can see. So you're not approving the master plan, but you're approving the package of measures so those two developers can work with the master plan and submit the, the reserve matters applications. So Chair, if that gives any degree of comfort, we will be coming back with all of the detail that you are expecting to meet your policies. Well, I believe that's very helpful. Thank you. Uh, can we go on to comments now? Um, and I've got uh, Caroline first. You. Thank you, Chair. Well, just to say, first of all, in relation to my first question, I, I would want more reassurance than I currently have about health provision um, before I'd want to agree, even outline. Um, secondly, um, just to join the debate on design and layout, which I know is indicative, and, and I know that you've just confirmed, Mark, that we're not being asked to approve any of that today. But if we accept the amount of green space that you've got down, which uh, is generous, although I would say that it justifies even more in this particular location, it actually doesn't give much scope to do anything very much different from what's there. You could change them round and, and, and sort them out a little bit differently, but you'd end up with something that looks very similar to that because that's what fits in that space. And looking at the... Um, pretty pictures that you, you've got up there with houses with green space in front of them. I would challenge you on how many, how many spots that you could stand on in this development and actually be uh, look, overlooking a scene like that because I can't see any patches of green space on this indicative layout that would give rise to as big an area of green space in relation to the houses that's there. So I'd, I'd want more reassurance on that. Um, your comments, Mark, in the report and in your um, presentation about each patch washes his own face. I get that, but I worry about lack of consistency, uh, particularly consistency of quality. And I mean high quality, of course, not low quality in terms of design and all the things that we've been looking at today. We can call it indicative today, but it will inevitably come back in a form that you know, we find perhaps not up to standard unless we make some of those points now. And I'd like to say the, the, the picture in front of us now on the screen, um, I mean, I had such ambition for these areas. They are very desirable, rural, countryfied areas with, with lovely outlooks. And look at the houses that are on there, straight out of a pattern book. I really don't feel 
But in this context, that is acceptable. And I feel if I don't raise that now, it will inevitably come back in that form. So I'm raising it for that reason. Um, uh, I think that's probably most of the points I wanted to make for this, for the moment. Thank you, Caroline. I'm sure your comments has been noted by the developers and uh, we will look at that much more closely at uh, Reserve Matters. Okay, uh, Councillor Cohn. Thank you, Chair. Um, the, the fact is, the fact is today that we are going to be approving essentially, <clears throat> or asked to approve a quantum of development, the number of units, where the green space is are going to be and once one does both of those things one ain't left with a whole lot of choice about where houses are situated um, and one looks at uh, the image on the indicative image on page 70 uh, and i know this panel well we will not be happy uh, approving that kind of indicative it, it won't be indicative at that stage uh, and we'll be told, well, you approved that many houses uh, and you approved where the green spaces had to be. And therefore, that's all we've got left. Um, and I'm sorry, I just don't think that's good enough. And I think you know, Councillor Gruen's absolutely right. This should, in the context of this development, it should maintain that rural feel. Uh, and this will come to us as a reserved matters application where we will actually have very little scope to do anything other than some tweaks and we'll do those tweaks that we sometimes feel we have to, to try and improve matters but that is colleagues what they will be um because really this development and we've we've really been told that is being driven fundamentally literally driven by the requirement of funding towards ELaw. Uh, and I don't believe that is sh that should be our primary consideration. I believe our primary consideration should be to make sure we get the best development for those people who are going to be our lead citizens who live there. Um, and so I don't feel that I can support this today because there is a number there and I would like to see that number lower. Uh, and I'm not able to calculate what a lower amount should be, but I would suggest it would be based on an indicative design that didn't cluster houses quite so tightly together and had a far reduced density. That will give a different number. Uh, and based on that indicative plan, uh, uh, we might be able, or I might feel able to support it. But as it is, I can't. Councillor Brooks, please. Um, yeah, um, sort of similarly to Councillor Cohen, but not the same as Councillor Cohen, really. So I'm I I don't feel as strongly that um, it's overdevelopment, but I don't feel I've been given enough information as to whether I can form that view or not form that view. I've been given information about housing like housing policy and core strategy policy h5 and loads of loads of stuff that we're not being expected apparently to agree to but um i i'm not i'm not sure that i'm i'm <laughs> at the end of all this i'm still not sure like whether to support it or whether not to I am um, councillor Gruen was talking about the the medical side of things and the and the schools and everything and I I agree with her like I've, I'd like to see much more much more information a lot more detail on this like um because again it's it's confusing as to as to what I'm being asked to agree to so thank you chair you, Curly. Uh, Peter, please. Thanks, Chair. Uh, I mean, it's a bit of an odd one. I'm, 
I think I'm feeling the lateness, so I'm going to be a bit cheeky with panel. But I think we've had some tonight where we've had not enough detail and members haven't been happy with that. And some tonight where we've got, in a way, too much detail that we're then commenting on it. So I will somewhat sympathise with the officers and feel that they can't really win in, in this situation. And the one thing I will say that's different... Now, I have seen sites that have come through that certainly the numbers suggested in the SAP haven't been possible. And then when they've gone through the policies about... Uh, how much space we need between the houses and the housing density, that it's not been possible for a developer to fit those in and that, that they've had to come through for fewer houses. I mean, I, I will say in this, if we say 875 homes, they're going to have to bring through um, some layouts that fit with the council's policies around how those fit together. Mm -hmm. If they manage to do that and it sits in there, I, I don't know what we could have to question that as a panel if it fits with the council's policy. Yeah. If it comes back and it doesn't meet policy, then we're we're entitled to reject it. So, so that's one thing on there. And um, really, therefore, regardless of what we set the max numbers to be, when they come back, that'll be that. The, the one thing I do have that I'm concerned of is maybe the mix, because obviously the mix, we have targets, not policy. And on this, the mix is far away from our target than yeah. we'd perhaps like it to be. Again, and then perhaps we'd like to, in the are area. Are we agreeing to the mix or are we not agreeing yeah. to the mix? So I think yeah, that's the problem we? that we need to set. Now, I'm very happy to allow this to proceed to another stage if at that stage we are able to look at the mix and say, uh, are we able then to have more one beds, more two beds, et cetera, than the large four beds? If what we're agreeing today makes that impossible, to change the numbers in that way i think that's very difficult mm -hmm. however I, I will i will take it and if we can get clarification on that that would be useful because i'm very happy to support it if at that stage we'll be able to re-amend the layout to that level uh, mm -hmm. because it will have to meet the policies and if it meets policies then we, we we don't have a point the other thing i will add if we don't manage to fit these houses on this site they will have to be fit somewhere else in the city so we may want to reduce the numbers and we may want to make sure the density is right, but there will have to be another site to fit the others on if the housing need isn't met by the sites we've got allocated. So I think that's the one point that I'm being careful about as well. OK, thank, thank you for those comments, uh, Peter, quite useful. I think uh, um, I'm going to bring Daljan in to, uh, to highlight just what's been said and what we are voting for. I think that's important because I think we have gone off track a little bit, you know, not the old railway track, but the track of what we're here and what we're agreeing on. So I think we need to come back on it. A lot of this, a lot of the, uh, a lot of the comments were more suitable for reserve matters, as we all know, we're all experienced. Okay, Dal. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I think, uh, if I, it, it was really helpful that Mark Johnson uh, explained uh, the applicant's position. And if I may uh, do so, Chair, uh, and it may learn, uh, allay panel's concerns, I think we can change the description to say that if, if members are mind to support this, then we are agreeing a development uh, of up to a maximum of 875 units, uh, rather than circa 875 units, up to a maximum, because as, as Councillor Carlyle and other councillors have, have, have said quite rightly, we're not agreeing either the mix or the number of units at this stage. Those will be properly the subject of the reserve matters application. And that up to could be quite significantly less if it's not meeting our neighbourhoods for living guidance or other policies, mm -hmm. which are, uh, are paramount in terms of getting the kind of quality that members clearly want and officers want. So if it helps, I think... Uh, we can do that and 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 then we will bring the reserve matters details back for agreement with members uh, in in terms of the uh, position on the health facilities and other facilities i think andrew in his report has has been as clear as he can uh, yes there are existing facilities yes we recognize they need to be added to uh, we are discussing with health providers uh, what the form of those would be and there is a site in this particular case, very close to, uh, which is owned by the council, which gives us a lot of comfort that we can add to those health facilities. And that's as honest as we can be, that's the position we're at. But we will carry on that dialogue through the consultative forum with directly with the health providers 
Um, and, and hopefully that allays members' concerns about uh, the fact that those matters aren't properly being looked at. Uh, and then the, the other aspects of the application before you, in terms of the 106 obligations, I think Andrew has made quite clear that they are policy compliant obligations. So thank you, Chair. Thank you, Dalji, very helpful. Um, look, I've got just two more speakers and then I think we should move on. Uh, it's been a long day and we've two more. So uh, can I say the two speakers is Councillor Walsh uh, and Colin Campbell. And then uh, we, we will move on, I think. Council Walshaw. Well, it's two, two councillors of this, this council known for their brevity, so that's going to be fine. Um, <laughs> I think that's been a useful clarification from the applicant and from Dalgit, and I'd be um, fairly uh, assured in, in, in progressing things this evening on this one, Chair. But it is an outline application, and it is customary, isn't it, when we have these kind of applications that we do set a lot of markers down for what will be the reserve matters application because I, I tend to find you in my experience on this panel if we don't do that process then the applicants will come forward with something that isn't good enough and those drawings were slightly concerning looking at members around this, this room um so we need to put markers down for design and quality you know this is an application that's going to take years to develop we all know that it's a huge development it's an important development sometimes i think we might lose track of what housing actually does a little bit when we get focused into the details there's a huge housing list waiting list in that area and the, it, the affordables are really important for those communities that's all to the good so i think we need to make progress but we've got to get the details right this really we what we're aiming for really as councillor bruins alluded to is like an exemplar development that shows really strong design if the applicants come back with you know what we saw there yeah um, John Betch Menace Metroland, then we're going to be in for months of trench warfare with this application. So I just really want to put that marker down that this could be a really well designed, fantastic, zero carbon development where genuinely, Chair, you might choose not to have a car. And that's what we need to be aiming for. So to say that now to the applicant, because if it doesn't come back with those qualities, then we're going to be here for many late nights on this plans panel, Chair, and we'll see where we get with that process. Thank you. Neil, Colin, please. Oh, the night's still young. <laughs> <laughs> oh, right, okay, right. I'd, I'd like to make a proposal, Chair. Um, okay, which is uh, subject planning application to da, 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 outline application for a maximum of 875 dwellings, including uh, primary vehicle, vehicle access, which we, I think nobody's argued about, um and the central spine road which i now understand why it's going where it is all right and the infrastructure works associated with th that part of the development okay all the rest reserved uh on land etc cetera, etc cetera. um <clears throat> i mean it talks about uh our deferred uh and delegate with the with, with certain conditions those conditions are actually are relevant to what actually happens at the uh, reserve matter application. And I think we're, we're saying, yes, we would expect a contribution to the East Leeds Orbital. Um, yes, we would expect com policy compliant affordable housing. Uh, yes, we would expect a primary education contribution, but we can't say how much that will be yet because we don't know how many dwellings there are. Uh, all those things, we, in principle, we agree. So I suggest that that makes this an outline application and we're agreeing it in principle. With regard to what you were saying about effectively, we're ask, you're asking us to agree the master plan. It would seem to me, uh, and the reason I haven't included that, is that the master plan actually involves three sections here. There's the northern quadrant, the central quadrant and the southern quadrant. Now, I think they're on site on the northern quadrant, aren't they? <clears throat> but the central and southern one are interlinked. I know they're, we call them separate quadrants, but they're interlinked. So the, the comment in relation to the health center is something that's happening in the, the southern quadrant. And it would seem to me that <clears throat> members need to understand the, um, the, the, the plan for both, those bits of those quadrants and agree that master plan, the master plan of the totality. 
because that allows you to then say, well, development will go in X, Y, and Z. And so it would seem to me that at the, in the very near future, we ought to have, <laughs> provided it's not under a meeting like today, uh, 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 and a, a, a session, in, if nothing else, to get some general agreement across the board about the, the totality of the master plan, where the development's going, where the green space is going, to give developers actually in throughout the entire entirety of the development some certainty about where we want things to go, rather than to get into what we've said in the past will be a long discussion about the minutiae of these things. So can I propose that we do that, Chair? Can I just comment, Chair? Sure, yeah. I, I can understand Councillor Campbell's uh, suggestion. I, I think the challenge we have, we've got a sudden quadrant application, Andrew, that's coming already, haven't we? So we need to think about what stage that's at and what that's saying at the moment. That, that's right. So the perhaps I've confused matters by having sort of the middle and southern quadrant master plans, but I've done that to show the relationship to the school and the local centre as well as the housing in both quadrants. But the application before us today is simply just for the middle quadrant only. So I've only included the southern quadrant because it's the same team and it's for, for context. So really the only thing that's for um, for discussion is, is just the master plan on the middle quadrant. Well, in that case, I'll, I'll go back. If, if you're saying to us we can't discuss a master plan for the entirety of the site, the middle and southern quadrant, uh, which is what you appear to be saying to us, then I'll go back to my proposal, which is we have an outline application um, with a maximum of 875, uh, which shows the, the vehicle access, as it says on the note, um, and associated infrastructure works with that and the spine road. But the rest of it, I'm sorry, I, th I think the general view was um, we're not too pleased about accepting the master plan as the basis for the design. We need to talk that one through. Um, and I, I know it means that we're gonna to have to talk about it at some length later on, but it, 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 members need to understand, and I need to understand the relationship between, particularly for the health facilities and the school, between the, the central and the southern section. And it's a bit off putting watching yourself on screen when you're slightly delayed. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I will propose what I've, I've said. If we can't, if we can't have a, a discussion about the, the entirety of the, the the site, then okay, we can't. But I think that's a, a mistake, quite frankly. Okay, I I think um, um, following uh, considerable debate. Um, I think it's quite clear that uh, uh, the panel is is cautious about agreeing where the green space areas will be uh, in, in, in terms of that aspect of the layout. But other than that, they're prepared to support the uh, recommendation to agree up to a maximum of 875 units. Uh, they're comfortable with the uh, uh, the access proposals, which are before you, and they're comfortable with the alignment of the spine road through the site. Um, and then all, all other matters will come back to panel uh, at reserve matters stage. Okay. Well, do you want to come in? Yes. Mr. Carr, please. <laughs> <clears throat> Thanks, Chair. Essentially, that is what the description says at the moment. Um, so I think on that basis, we, we would proceed with what we've got in terms of the recommendation. OK. OK, are you happy with that? Uh, Mr Carr has said that uh, that's exactly what it says at the moment, so we don't need I to appreciate, change it. I appreciate that's what that's, it was said, but when you get the, the comment, but effectively you're agreeing the master plan, which we've got here, which I don't think we are agreeing the master plan. We're agreeing, uh, yes, there's going to be development. We all know that. Um, but the rest of it, it is, okay, if we're accepting that, I'm, I'll accept that that's what we're doing. But as I say, I was hoping we'd have a, a better discussion about the entirety of the site so we understand the master plan better. But 
if we can't, we can't. Okay, then I think we've had a good discussion on this and we need to move to the vote. All those in favor of the recommendation, please show. Oh, I can't get an answer one. We, Colin's motion is exactly what's uh, the recommendation. Yes. Yes, we've changed that one. Yes. Circa goes, Max comes in. Okay, let's try that vote again. All those in favor, please show. Thank you. Those against? That's clearly carried. Thank you for that lively debate. A break, oh God, we time. Let's move on, Liz, if we can. Am I what? No, I wish you could. You're going. You need to move on, you know, a comfort break. If you want to, feel free. <laughs> Okay, if you can turn to uh, page 95, um, agenda item 10, and uh, Matt is here to introduce it. When you're ready, Matt, you, I'm sorry for keeping you away. Good afternoon, everyone. Now, I, I have a lot of slides to get through here, and I'm conscious of how long you've been sat here, so I'm going to be brisk, and if you need me to go back to any, please let me know. So... Um, the application before us is one that you have seen at pre-application stage back in May, which is the redevelopment of the former swimming pool site on Lisbon Street. It's a mixed use development comprising um, built to rent student housing, uh, sorry, built to rent housing, student accommodation and a part hotel. And then there is an outline element for an office building. Um, so that remains in outline. All the other matters are a full application. Uh, next slide, please. really poor quality image unfortunately um that's the site there sandwiched between the a58 and um little queen street can you uh, move the next slide please now oh, this is a little bit better it's um 1.31 hectares in area it's currently in use as a 410 space commuter car park um there's a cycleway an existing cycleway and pedestrian route to the west of the site a footway to the north of the site between this site and brotherton house which is to the north uh, next slide, please. And then this slide indicates some of the uh, constraints and features of the site. Marked in red is an existing um, ramp and stair arrangement leading to a footbridge over the A58. In orange, orange are two belts of protected trees. In blue at the top of the image is a large protected feature tree. And then in pink is the demise of the city centre conservation area and the site is outside rather than inside the boundary. Next slide, please. This is the view looking uh, south down Lisbon Street. Next slide, please. This is the view looking eastward from the northern section of Lisbon Street across the site. Next slide, please. And this is the opposite view looking down towards Lisbon Street from the bridge, the existing bridge link with the A58 on the right. Next slide, please. Now this view is from the existing bridge platform area and it's looking eastwards. It shows approximately 60% of the site area. Next slide. And then from the same position, unfortunately, I haven't got wide enough lens, but that's the remaining 40% of the, the site looking downwards towards the Yorkshire Post building. Um, next slide, please. Now, this is the proposed site, la site layout to give some indication of the spaces between the proposed buildings and how the landscape and layout would work. At the top of the image, you can see a ramp structure which will form a new link from the pedestrian environment and the adjacent footbridge. Uh, the route parallel to the A58 is to be improved. We can see there's new tree planting to line that particular route, leading into the site where there's an east-west route and a diagonal route created for pedestrians. The landscaping scheme is based on three main components, the pedestrian routes, a series of rain gardens, which are shown in the darker green color, and then the centerpiece of the landscaping is an open lawn area in more or less the center of the site. Next slide, please. Now this is an artist's impression of the site as, as a bird would see it from uh, the east looking westward. 
uh, the next slide shows the site proposals broken up into um, their constituent parts. Can, can you do the next slide? There we go. So uh, the building in orange is the twin towered build to rent residential tower. This comprises two towers linked by a shared podium level forming outdoor amenity space for residents. The taller of the two towers is proposed at 33 storeys. The smaller of the two is at 22. The yellow outline shows the location of purpose-built student accommodation block at 24 storeys. The building in red is the apart hotel building at 14. And then the final element of the scheme, which is, like I say, is outlined at this stage, is approximately 11 storeys for office use. Um, next slide, please. Now, members will recall from the pre-application presentation in May that the formation of new and improved pedestrian routes to link the A58 and the land beyond it to the main core of the city centre was a key point of the debate. And this slide is intended to demonstrate the likely routes subject to heavier public use, but also shows how the site proposals intend to create new linkages and secondary routes through the site in order to knit the development site into its surroundings. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, a key component of that arrangement is the provision of a wider expanse of shared walking and cycle uh, route along the edge of the A58. Um, to be tree lined at the development side of the uh, of the route and screened with an environmental barrier on the roadside edge. Um, this slide in the next gives some indication on the uh, appearance of, of the screen. However, this is a specific detail that we're still um, trying to work out the finalized appearance of. Um, and we're seeking delegated power to resolve the final, final technical details and appearance of that. Next slide, please. This this again gives some impression of the kind of materiality that could be used for that screen. Um, it will require a license under the Highways Act. It's going to need to sit as part of um, the barrier system along the edge of the A58. So we're just working with the bridges and structures team on how that can be achieved. Next slide, please. This slide shows the proposed bridge link. Members will recall as part of their assessment of the pre-application proposals, concerns were raised regarding public safety from what was originally shown as a lift and stair arrangement. This proposal involves a ramp structure, which will hopefully aid visibility from and onto the bridge and is a substantial improvement in terms of inclusivity and accessibility for users beyond the existing bridge link, which doesn't comply to modern standards. It's also in very poor condition and it's also a bit of a hiding spot for people um, on the stairway as well. So it's um, th this is a far more visible and uh, visible kind of structure, better for natural surveillance. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we can see the bridge link structure here in elevation, comprising a steel structure and ramp with sectional glass balustrading divided into runs of no greater than 9.75 metres and gives plenty of pausing places for people using wheelchairs or um, push chairs and anybody with mobility differences, difficulties. Sorry. Next slide, please. And members who are on the site visit will recall the current condition of the existing bridge link shown here. Here it is. Um, next slide, please. So um, moving through the buildings in turn, lined in blue here is building one. Next slide. This is the built to rent uh, accommodation. This is the building's basement level with 47 car parking spaces to be electrical vehicle enabled for motorcycle spaces and 324 cycle spaces shown with a reserved area as well for a further 312 should demand um, require it. And that'll be monitored through the travel plan for the site. Um, at the bottom of the plan is, is an area reserved for a future connection to the district's heating network. It doesn't currently reach the site, but is programmed for expansion. So we've, we've secured get, getting that uh, connection area reserved. Um, next slide, please. Uh, the slide shows the ground floor layout of building one. Top right on the image of two proposed retail units with an associated spill out seating area for food uses and a series of shared amenity provisions are shown there. And also on the next slide, please. And you can perhaps see that a little more clearly here with this three dimensional layout showing the re reception area, residence lounge and resident gym facilities, which are typical of built to rent residential complexes, which I'm sure you've seen plenty of examples of before. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this slide shows the proposed first floor layout and we can see how the two towers are linked by the podium level um, external amenity space area with two further internal resident amenity areas shown in blue. Next slide, please. And that's just some further detail and schematics about how that would possibly look. We'd be looking to control the finalized detail of that on condition. Um, next slide, please. Now, this is a typical upper floor layout for building one. All of the units either meet or exceed the adopted space standards, and that's set out at 9.8.2 of the report. Uh, next slide, please. 
This is tower one in elevation. Next slide, please. And this is tower two in elevation, the taller of the two at 33 stories. Next slide, please. Now this slide is intended to show the form of the external facing materials and the difference in tone of each of the two towers of building one. Uh, the main facade material is a folded rain screen cladding unit um, with variations in the size and depth and number of folds uh, to create some three dimensionality as well as uh, the normal um, way we seek that through the depth of window reveals. Next slide, please. And this image shows how the facades are intended to work as a combination of flat and folded units. Next slide, please. Now, this is an important consideration. As noted in the report at 9.4.2, um, we have to assess the impacts of the proposed development on key views through and around the conservation area and on the setting of listed buildings. We can see here how the applicant has responded to Historic England and Leeds Civic Trust's comments and uh, officers' comments as well to create a better level of differentiation between the two towers of building one. Next slide, please. And then this image shows how the development will be seen from Park Square noting that the nearer tower is to be treated in terracotta to better amalgamate the building into the vernacular of the area and act as a mediator between the taller, um, lighter coloured building and the residential scale red brick and terracotta vernacular of the conservation area. Next slide, please. This is the view along St Paul Street with the same aim of knitting the nearest tower's facade into the streetscape. Next slide. And this is the view along Park Place, where Tower 1 on the right tucks in behind the red brick environment to the right hand of the image, and Tower 2 terminates the view, but sits a bit behind other existing modern buildings. Next slide, please. This is the view across Woodhouse Square, where Tower 1 is turned to blend in more neatly with the residential scale environment. And then Tower 2, the taller element, is designed to blend into the sky and the sort of being a lighter, more recessive uh, feature. Next slide, please. And then again, a view across Wellington Street, same principle that Tower 2 seen part of uh, more, more akin to the modern office environment and Tower 1 is turned to blend in with the uh, heritage sensitive context. Next slide, please. And then the final key view that we've, we've, um, we've sifted is the um, appearance of the two towers from the town hall steps. And again, it's the same approach here. Uh, next slide, please. Now we're on to building two. Uh, this is the 24 storey student block um, in Land in Orange at the southwestern edge of the site. Next slide. This is the ground floor layout. Um, the specifics of um, the amenity provisions at ground floor are subject to the requirements of the individual operator, but there is plenty of space in there to uh, provide a variety of different um, amenity uses, things like cinema rooms and gyms and such like. Um, there's also a cycle storage to the tune of uh, 78 spaces to be provided at ground floor as well. Uh, next slide. This is the first floor plan, which shows an external amenity terrace, as well as other areas of internal amenity uh, provision for residents. Uh, this layout shows the combination of clusters and standard studio units, as well as uh, one of the accessible studio units at the top of the plan, which is slightly larger. Um, all of these units accord with the requirements set out in the draft SPD in terms of travel distances, the amount, the ratio of amenity space to rooms and the room sizes themselves. Um, next slide, please. And this shows the location of the amenity terrace where you'll get um, bi-directional views either across the public realm or towards the cycle route, again, um, improving that sense of natural surveillance in the area. Uh, next slide, please. That's a typical upper floor plan. Again, I just need to reiterate that these meet the required the standards set out in the draft SPD. Um, next slide, please. And then that's just a, a zoom in on the individual unit types. Uh, next slide, please. That's a typical upper floor plan. There is a recessed area to the top right um, there to the to the uh, floors fourteen to twenty three, um, but that. It's not to the detriment of the size of the rooms, they still meet the required standards. Next, next slide, please. This is the building in elevation. As you can see, the reason why that recessed area that I showed during the previous floor plan is because of an indentation of the upper floors to give better articulation and to stop the building looking quite so monolithic. Um, it's, a, it's an architectural feature, it's, it, it's strongly supported. Um, and it helps to differentiate it between the, uh, so, provide a slight differentiation between it and the built to rent towers as well, which are obviously a very similar appearance. Next slide, please. And then that's the remaining elevations. Next slide, please. And this is it in three dimensional form. You can see on the left there, there's um, 
a green roof arrangement and an external terrace for residents. Um, and then that gives you some idea of the variations in tone that we'd be looking at and the uh, window detailing. Um, next slide, please. Now, this is the ground floor layout of, uh, sorry, we're up to building three. Um, next slide, which is the green one at the bottom. This is the apart hotel. Um, it's, it's designed to feature an active frontage um, at the top of the plan there. So the likelihood is that will be uh, some, some form of restaurant or um, cafeteria type use so that you can spill out onto the public realm in front. Um, next slide, please. Um, part of the apart hotel use is have to have touch down office space um, within the site, uh, within the building as well. So sort of shared, mm. shared workspaces. Um, and then to the upper floors. Next slide, please you have um, a wider open plan arrangement for touchdown office space. Next slide. And the individual apart hotel um, unit rooms. Next slide, please. This is the building in elevation. Again, it's a slight variation on the existing theme between the other buildings you've already seen. There's a strong brick, brick plinth at ground floor there. Next slide, please. This is the opposite elevation. Next slide. And then this is again to give you some idea of the tonality and how that fits in with um, particularly tower uh, one of building one as well. It's, it's you know, we're, we're working on the same sort of terracotta type arrangement, but with variations in terms of how the window openings diminish and the amount of them as well. So the, the idea is that the buildings appear as a family, but they're not absolutely 100% um, the same off the shelf type design. There's subtle variations in the facade treatment. Next slide, please. And finally, this is uh, building four, which is the office. This is the outline component. We're looking at um, approximately 11 stories as a parameter in outline. Um, this would have undercroft car parking access from Castle Street. Um, but again, the finalized detail of that isn't known, but it would follow more or less the same. Next slide, please. The same sort of design code as the other buildings in terms of its facade treatments. So it would be a, an evolution and a variation on on the theme of the other buildings. Next slide, please. It's probably best reflected there so that you can see how, how the intention is in terms of making slight variations to window openings and such like to give it some differentiation. Next slide. This is the site and section. So the, 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 the two buildings on the right that you can see are the built to rent towers. Next slide. Uh, this is as viewed from uh, Little Queen Street. So you can see the trace line of the um, outline element of the scheme there um, when read against the taller towers and the taller elements in the scheme. Next slide. And then this is, this is to demonstrate how the proposals basically place the larger elements of development closer to the wide highway dominated infrastructure of the ring road and how the heights grade up towards the center of the site and then back down again. Um, effect effectively forming a cascade. So the point of heights in the center of the site, rather than appearing sort of out of keeping with the general scale of buildings in the vicinity. Next slide, please. Now this is the landscape plan. Um, we've seen this once already. Um, next slide. And this shows how it's intended to work in, in terms of pedestrian routing, uh, concentrating uh, pedestrians to come through between the student living block and the built to rent tower number two. Next slide, please. And then how the plan is, and again, th this is a matter that we'll be controlling the finer detail of through conditions to grade the height of landscaping down towards the central lawn area to give it the sort of greatest amount of exposure um, and legibility as you walk through the site. Next slide, please. Um, this is the new uh, tree planting that that, that are proposed. Now, um, there are a number of protected trees at the south of the site, as you can see there. A number of those are not in great condition. Um, of the trees down there, 20 have been retained, so approximately 20 have been removed, but the, the scheme itself involves the introduction of 84 new trees, approximately. And again, that more than meets the council's three for one policy, but uh, wherever possible, we'll be pushing for larger, larger tree species to be introduced. Um, obviously on, with the benefit of better carbon sequestering. Um, next slide, please. Now this slide shows the approach to um, sustainable urban drainage, whereby the rain gardens in the scheme are proposed to hold water where needed and provide a circle wear function, while also providing a, a possible enhancement through biodiversity and providing new habitats for relevant species. Next slide, please. 
Uh, this slide gives an indication of how the central lawn area would work with lower buffer planting frame in the space alongside the main diagonal pedestrian route. Elements of seating and ornamental features such as the pergola structures, which can be seen in the bottom image. Um, these features also have a, a comfort and wind calming effect for the pedestrian environment as well. And again, we'll be controlling the final finalised location and details of these uh, through conditions, not only to control the appearance, but to make sure they're accessible for people to use as well. Next slide, please. Um, this slide is, I think that's the, more or less the same slide, isn't it? Next slide. Um, as you can see here, they've subdivided the site up into sort of character areas in terms of planting. So the lower planting would be in areas three and four, uh, like tree lined, um, there'd be a line of trees in, installed parallel to Little Queen Street at area five and area six were parallel to the public route to try and green that edge. And then there's obviously the slight enhancements to and uh, replacement trees to the tree belt at area one, which are the mature trees that members will have seen on site today that we pointed out to you. Next slide, please. And again, this is uh, an indication of some of the species that are being proposed. Next slide. This is an indication of the hard surfacing palette for the site. So um, there are smaller tertiary routes that run through the rain garden areas. Um, which we're looking at sort of the, the standard bound gravel situation, but then the stronger, the stronger routes, the the main, the main almost arterial routes around and through the site will be uh, to a high specification. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this indicates where external cycle spaces are to be located, uh, but we'll also be seeking opportunities through the landscaping arrangements to try to see if we can get any more through the site as well. We think there may be some pockets where. Uh, further cycle stands can be provided. Um, all of this is being monitored through the travel plan so that we can tell whether the existing uh, or rather the approved, if, if members are minded to approve the approved internal cycle stores or whether they're being used at capacity or not. And there are reserve areas throughout the buildings to, to provide additional cycle spaces for residents and users of the site. Next slide, please. And as part of the overall landscaping arrangement, because of the nature of it being shallow rain gardens and um, winding pathways and such like um, it it tends to lend itself very well to informal play and informal play facilities for children so climbing logs and such like rather than a, a bespoke uh, swing and stair um, slide arrangement um, your standard sort of park offering so we're going to be working with the applicant through the conditions to deliver that as well next slide please and then just a few images and a fly through to conclude the presentation. This is a CGI taken from the northern edge of the apart hotel building, looking towards the outline building four in the, which terminates the view there. Next slide. This is the view looking westwards from approximately the center of the site. Building one tower two is on the right of the image. The apart hotel sits in the foreground on the left with the student accommodation block in the distance also on the left. Next slide, please. This image shows the pedestrian gateway at the northeastern corner of the site looking southwest. Next slide. And then this image will, it will be from the Little Queen Street end of the development and depicts the development minus the outline element of the scheme. Now, before we play the fly through, um, the, the architect has asked that when you, when you watch the, the, the fly through that you pay very little attention to the quality and appearance of the landscaping because it's very, very difficult to render in, in three dimensions such as this. So it is only an indicator, but it will give you some impression of how the site's set up and, and will work. Toby, could you play the fly through, please?
Thanks, Toby, if you stop that. There's, um, before we proceed, there's a few clarifications to the report and a few amendments that we need to make you aware of. Um, paragraphs 2.1D and 9.14D, the report incorrectly references the developer managing and maintaining the bridge. It's incorrect and under the terms of the section 278 agreement, which will be associated with the development, maintenance and management of the bridge link will pass to the local authority. Um, Within the recommendation at the head of the report, point D is incorrectly applied on the basis of the uh, aforementioned change. Um, and that will be, con as I say, controlled through the section 278. Um, condition 54 at Appendix A is considered superfluous. We'll be seeking to control that through the legal agreement rather than via a condition as it, it gives us a, a more robust and enforceable mechanism to control um, the occupancy of the apart hotel. Um, and then with respect to the affordable housing section of the report, specifically paragraph 9.3.2, there is a now a finalised and agreed policy compliant commuted sum for affordable housing of £3,574,718. Um, I'll now pass you over to Dalja, who's got an update on a couple of other matters. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. Uh, it's actually just one matter. Uh, members will note from the report that the development proposals have been the subject of computer modelling and wind tunnel assessment work, uh, and that a number of wind mitigation measures are proposed to ensure a safe wind environment. However, following completion of the panel report, it has become apparent that although the computer modelling work had indicated a potential wind safety issue on the footbridge over the A58, the further wind tunnel assessment required to establish the actual wind speeds and therefore the likely need for any uh, further mitigation measures or the nature of those measures uh, at that location, that hadn't been carried out. Therefore, in consultation with the applicant, uh, the, it's been agreed that the applicant would uh, undertake this further wind tunnel assessment work. Uh, since this is a, a technical issue, subject to panel being supportive of the overall proposals that, that Matt's just presented, it's recommended that the resolution of this outstanding matter is delegated to officers for determination. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Dalgit. Uh, open for questions. There's no speakers against. Councillor Finnegan. A uh, couple of correct questions first. The, the ground maintenance, and I know they weren't rendered brilliantly, but Having said that, the big issue is about the ground maintenance, which looks fabulous as long as it is maintained. We've seen historically, certainly on <clears> residential <throat> sites, where ground maintenance uh, agreements, Section 106 or otherwise, haven't been strong or robust enough, and it starts to look grotty very quickly. So that's one issue. Um, and I know we've got the heritage officer here at this particular point. I wonder if he might comment on the letter of objection from Leeds Civic Trust who seem to suggest that it's not up to much, basically, in a nutshell. To go for this answer. Yeah, you can. Okay. Uh, if, if I can answer the question about the maintenance of uh, the ground maintenance, the, the site uh, will uh, remain in the ownership of the developers. Uh, so the maintenance of those uh, open spaces uh, and ground uh, uh, areas within the uh, uh, development would be their responsibility. Through the Section 106 agreement, we've controlled public access rights to that, and we've also uh, required that site to be maintained in, 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 in acceptable condition. And we have rights as a council to, uh, to, to, to enforce that through the Section 106 agreement. I can pass, pass you on to Phil. Can I just follow up briefly on that one, if I may? It's just that one of the areas that I cover are the Section 106 agreement, which wasn't worth the weight it was printed upon because we couldn't enforce in any shape, way, or form, and planning enforcement were feeble in terms of enforcing it. So have we got some assurance that this is a robust enough agreement, which means if it looks grotty, we can do something about it? I just want to make sure because... I've been given assurances before, and it's all within the Section 106. The Section 106 has been incapable of being used to actually maintain a reasonable standard. So that's what I'm asking for. And if somebody says it is, 
Uh, thanks, Councillor Finnegan. Um, this is unlike residential, for residential, because it's going to be maintained in, in private ownership. So not only have we got the 106 route, we've also got another mechanism through amenity notices, which us as a local planning authority can issue if the grounds maintenance aren't complied with and it affects the amenity of the surrounding area, namely the city centre and the heritage around that area would mean that we've got a robust secondary arm to enforcement. So not only have we got the 106, we've got a statutory notice uh, position as well. So that makes it almost double enforcement for the, the local planning authority and the council. But in terms of the wording, pardon me? Yes, 215 notices. I can't remember if we use any of those. Well, that, that's it. <laughs> But that's certainly something that can be used. And in terms of the wording of the 106, we'll look at that and make sure that it's tightly worded and enforceable. I think in, in Matt's um, presentation, there were a number of views, weren't there, which uh, we asked the um, applicant to carry out to test the effect of the development on um, heritage assets, such as views from um, Hanover Square, from Park Place, from St Paul's Street and Hanover Square, um, and Woodhouse Square, sorry, and also, um, most importantly, from um, Park Square. My assessment, and, and uh, this is also the applicant's um, assessment, which we've come to independently, is that there will be no harm to the majority of um, listed buildings and, cons and conservation areas. Are, potentially several conservation areas that are affected. However, there is, um, there is harm to Park Square and, and its constituents, constituent list of buildings. Um, you've all been to Park Square, I'm sure, and it, it's quite remarkable, isn't it? That if you stand in the middle, that uh, the, the, uh, the sky isn't broken by tall buildings. Um, you know, we shouldn't hide the fact that uh, the, the taller the taller buildings, the two towers, will um, break the skyline and, well, I suppose, impose themselves on the domestic scale of the uh, of the buildings and, and take away the landmark quality of of um, St Paul's House. You know, the Moorish warehouse that we all enjoy. Um, I should say that through the design development, the the impact of um, the taller towers has been. Um, mitigated, but not, you know, but then harm not completely removed by aligning the buildings so that they are parallel with the southern side of um, the, the square and align with the Georgian grid. And also, uh, as Matt said, the, the, the colour tone has been varied. So if you like, they're, they're, they're stratified or layered. So that the taller, taller, the lower of the taller towers um, picks up the brick tones and doesn't fuse with the, the taller tower. Um, should also say that um, there are some positives from the de development which we've got to weigh against the harm. And, you know, they're, they're quite important. Um, it's going to stitch this surface car park back into the historic environment. And it's also going to... Um, it's also, also going to provide end stops to um, Park Place. I don't know if you went on the site visit, but that, that street, if you look um, east-west, is blocked abruptly by buildings, and the taller towers will um, draw your eye away from those and if you like, extend that street. So they, they, are, they are positives to the historic environment. And uh, um, if the uh, overall assessment is that... Uh, that the, the tall towers cause less than substantial harm, which is my assessment. We've got to weigh that harm against those positives and come to a, a, a balanced view on the impact of, on the historic environment. Thank you, Phil. Um, Councillor Walsh, please. Thanks, Chair. Um, I think there's, there's a lot of, lot of strong work in this application. Um, I really rather like it. Um, just really one one question. The site's passing into completely into private ownership, isn't it? I understand. So, but there's public rights of way through along where the acoustic wall is, the acoustic fence. Yeah, is that correct, officers? Yeah. 
Council Walsh, there's no there's no public rights of way through the site. There's obviously some established yeah. routes, as as we know from the site visit this morning. But as part of the land sale, and as part of the planning application, there will be some rights established through both the Section Two Seventy Eight Highways okay. Agreement and the Section One Hundred Six Planning Agreement. Okay. For public access through the site. Yeah. So we're not so we're not going to be a, a gated community. That's that's good. What I was going to ask, really, is that given the location by the loop is heavily trafficked, and I'm sure the acoustic wall will do a grand job, but could that not be turned into a green wall running the length of the, 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 the development site? Just thinking for it, not only would it aesthetically look really good, but it's a bit, its contribution to particulate filtering and whatnot would be really, could be quite impressive at that location. Thank you, Chair. Um, the the issue we've got with the wall, uh, the screen, it's a three metre high screen, is that the um, the inner ring road is, is um, both a retaining wall, it, it, the, the levels go from it being um, a wall that retains the, the carriageway to, to the other way around, so the uh, a wall that retains the footway on the other side. Um, so we've got retaining wall access, which has a, a way leave on it. Um, um, you know, to, to access it for maintenance purposes. Now, um, to enable this screen to go up at all, it's not attached to the parapet wall. It can't be, but it has to be demountable um, to enable us to inspect and maintain that structure. Yeah. Thanks, Chair. Mine's partly about, about this... Um, screen as well so um when 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 you showed the route across the footbridge i just sort of automatically went oh because if you're a if you're anyone walking on your own at night it can be terrifying but like if you're a woman walking on your own at night it's especially terrifying and it can be difficult and a bit scary walking on your own during the day when there's very poor visibility around corners and things like that. So um, I can see, I can see uh, page 127, 9.7.1 says that high resolution CCTV provisions and locations must be identified and the details of this along with details of access control measures may be controlled by condition. I was, I was just, I'm just wondering why what what exactly that means? Would there be someone watching for potential attacks at all times? And would someone be on hand to respond to that at all times? Um, and I think I think that that kind of I'll come back for my second question if that's okay. Yeah. So those comments were generated from consultation with the architectural liaison officer at West Yorkshire Police. Um, and it's made, they're mainly centered around getting the wording of the condition correct in terms of making sure that uh, the amount of building lighting and CCTV for the site is to be in the right place to best effect um, and to be of appropriate resolutions. It would, a lot of, there's, there's a lot of talk with the architectural liaison officer about sites having a lot of cameras, but they've been such poor quality um, that you, you, can't, um, you, you can't get a legible picture from them. So it's about making sure that the absolute highest standard is, is achieved. Um, it, is, it is ultimately a managed site, but that is a, a, the, the route along the side that you're talking about by the screen is effectively a public route. It's out, so outside the demise of the site. It's, it's effectively a, put, a footpath stroke cycleway like any other in the city. Um, so it, it, it's a case of making sure it's well lit and, and using the opportunity of the buildings almost like a pallet to, to, to best achieve that. But there's only so far that the, um, that the applicants managing the site can go. Certainly they'll, they'll be on site management because it's, there's a built to rent building and there's public rights through the site as much for their residents as anything. 
The access control measures are, are, are basically related to cycle stores and public access doorways to make sure that um, not any old Tom, Dick and Harry can just wander into the buildings or steal what might be quite high value cycle, particularly at the bridge link end of the site where there's, an, uh, there's sort of a secondary cycle store proposed just behind the bridge link straight onto the, onto the footpath. We, we can't control everything through this application, but ultimately what we can do is make sure that there's good natural surveillance, good lighting and CCTV in the right place in, in an effective location. And that's what the conditions set out to, to attend to. So in effect, what you're saying is if, if someone gets attacked, it's okay because there's CCTV of them being attacked. Like we, we should be, striving to design out that kind of thing rather than designing it in um so like the fact that that's been been picked up on and then oh it's okay because there's cctv i don't i don't think that's really acceptable um so so that's a route across the footbridge um and then my second um issue is is with regards to the the wind um assessment so um i'm a bit confused because it says it is considered that sufficient public safety and comfort levels can be achieved subject to finalized details and appearance location and testing of these measures to be controlled by condition what exactly does that mean please so picking up on the on on the wind uh, matter. Uh, the the site is currently very windy. Uh, there, there is an exposed site. Our prevailing winds are westerly. It's exposed to those prevailing winds. It's an open. It's a large open site, uh, and therefore uh, the, there's a, a existing uh, very windy conditions. The proposed development, along with the mitigation measures, actually addresses uh, all those areas uh, uh, that have been identified. Uh, as having very strong winds, apart from the further work which I mentioned for the footbridge. Uh, however, so it deals with the safety issues. However, there are some areas of comfort. Uh, these aren't safety issues, but these are where you would like the wind conditions to be not as strong because of the nature of the use. So where you're, where you're proposing sitting, sitting out areas, uh, you, you would, to, to make it more comfortable as a sitting out area, you'd like the wind speeds to be uh, 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 a bit lower. Now that further work still needs to be done through the detailed design. Uh, but the wind advisors have said to us that can be achieved without any changes to the building, without any changes to the position and the height of the buildings. It can be done through further uh, measures such as uh, planting, baffles, screens, and we just need to fine tune that. So that's what we'll condition through uh, if members are agreeable. But in terms of the, the wind safety issues, they have been addressed through the work that's been done so far. I was going to, uh, do you want me to answer the other question? Yeah, do please. Okay. Um, in terms of, um, you, you said it's all right for people to be attacked. No, it's not all right for people to be attacked on the site. Uh, I think the, the police's comments are, are generic comments. They're not saying there are hiding places within this development. Members will have their own view whether they think this is a safe site or not. But, but this development will be introducing a lot more activity onto the site. It will be introducing much better uh, uh, managed routes, lit routes, and, and clearly where there's private areas such as cycle stores, etc. we need proper locks and we need to make sure people can't tailgate into buildings. Uh, but overall, There'll be a lot, lot more natural surveillance and on-site management. So it, the, the, the aspiration is to make this part of the city centre, extended part of the city centre. And if you if you get busy areas, busy streets, then that natural surveillance hopefully will. We can't we can't guarantee there'll be no incidents. You know that there are incidents, uh, but hope the design the design itself should hopefully. Uh, promote a safer environment. Thank you, Chair. Is that okay, Kelly? No, not really, because it's it's a big, tall screen, right? 
there's there's loads of turns that you have to make round blind corners right and then you go in 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 between buildings like the the route the route doesn't scream safety to me but i'll i'll leave that at that um in terms in terms of the wind um what did you say comfort levels um there's no point in putting loads of effort into nice green spaces if people can't use it. So I do hope that that can be sorted out. Um, what what will happen if those issues can't be resolved? Well, we've been assured that they can be resolved uh, through those kind of measures, uh, softer measures, without changing the design and height of the buildings or the location of the buildings. So that's the reason why we're, we're asking for the detailed design of those measures to be controlled by condition. Riffit, like if it, if, it, if it can't be sorted out, what happens? Like, will it be fins? What, what, you know, what will it be? Like, will we be responsible for sorting it out if it ends up not being safe is what I'm saying as a council. No, the the development can't proceed without discharging the condition. Um, and if there's an issue at that stage, we'll bring it back to panel. If it, if it means it, it actually uh, the building layout has to change or the height has to change, uh, then we bring that back to panel. Um, so we do as much as we can at this stage. Uh, the, 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 the process, as, as members will be aware, is that we now, not only do we ask the applicant to engage in specialist wind engineering advice, but we also hire our independent wind engineering advice to peer review that work. And, and there's been a lot of work done because of the nature of this site and the height of the buildings. And we've got a, a, a significant level of comfort that these are detailed matters that can be addressed. Uh, going forward. Thank you, Chair. It's so, okay, Kelly. I'll come back. <laughs> I think it's as far as we can go, but if condition is met, then I'll come back. So, uh, Councillor Blackburn. Uh, just picking up on Kelly's point, the bridge, all is responsible for that bridge because I don't want to thought it'd be developer because it's already there and it goes over to the other side. And on the safety thing, if I might just comment on it, even when swimming baths were there, it were always dangerous. It, it's, a, it's a council that's responsible for the footbridge. And, and the, as, that, of now, uh, as of now, and that remains the case. In that, in that case, we'd be responsible for any CCTV. Sorry, the, the proposals aren't for CCTV on the footbridge. The proposals, the, the general advice from the police architectural liaison officer was to have CCTV within the development site. Can I ask another question? And if there's anybody from developers that might be able to answer this. Um, quite clearly, this is an hybrid uh, application and we're only doing outline of one bit of it. Uh, so that seems to me that this is going to be built in stages. But quite clearly, if you're building it in stages, some of what you're suggesting, uh, suggesting on this application, you won't be, a, you, you will not have public access at the same time. It could take a number of years. Can we have some idea of, of how it's going to be built out? Can I just, uh, somebody who would like to come forward and address that question? You're very welcome if you can. Sorry? Okay. okay, good evening, good afternoon, good night, whatever it is, you're very welcome. Um, you've heard a question, I'm sure, from Councillor Blackburn, so if you can address it, please. Uh, good evening, um, Tim Waring uh, from Quad, um, Planning Advisors to Marico, the, uh, the developers. Um, 
the, the question in terms of um, how will the scheme be built out, it will be built out in phases. Um, the likelihood is that um, the, the, the full detailed elements of the scheme will be built out in one single phase. That's the intention at the moment. Um, and the intention is to start on the development in April, um, assuming that you grant planning permission or resolve to grant planning permission tonight and we can resolve this section 106 in, uh, in short order. Um, so that that will proceed. The office scheme um, is dependent on market conditions um, to a large extent, a 100,000 square foot office or 130,000 square foot um, office is obviously a sizable um, building. Um, obviously, as it stands at the moment, um, we are marketing the site. Um, I don't know if we can give any indication as to when the office might come forward. The um, the build period for the phase one is three years. So, and the build period for the office will probably be something like 18 months. So we are still working up this scheme for the office through that period that we will be hopefully be on site with the office while the phase one is being completed. Thank you for the information. I'm sure uh, Councillor Blackburn is satisfied with our time timetable. Uh, Councillor Campbell, please. Thank you. Look, okay, we've got the um, we've got you here because I've got two questions for you actually. Um, I, I'm looking at my uh, the build to rent section, which will lead some affordable <clears throat> housing. Um, you don't intend to have that on site. Is there a reason for that? I've got another question as well. Can I? I'll ask you the other question on both out of the way. Just looking at the student accommodation. Um, and it shows a cluster bedroom of 13 square meters. Now, even by student standards, that's very small. Uh, and it's, it's less than half the size of um, what we'd expect for a flat for anybody else other than the student. So I just uh, wondered if there was some capacity for increasing the size to make it big enough to get an extra chair in so a friend could come around. Um, taking both, well, if we just take those slightly out of order, so um, the, the cluster rooms um, have been designed to satisfy your draft SPD, which you um, consulted on earlier this year. Um, so they are designed to hit your standards that you require. I, I know and some people might have objected to it as well, <laughs> but um, so, so we we built them, or they are constructed, or they will be constructed to those standards. Um, the, the point about um, if you want a friend to come round and sit in your room, um, I don't know whether. Well, I'm, I'm assuming you can fit, fit another chair in there, but the purpose of the cluster flat is that you've got a communal area as well where your friends come and sit. Um, so you won't necessarily sit in your room, and and that and part of that is about um, student well-being. Um, and actually socialising. <laughs> um, well, yeah. <laughs> I think they are double beds, but uh, anyway. Um, <laughs> so the second point in relation to the bill to rent and the um, the the, the um, proposal to um, commute the uh, the sum. Um, obviously, your policy H five allows for uh, that as an option. Um, the difficulty you have with bill to rent and accommodating um, social um, accommodation within that is that you're mixing up tenure types and that is a very difficult management issue. Um, and as a consequence, that's why I understand that your policy has got the option of a commuted sum. Um, so the commuted sum is compliant with uh, the policy. It's, uh, it's equivalent to the 7%. Um, and it's a policy compliant proposal as a consequence. I understand that, but uh, other built to rent providers uh, within the city centre <clears throat> do provide on site. And I just wondered why you specifically decided not to do that. 
Um, I think it's it's not our decision. It's the operator who is proposing to take the uh, the building. It's their decision, and it suits their their particular operational model. Okay. Can I ask uh, another question in relation to um, Councillor Brooks' point about um, security? Um, uh, <laughs> It is a difficult um, one because the the footpath, as, as we, we said, the footpath we're talking about effectively is not within the development. It's outside the development, <clears throat> but adjacent to it. And if those of us who walk down that footpath today found it a very unpleasant experience, quite frankly, uh, it was windy and very, very, very noisy. Um, I just wondered if there is some scope for a discussion about exactly what the barrier looks like. Um, perhaps Councillor Brooke might want to uh, <clears throat> contribute to that. I only say that because I happened to be uh, in, a, in another city a couple of weeks ago where they had something similar. And effectively, they, that was, a, to all intents and purposes, a glass screen. Um, which gives a lot of visibility, um, but provides that that noise and wind attenuation. And I just I throw that into the the mix because I think we need to have a, that needs to be a discussion point. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, I mean, the screen wouldn't be owned by the Highway Authority, although it would be within the highway. I think the experience we've had down at Bridgewater Place, where we've had a glass screen as a windscreen, is that we've had every panel of that screen smashed to pieces, and it's been a real maintenance liability. So I, I do think, especially in that location, that we do need something that that um, is vandal proof as far as we can. Sorry to say that. Peter, please. Thanks, Chair. My question was actually on the same part following. I know we had a lot of conversation around this last time, but following various events and Councillor Brooks comments, I'm very concerned about this screen, actually, because walking down that area you might not be particularly pleasant at the moment. Mm. But what you've normally got in that area is a huge queue of traffic that can see and attend to you at any particular point. I'm a bit concerned that by this screen, I think we all thought was a good idea at the time to, to try and get away from the road, maybe removing most of the visibility of that route. And there may be people that may never feel safe using it again. We're probably not the right people to make the judgment over what that balance is. So I just wonder where is it that we can direct that to? Because I'm a bit concerned actually that we're making a liability for for the fact that we wanted to make it better, but it, in the day it'll make it better, in night I think that will be a dangerous place to visit. Um, I, I think, um, I mean, clearly the, uh, the, the screen has come about uh, as a result of concerns about immunity, you know, noise and, and uh, um, uh, from the road. Um, and, and ultimately, um, is it's the developers put that forward at our behest. Now, uh, because because of those additional concerns, but what's transpired is that the screen also has a wind safety uh, mitigation impact. So I think we're in a position where we do need the screen because of the wind safety issues that have arisen. Uh, having said that. Um, it, I, I know members will have their own view, um, but there will be literally thousands of people generated by the redevelopment of this site, or on site itself. And, and so at the moment, you've got a, a very desolate place, but on, on the development side, this will be, in my view, in an officer's view, you know, in our view, a very active site part of the busier city centre beyond. Uh, and that should provide a level of surveillance and usage of that footpath, which will hopefully deal with those, that kind of antisocial behaviour. But ultimately, panel will have to take a view on it today. 
it, 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 you know, uh, I don't think there'll be, a, the police architectural liaison officer hasn't said there'll, there'll be an issue by putting the screen there. We feel for the reasons I've just said that it'll be a safe environment and there'll be more detailed discussions through the conditions about uh, more hard measures such as CCTV, lighting and so on. Uh, but ultimately it's for panel to make a decision. But I think we do need the screen now because of the wind safety impact. Can we go to comments now, please? Comments? Uh, I'll take somebody before you, Peter, because you've just spoken. Uh, Caroline, you haven't spoken. I'll have you first. Uh, okay, well, with comments, I think it's a, I think it's a very attractive and well-designed scheme. Uh, I think it's very well considered and appropriate to where it is. Um, I, I was um, very interested and surprised at, at Phil's comments, but I, I take them on board, Phil, I'll do and you next. listening carefully to what you say. Um, on, on balance, I think it's a very good scheme. I think the, um, the uh, barrier, I think you I referred to it as, um, is, is a bit unsightly. And, and if we could do anything about that, I think it would improve a lot. Um, but all in all, I think it's a good scheme with a good mix. I, I would support this application. Thank you, Caroline. Um, Kaylee, please. Weren't expecting to be up that soon, Chair. Um, I've got concerns about the height. Uh, we've got an impact on the heritage aspect, um, views from around the city, impact on Park Square. Um, and it's the height that is leading to a potential safety issue for access through the site or by the side of the site or whatever. So like I'm I am concerned about that. Um I do I do think it's obviously it's obviously um a lot to do with your opinion, but I do think that from a, a distance, it's not pleasant. Probably up close, it's not as bad. In fact, no, quite attractive because you've got all of the, but the, um, from a distance, it, it does look quite jarring. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm, I don't know where to go with that, to be honest. Thank you. Thank you, Kayleigh. Uh, Paul, please. Thank you, Chair. I, I mean, I, I like the scheme and it, it regenerates that area of the, the town, which we've not been able to regenerate for a long period of time. Um, and so I think it generally is, is good. I have reservations about the office scheme coming forward as quickly as the developer thinks it will, because there is a lot of office space to let in this city. But my main comment is around the, the barrier um, between the, the inner ring road. Um, Peter, you can't see anything from the inner ring road. I expect you could lay down there on the floor and nobody would come to your assistance from the inner ring road because I struggled to see a couple of days ago whether the gypsies were still there and you could only just see the top of the caravan and you're too busy with other things there it's a busy stretch of road you're not looking there your eyes are focused on that so i don't think the surveillance from the inner ring road gives you any now and i don't think the barrier would change that um so i just wanted to make that point thank you that was a useful comment all i was going to say is I think on many issues around this, I'm probably not the right person to make that judgment. And most of us around the table aren't there to make the judgment, not whether it is safe, but whether it feels safe. And, and that's what I'm a bit concerned about. I know we haven't had a, a comment from um, our contact from the police on that, but I wonder whether we could send specific comment referencing that and, and get a response because I'd, I'd much rather know that somebody had made any specific comments they wanted to about that screen and that we were then confident taking it forward, that it had been missed from the development or anything like that, just so that we're making sure we're, we're highlighting that issue. But the, the route around the buildings is yeah. is something as well. But but I'm, I'm a bit worried that we've asked for something that, that may have an impact that, that we didn't necessarily mean it to. Yeah, thanks, Chair. I mean, I, I, I really rather like the, this development. Um, there's a lot of good in it, and I think it does regenerate that area, as others have mentioned. But I am concerned about the, the safety aspects of it. I think Councillor Garthwaite mentioned it the first time around. Subcation, Councillor Brooks has raised it. If there's any way we can condition in 
mindfulness of that other issues. I don't know how we do that, but that needs to be represented. I'm sure the applicants are representatives are here and, and listening hard to this. You wouldn't want to end, I'm sure they wouldn't want to end up with a an unsafe development. And I don't think it likely will be if they can get the security features and the design features correct, the lighting and whatnot. Anyway, thanks, Chair. Thank you, Neil. Uh, the developers are indeed here. Uh, do you wish to make a comment on the safety concerns of members? Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you, everybody. Um, yes, I think, I mean, first first and foremost, um, we have been consulting with the ALO. We've also, uh, sorry, um, use of an acronyms, um, the architectural liaison officer. Um, similarly, we've been liaising as part of the BRIAM on the security side of things. And you've also got comments from the counterterrorism unit as well um, in relation to, to security around the, the property. Um, we have entertained and suggested with uh, the planning officer a condition that will um, address security issues. So we are required to provide further information. I was wondering whether as part of that, there could be a specific um, request for the police architectural liaison officer to be involved in that process. Um, and perhaps uh, Gillian McLeod's team as well, so that we can, and even, and you know, perhaps local community or um, Councillor Brooks could um, sit in on that as well, so that we can come up with a solution that everybody feels comfortable with. Thank you. I, I think that's an excellent uh, suggestion. And Councillor Brooks is uh, indeed a, a local ward member, so I'm sure she'd be very interested in sitting on that. Okay. Is that fine? Is that all right, Kelly? Well, we're we're all in that position, aren't we? <laughs> okay, moving on then, Councillor Latte. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, <clears throat> brief comments, but I, I do like this one. It, it's one of those that looks as though somebody has designed it. Um, we don't always get that privilege to look at something like that. So I, I do like this, and it finishes off that bit of Leeds. I mean, the, the car park is not uh, a thing of beauty. And, and so I think that this, plus the fact that we're getting getting a new bridge as well, which I, I think is another plus. So yes, I'm, uh, I'm very much in favor of this one. Thank you, Graeme. Can I, at this stage, ask Dalja to sum up the debate before we vote? Thank you, Chair. Um, it, I, I think uh, uh, overall, um, uh, members are, are supportive of the uh, the uses, uh, the scale uh, uh, and uh, design of the buildings. Uh, there, there has been an issue uh, uh, raised about uh, potential safety of users of the site and and be, and around the site, and especially the route towards the footbridge. Um, we, we do have a condition uh, which controls more detailed safety measures. As part of that, it's been suggested that uh, we, we, we consult with the, the police architectural liaison officer, Councillor Brooks and highways colleagues to come to uh, uh, an agreement on the exact details of, of, of the design and, and safety aspects of, of those measures. Um, subject to that, uh, I think members are supportive of the recommendation. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Dalja. Is there a member who would like to move the recommendation? We've got Paul and uh, uh, Council Groom. All those in favour, please show. I think that's unanimous. Thank you very much. Did you not vote? I didn't see you were hiding behind somebody there, but. Okay, well, we can record that, Kaylee. Thank you. Well one six three finally Tim and, uh, yeah he's ready he's over there's yeah, martin, martin yeah. Okay. looking for the page <laughs> here we are we've got it got to do welcome. okay <laughs> are you all right i'm awaiting a message from my ward colleagues it, it, depending how circumstances are i may yeah. have to leave before the end well, well i think we're okay now. uh i i should be in alice's Reselection now, shortlisted for a canco. Oh, 
Well, we've only just we've only just had a majority. I mean, the time? No, she hasn't. No, no she hasn't. But uh, Andrea has known about it because she's been looking in on the on the slot. Yeah, yeah, really, that's very hard. Do you want me to take over? Um, it started now anyway, and it's seven o'clock. So. Should have mentioned it earlier. I'd have taken over. For well, you. if I, even if you'd taken over, we didn't have much. No. Don't that makes any no, difference no, around planning? Right. But are we on a, just we're on the last one now. Yeah, it could be short. Yes. Martin's coming too. Oh, sorry. Okay, can we take our seats, please? And um, the final item is on page one six three, and it's a pre-app uh, for. Uh, the arena area, I think the arena court, or maybe we call that, I don't know. Uh, so we've got Martin here to, everybody's gone apart from Martin. <laughs> we've got the applicants. Uh, so all right, I have to stop the clock and the Okay, welcome. Welcome to the meeting. I'm sorry if you've been waiting a, around a long time. I'm sure you have. <laughs> but it's not been easy for us either. We've had a very long afternoon, uh, evening. Uh, so without further ado, please, can you uh, present uh, the application to us, the pre-app to us? Uh, yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, just, just for clarity, I'm, I'm not the applicant. Um, I think you all know that I'm uh, the director of city development uh, and I'm here just to provide uh, some context in terms of uh, the development and why it's coming forward in the way that it is and also the uh, the background to the arena development and the architectural thinking around the arena which is something that uh, that I led on at the time uh, can we go to the first slide please um, yeah, that's not the one I was looking. Next one, please. Yeah. So uh, that shows you that the red line boundary. I suppose at its heart here, um, there is a position where I think members will be aware about the amount of development that's taken place around the arena. Um, the uh, Yorkshire Bank site has come forward for disposal. And as a council, we were aware that it was coming forward for an off market disposal. And there was an opportunity to look at in the, for the arena whether there was something that could be brought forward that would be complementary in terms of uh, events, exhibitions, banqueting, um, conferencing that would work alongside the arena. But if we didn't look at it in the context of the Yorkshire Bank site, then given the amount of development that's taken place around the arena since it was developed and completed in 2013, that that opportunity would be lost. Uh, and for that reason, the council entered into discussions with the applicant, uh, which is Downing, um, about whether or not uh, we could look at the uh, site for the potential for that. And that comes down to then what you see there in terms of the red line boundaries is the principle of a land swap, where the council would exchange its site at the northern point of the plan that you see the, the northern development plot and it would take back an equivalent amount from the Yorkshire Bank site which alongside our development plot that we already hold at the southern end creates enough enough land for us to bring something forward that would be complementary to the arena so next slide and this is just a brief uh, reminder for ourselves I mean I, I do remember in 2008 looking at this site for the first time as the arena You've got the Brunswick building as the former uh, School of the Built Environment of Leeds Polytechnic, as it was at the time there. Interestingly, it was a building that was never actually 
finished uh, before it was knocked down. Um, the, you've got the um, multi-story car park prior to its uh, refurbishment, and you see the rear of uh, the Merion Centre and Merion Way again, which has uh, been sub significantly enhanced. You can see Merion House, which uh, has gone through a, a complete redevelopment since 2008. And in the bottom right hand corner, you can see the Yorkshire Bank building itself, but also the stick and twist building, which I think the collection of those photographs, I think helped to demonstrate how on the back of the arena, there's been substantial change in this area uh, over the last 10 years. So the next slide, please. And then really what this slide shows is um, it's from the design and access statement that came forward for the original planning application. And when I led on the arena, the, um, the design champion was uh, John Thorpe uh, as the civic architect at the time, who's someone that members will know well. And it was very much when we looked at the arena and it was a question of, in terms of the site, is it shoehorned in or does it fit like a glove? And it is really a, a location where it, it sits in its context and it, and it faces a number of different ways. Um, the rear is very much the bayonet of the light bulb as we saw it, which is servicing and back of house. To the northern edge, it runs alongside the, uh, the hard edge of the inner, inner ring road. To the, to the south, it's nestled in between those buildings uh, behind Brunswick, um, Terrace, I think it is, and Merriam Way. And then you've got the frontal lens. And I suppose it was contrasting it with buildings such as uh, the Echo Arena that Wilkinson Air brought forward and the uh, SSE Arena in Glasgow, which you will have seen on uh, COP26, where you had these panoramic views of this building that you could see. The arena was very much a building where you saw glimpses of it, and it wasn't designed as something that had that grand setback view. And that's where you see then on the bottom uh, diagram, the development plots uh, that were brought forward as part of the arena. And it created that setting for the arena where it was very much the arena, a building that you go to on a planned visit. It's a red letter day on your calendar. Uh, and it's one that you discover and you see glimpses as you approach it. So that was the rationale behind the development plots as they brought forward and so within the council they form part of our capital receipts program to bring forward so that's some context which i hope is helpful for members uh, and i'll then pass for the yeah. design itself thank you uh, good evening all the previous time we came to see you uh, back in uh, september was um, we had the scheme that you can see in front of you uh, next slide please uh, with three buildings, if you recall, the one on the southern student accommodation in the middle, the uh, multi-purpose event space, and this uh, close-up view of the northern tower, crystalline uh, reflective building on the north side. Next slide, please. And this is just a view looking uh, from Woodhouse Lane uh, northeast on that. Um, a number of comments were made um, that we looked to address and see what we could do uh, to improve upon the scheme from the feedback that we had from yourselves at the last um, presentation. Next slide, please. And so on the left here, we have the uh, previous uh, plans panel uh, massing of the three buildings in the south on Merriam Way. We had student accommodation wrapping around Claypot Lane, Merriam Way and up Brunswick Terrace. And directly above that, the multi-purpose event space. And then to the north of that, uh, addressing uh, next to the ring road, we had the tallest elements, the tower. Um, some of the comments that were made at the time talked about the retention of the trees uh, on the corner of Claypit Lane uh, and Merriam Way. There's some mature trees there which you highlighted would be good to retain. We've looked to cut back the massing and the footprint of the southern building, um, reducing it by approximately 20% in size of uh, scope, obviously losing units within that, uh, looking to retra retain those trees on the corner, um, taking back the element that returned up Clay Pit Lane, um, revising the mass of the multi-purpose event space at the same time to give a better linear uh, visual access into the student uh, um, landscaped area that sandwiches between uh, building B as we're calling it, the southern building and the multi-purpose event space. Look to articulate uh, and step uh, the massing of building B. There were comments about the blockiness of it and the visual uh, 
look of that. So looking at how we could break that up more successfully. Um, and then on the multi-purpose event space, we had a small element that stuck out uh, on the northeast corner into the sight line of Brunswick Terrace. And again, that removed trees out. Um, and we've looked to take that off, add the accommodation back down into the southeast, southwest corner, big pardon, um, and to retain two further trees there that we were taking out. Um, where that leaves is, is a kind of slightly different uh, massing uh, for the multipurpose event space and a change to uh, the southern building. In the future, when the um, multipurpose event space comes forward, because this is a hybrid application where we're only looking at the parameter plans for the multipurpose event space, you might be able to um, curve the corners, which is a diagram on the right, and have a better uh, uh, relationship to the arena building. Can we go to the next slide, please? Thank you. And so just a little bit more detail in three dimensions, what we've looked to do is take off that uh, three-story element that addressed Clay Pit Lane, uh, cut the building back, retain the trees, as, as we mentioned, step the buildings uh, further and break up the mass that runs up uh, Brunswick Terrace. You get better views into the uh, landscaped uh, area behind, as I mentioned, and hopefully it takes down some of the bulk that was highlighted on the southern building. We've also looked to push back the um, multi-purpose event space plant area at the very top to push it up towards the arena and away from Queen Square uh, to really help reduce that stepping element that we proposed there. You can go to the next slide, please. So this is a, a, a diagram that um, highlights the real change that's in there. And I say that overall on this southern site with the two buildings proposed, there's a 10% reduction in the footprint there. And most of that has come, all of that, I beg your pardon, has come from a reduction in student accommodation. Um, obviously, there's a, there's a requirement that we've worked through with the council of what the minimum areas needed for the multi-purpose event space um, and so that's still the 10,000 square meters as a, a, a kind of GIA area so we have reduced the, the student accommodation there, lost uh, just over 50 apartments uh, within that block and reduced the footprint by um, just over 20 percent We've also shrunk the uh, frontage on Merrion Way by approximately 20% as well. So I think there's a, a better relationship to Merrion House across the road. And as I say, more of an emphasis on trying to retain trees and increase the landscaped area in that, in that, uh, for the students in that area. Next slide, please. The other area that you highlighted when we last presented was the views to the arena. And so um, we have worked very hard with your officers um, starting off with a, some diagrams in the top left there was where we started originally with a, uh, a, a long linear element and they have pushed uh, continuously and uh, strongly to reduce the footprint of the tower and we've moved that down, uh, reduced that down and moved that north to really kind of get something that still creates those views to the main arena entrance. Next slide please. Um, you talked about active frontages as well. So we've looked to activate as much of the ground floor of the um, northern block uh, of student accommodation and the blue outline on the right hand side of the diagrams there shows the active frontages where a mixture of uh, uses that would be proposed in the um, uh, tower building. Um, we've still got the main focus on the entrance and the, uh, the arena space. Obviously, there's a critical function for the arena to happen to have a managed space, a safe and secure pet space outside the entrance, and that still works in this instance. And we have a small area of landscape space on the building plot um, that is for the uh, both for the residents and people using the uh, plaza. Next slide, please. So in terms of changes to the massing, this is a view from Queen Square uh, looking east, and we've looked to break down the massing and step it more, uh, hopefully more successfully, retaining the mature trees on the corner, which you, so you've compared where we were on the left to where we are proposing now on the right. 
um, we have looked to increase the height of the southern buildings by uh, three storeys at the corner of Merrion Way and Brunswick Terrace and reduced uh, this back end of that building by a storey to get a four storey step between those two parts there. Um, the other elements are still as before, reducing the three storey wing that addressed Clay Pit Lane. Next slide, please. And this is a view from the junction of uh, Claypit Lane, Merriam Way, looking at that corner. And you can see, hopefully, how we have cut the length of the building back and just pushed the, the corner elements up to hopefully break the mass a little bit on that um, there. Uh, most important thing on this side, really, is the retention of the mature trees on the corner. Next slide, please. Views up Brunswick Terrace, where we had a large um, elevation that ran up there. We've looked to step the building in this location, introducing this fold in, in, in the facade um, and really break that up again, hopefully give a little bit more space to the trees that are along Brunswick Terrace. Also critically taking off the element that stuck out from um, the multi-purpose event space on the left, you can hopefully see that, um, to give a clearer view up towards the plaza and the entrance uh, of the arena. Next slide, please. Uh, you mentioned uh, the views out from the arena looking back, which was an important consideration where I think we had missed last time. So this is a view standing just in front of the entrance, looking south down Brunswick Terrace, uh, where we would take the nib off, um, step the massing and have a bit more articulation on the southern building. Um, so which I think is a more successful uh, approach. Next slide, please. And again, a view that is looking east, uh, west along uh, Merriam Way, just at the junction of Brunswick Terrace. And again, you can see how we've looked to break up that facade that runs up uh, Brunswick Terrace by introducing a step in it and stepping the height as well. Next slide, please. In the last meeting, uh, you talked about it was difficult to judge what might happen on the multi-purpose event space. And whilst we're not the architects for the detailed design of that, uh, what we have put together here is a couple of slides which just talked about something that might happen there. So this isn't what's going to happen. This is just a, an indication of what might be uh, available. Uh, for us, it would be important that we, if possible, to get uh, a greened wall addressing the student accommodation on the south side being a non-residential building, um, green walls are still uh, permitted uh, for fire regulations, obviously on residential buildings such as student accommodation. We can't do that, unfortunately, now. Is an opportunity to reuse some of the materials of the Yorkshire Bank building. Obviously, they're very quality materials. Um, we believe they're pinned in place and there is a potential that they could be taken off and reused. Next slide, please. And so uh, with that in mind, we just looked at a very quick sketch of what might happen there, where you potentially could reuse some of the granite on it, introduce a lattice work with, uh, time chair, this. with the um, Amara continuing, sorry. Am I right? To Sorry, no, I, I was so listening so intently. You carry on. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll, I'll keep it brief. Um, so this is just something that could happen. This isn't one that's going to happen, but just to give you a flavour of something that's possible. Next slide, please. Um, we've got the landscape proposals. Obviously, we increase increased the tree planting and the tree retention within that. In the intermediate phase before the multipurpose event space came forward, uh, a landscape proposal we put onto the site where the multipurpose event space be with a bund to improve safety uh, and security. Next slide, please. A little bit more detail showing how that would work and increase landscape space and gap between the two buildings. Um, we've looked to increase that further since this was done. Um, I know Tim, uh, the case officer, has been pushing us very hard to increase the gap and we have increased it by further uh, just shy of a metre actually from what we've got here. Next slide, please. So these give a flavor of some of the landscape space between it, uh, mature trees, uh, lots of species retention um, uh, and seating areas built in within that. Next slide, please. And then this would be in the courtyard down between building B and the multipurpose event space, again, with mature trees and seating and planting. Next slide, please. And just an overview of the roof level. Next slide, please. In terms of materiality, we talked last time about um, the two different materials, the materials on the south and the north. Next slide, please. On the north side, on the building, we looked at something that was crystalline, something that was reflective, a mixture of glass and polished aluminium. Next slide, please. 
in a, a modular gridded fashion throughout the building with a rapid ventilator for ventilation and the glass and the reflective materials within that. Next slide, please. And on the south side, something that was earthy, more natural clay, terracotta. Next slide, please. And looking to choose colour into this, um, trying to link from the uh, Queen Square conservation area, where we've got the rich brick warmth and elements. So starting off with something that's got colour on that end or the wider grid, changing as the building steps, both in height and plan, and going to a narrow grid and changing tone as we go with it. Next slide, please. So you go from the rich warm browns into an intermediate and into a lighter color. Next slide, please. And so what we're looking to achieve there is something that transitions between Queen Square on the west and the brick buildings that are there up to the more modern recently introduced buildings that have a predominantly white light uh, element within there. Looking to utilize uh, different grid patterns within that to break up the mass uh, and, and the feel of the scheme uh, within uh, that building. Next slide, please. And here we have an elevation showing it. Obviously, critical difference here is the retention of the mature trees. Next slide, please. And then a view looking back west along Merion, uh, showing the change. So you've got the, the wider grid here with the glass in, generous full height windows to the student rooms. Next slide, please. And then the views looking uh, back towards the plaza across Apelet Lane to the south. Next slide, please. And then the view looking out uh, of the plaza, um, we did look to introduce trees here, but the police and the arena are very clear that that would be a real issue for them. So unfortunately that's not been available, achievable. Next slide, please. And then a few looking south down Claypit Lane showing that the slenderness uh, and articulation on the crystalline taller building and the gap between the arena and the tower. Next slide, please. Obviously the views were very key and the view yeah, thank you. Uh, back towards the room were very important, and you mentioned this quite a lot. And so what we've done is tried to look at analysis of, of what would work in this area and how we impact those. Next slide, please. Uh, probably quite difficult to read at this scale, but on the left, we have the existing, and what we've done is color coded uh, the arena frontages. So the area uh, where the entrance is, is red. And then as it spreads out from uh, we've colored that yet and uh, yellow and orange, and that is uh, then projected out onto the plan. And you can see hopefully that actually the view of the arena is quite limited, quite local. And then on the right hand side is with the proposed massing introduced there. And then the bottom right hand side, the purple elements, quite difficult to see, and apologies for this, is where the area is affected. So uh, in our opinion, it's quite limited. You still get their main views of the arena frontage, which is the red areas that are shown on the right diagram. There is a small loss going up towards uh, the ring road on the North Claypit Lane. Next slide, please. And so we've done some views uh, videos, which hopefully we can just show you. Um, and these are the paths that they are on. Uh, that they've followed. This is a view looking out from the arena, scanning across the plaza, looking west to the front of the multipurpose event space, and then looking down Brunswick Terrace, past the trees we've looked to retain now and improve uh, with the stepping of the facade of building B, the Southern building, and the, hopefully the breaking up on that mass. Thank you. Again, a view looking out <clears throat> from the plaza, scanning around, looking at what would be the entrance of the multi-purpose event space. So that relationship across the plaza to the main entrance as is at the moment and the articulation on the facade and then moving out across the plaza towards Clay Pit Lane. and then down Claypit Lane. Thank you. Thank you. Um, much improved to, than uh, the pre-app we saw and the, the designs we saw last time. Thank you for that. No uh, questions from members? No questions from members? Comments from members? David, Neil. Thank you. Uh, as, as you said, uh, much improved. Um, I've still got, I'm, I'm still not entirely happy um, with what's being proposed, but um, um, I can understand where 
where we're coming from with it. So, but it's going right direction. It's allowing the arena to be seen, uh, which was one of my main things. And it saved the trees around the front of the, the Yorkshire Bank, which I thought was important. Um, I'm glad you're thinking of using some of the granite from the Yorkshire Bank because uh, I'm one of the, the councillors who thought the uh, actual Yorkshire Bank was quite an attractive building. And not all of us did, but uh, certainly I was one. And Con Councillor Campbell, who uh, was just left us, uh, also was of that, of that uh, feeling. But as I say, it, it's, it's gone the right, it's going in the right direction. I still regret the fact that you've got this tall building in front of the arena, but uh, we are where we are, so I can quite support this. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Just say it's it, it's shown a lot of progress, isn't it? It's really uh, much improved to coin a phrase. I'm pleased the trees are retained and the massing of the student blocks I'm now comfortable with. I think the multi-event space will be an important gain for the city. I think adding to that there, and I've, I've always admired the the tower and I do take on board the comments that the, the, the arena was never meant to have a huge vista of views around it. It was always meant to be part of the urban cityscape of what is an area in the city centre where we've wanted tall buildings. If we're going to have tall buildings in Leeds, this is one of the locations for it. So I look forward to a full application coming forward, Chair. Thanks. Thank you, Neil. Can we go on to uh, the question set by officers on page 165 then? Uh, the first question, do members support the proposed scale, position and form of Block A? Sorry. You... It's the tower, the northern uh, building. Is that a yes? Oh, I heard too tall there, but in general, yes. Okay. Yep, we all like it. But well, there was a comment that was too tall. We will record this. So in, in general, that's a yes. Do members support the revised scale position and appearance of Block B? Do members support the revised footprint of the multi-use building and the approach to landscaping? I think that's a definitely yes, isn't it? That's a big yes. Okay. That concludes our meeting. Can I... Thank you for your presentation, most interesting, and the improvements I think are very well received by the panel. We look forward to the full application. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Wasn't it just? <laughs>